This is Audible. Ashet Audio presents The Innocent, written by David Baldacci, read by Ron McClarty with Orla Cassidy. Chapter 1 Will Roby had closely observed every one of the passengers on the short flight from Dublin to Edinburgh, and confidently deduced that sixteen were returning Scots and fifty-three were tourists. Roby was neither a Scot nor a tourist. The flight took forty-seven minutes to cross first the Irish Sea and then a large swath of Scotland. The cab ride in from the airport took fifteen more minutes of his life. He was not staying at the Balmoral Hotel or the Scotsman or any of the other illustrious accommodations in the ancient city. He had one room on the third floor of a dirty-faced building that was a nine-minute uphill walk to the city center. He got his key and paid in cash for one night. He carried his small bag up to the room and sat on the bed. It squeaked under his weight and sank nearly three inches. Squeaking and sinking were what one got for so low a price. Roby was an inch over six feet and a rock-solid 180 pounds. He possessed a compact musculature that relied more on quickness and endurance than sheer strength. His nose had been broken once due to a mistake he had made. He had never had it reset because he'd never wanted to forget the mistake. One of his back teeth was false. That had come with the broken nose. His hair was naturally dark, and he had a lot of it. But Roby preferred to keep it about a half inch longer than a marine buzz cut. His facial features were sharply defined, but he made them mostly forgettable by almost never making eye contact with anyone. He had tats on one arm and also on his back. One tattoo was of a large tooth from a great white. The other was a red slash that looked like lightning on fire. They effectively covered up old scars that had never healed properly, and each held some significance for him. The damaged skin had proven a challenge for the tattoo artist working on Roby, but the end result had been satisfactory. Roby was thirty-nine years old and would turn forty the following day. He had not come to Scotland to celebrate this personal milestone. He had come here to work. Of the 365 days in a year, he was working or traveling to do his job on about half of them. Roby surveyed the room. It was small, adequate, unadorned, strategically located. He did not require much. His possessions were few, and his wants fewer still. He rose and went to the window, pressed his face to the cool glass, the sky was gloomy. It was often that way in Scotland. A full day of sun in Edinburgh was routinely greeted with both gratitude and astonishment by his citizens. Far to his left stood Holyrood Palace, the Queen's official residence in Scotland. He could not see it from here. Far to his right was Edinburgh Castle. He could not see that battered old edifice either, but knew exactly where it was. He checked his watch, a full eight hours to go. Hours later, his internal clock woke him. He left his room and walked up toward Princes Street. He passed the majestic Balmoral Hotel that anchored the city center. He ordered a light meal and had tap water to drink, ignoring the large selection of stouts offered on the board over the bar. As he ate... He spent some time gazing at a street performer, juggling butcher knives atop a unicycle, while regaling the crowd with funny stories, delivered with an embellished Scottish brogue. Then there was the fellow outfitted as the Invisible Man, taking pictures with passers-by for two pounds each. After his meal, he walked toward Edinburgh Castle. He could see it in the distance as he ambled along. It was big, imposing, and had never once been taken by force, only stealth. 
He climbed to the top of the castle, peering over the gloom of the Scottish capital. He ran his hand along cannon that would never fire another shot. He turned to his left and took in the full breadth of the sea that had made Edinburgh such an important port centuries ago, as vessels came and went, disgorging freight and picking up fresh cargo. He stretched tight limbs, felt a creak, and then a pop in his left shoulder. Forty. Tomorrow. But first he had to make it to tomorrow. He checked his watch. Three hours to go. He left the castle and headed down a side street. He waited out a sudden chilly rain shower under a cafe awning and drank a cup of coffee. Later he passed a sign for the ghost tour of underground Edinburgh, adults only, and only conducted after full darkness had set in. It was almost time. Roby had memorized every step, every turn, every move he would have to make. To live. As he did every time, he had to hope it would be enough. Will Roby did not want to die in Edinburgh. A bit later, he passed a man who nodded at him. It was just a slight dip of the head, nothing more. Then the man was gone, and Roby turned down the doorway the man had vacated. He shut and locked it behind him and moved forward, quickening his pace. His shoes were rubber-soled. They made no sound on the stone floor. Six hundred feet in, he saw the door on the right side. He took it. An old monk's cloak was hung on a peg. He donned it and put the hood up. There were other things there for him, all necessary. Gloves, night vision goggles, a recorder, a Glock pistol with suppressor can attached, and a knife. He waited, checking his watch every five minutes. His watch was synced to the very second with someone else's. He opened another door and passed through it. He moved downward, reached a grate in the floor, lifted it, and skittered down a set of iron handrails set into the stone. He hit the floor silently, moved left, counted off his paces. Above him was Edinburgh, at least the new part. He was an underground Edinburgh now, home to several ghost and walking tours. There were the vaults under South Bridge, and parts of old Edinburgh such as Mary King's Close, among others. He glided down the dark brick and stone passages, his powered goggles letting him see everything in crisp definition. Electric lamps on the walls were set at fairly regular intervals, but it was still very dark down here. He could almost hear the voices of the dead around him. It was part of local lore that when the plague came in the 1600s, it struck impoverished areas of the city, such as Mary King's Close, especially hard. And in response, the city walled up folks here forever to prevent the spread of the disease. Roby didn't know if that was true or not, but it wouldn't surprise him if it were. That's what civilization sometimes did to threats, real or perceived. They walled them off, us against them, survival of the fittest. You die, so I can live. He checked his watch, 10 minutes to go. He moved slower, adjusting his pace so he would arrive seconds before he was supposed to, just in case. He heard them before he saw them. There were five, not counting the guide, the man and the peripherals. They would be armed, they would be ready. The peripherals would think this was the perfect place for an ambush. They would be right. It was stupid for the man to come down here. It was. The carrot had to be especially big. It was. It was as big as it was total bullshit. Still, he had come because he knew no better, which made Roby wonder how dangerous the man really was. But that was not his call. He had four minutes to go. Chapter 2 Roby rounded one final bend. He heard the guide talking, giving the memorized spiel, and delivering it in a mysterious, ghost-like voice. 
Melodrama sells, thought Roby. And in fact, the uniqueness of the voice was vital to the plan tonight. There was a right-angle turn coming up. The tour was heading for it. So was Roby, just from the opposite way. The timing was so tight that there was no margin of error. Roby counted the paces. He knew the guide was doing the same. They had even practiced the length of their strides to get them perfectly choreographed. Seven seconds later, the guide, who was the same height and build as Roby, and wearing a cloak identical to his, came around the bend, a mere five paces ahead of his party. He held a flashlight. That was the one thing Roby could not duplicate. Both of his hands had to be free for obvious reasons. The guide turned left and disappeared into a cleft cut into the rock that led into another room with another exit. As soon as he saw this, Roby pivoted, putting his back to the group of men who would round the corner a few moments later. One hand slipped down to the recorder on his belt under the cloak and turned it on. The guide's dramatic voice boomed out, continuing the tale that he had momentarily halted to take the turn. Roby did not like having his back to anyone, but there was no other way for the plan to work. The men had lights. They would see that he was not the guide, that he was not doing the talking, that he was wearing goggles. The voice droned on. He started to walk forward. He slowed. They caught up to him. Their light swept across his back. He heard their collective breaths, their smells, sweat, cologne, the garlic they'd had in their meals, their last meals. Or mine, he thought, depending on how it goes. It was time. He turned. A deep knife strike took out the point man. He dropped to the floor, trying to hold in his severed organs. Roby shot the second man in the face. The sound of the suppressed round was like a hard slap. It echoed off the rock walls and mingled with the screams of the dying men. The others were reacting now, but they were not truly professionals. They preyed on the weak and the poorly skilled. Roby was neither. There were three of them left, but only two would be any trouble. Roby hurled the knife and its point ended up in the third man's chest. He dropped with a heart split nearly in half. The man behind him fired, but Roby had already moved using the third man as a shield. The bullet hit the rock wall. Part of it stayed in the wall. Part of it ricocheted off and found purchase in the opposite wall. The man fired a second and third time, but he missed his target because his adrenaline had spiked, blown his fine motor skills, and caused his aim to fail. He next executed a desperation spray and pray, emptying his mag. Bullets bounced off hard rock, one slug hit the point man in the head on a ricochet. It didn't kill him because he'd already bled out, and the dead could not die a second time. The fifth man had thrown himself to the hard floor, hands over his head. Roby had seen all of this. He dropped to the floor and fired one shot into the forehead of man number four. Those were the names he had given them. Numbers. Faceless. Easier to kill that way. Man number five now was the only one left. Five was the sole reason Will Roby had flown to Edinburgh today. The others were just collateral, their deaths meaningless in the grand scheme. Number five rose and then backed up as Roby got to his feet. Five had no weapon. He had seen no need to carry one. Weapons were beneath him. He was no doubt rethinking that decision. He begged, he pleaded, he would pay, an unlimited amount. Then when the pistol was pointed at him, he turned to threats. What an important man he was, how powerful his friends were, what he would do to Roby, how much pain he would suffer, he and his whole family. Roby did not listen to any of it. He had heard it all before. He fired twice, right and left side of the brain, always fatal as it was tonight. Number five kissed the stone floor and with his last breath hurled an expletive at Roby that neither one of them heard. 
Roby turned and walked through the same cleft as the tour guide. Scotland had not killed him. He was thankful for this. Roby slept soundly after killing five men. He awoke at six and ate breakfast at a cafe around the corner from where he was staying. Later he walked to Waverley Station next to the Balmoral Hotel and boarded a train to London. He arrived at King's Cross Station over four hours later and took a cab to Heathrow. The British Airways 777 lifted off later that afternoon. With a weak headwind, the plane touched down seven hours later at Dulles Airport. It had been cloudy and chilly in Scotland. It was hot and dry in Virginia. The sun had long ago begun to drift low into the west. Clouds had built up during the heat of the day, but there would be no storm because there was no moisture. All Mother Nature could do was look threatening. A car was waiting for him outside the airport terminal. There was no name on the placard. Black SUV. Government plates. He got in, clicked the seat belt shut, and lifted up a copy of the Washington Post that sat on the seat. He gave the driver no instruction. He knew where to go. Traffic on the Dulles toll road was surprisingly light. Roby's phone vibrated. He looked at the screen. One word. Congratulations. He put the phone back in his jacket pocket. Congratulations was the wrong word, he believed. Thanks would be the wrong word, too. He was not sure what the right one would be for killing five people. Perhaps there was none. Perhaps silence would suffice. He arrived at a building off Chain Bridge Road in Northern Virginia. There would be no debriefing. No record of anything was better. If an investigation ensued, no one could discover a record that didn't exist. But if things went wrong, Roby would have no official cover. He walked to an office, not officially his, but one that he sometimes used. Even though it was late, there were people working. They did not talk to Roby. They didn't even look at him. He knew they had no idea what he did. But they also knew not to interact with him. He sat at a desk, hit some keys on the computer, sent a few emails, and stared out a window that wasn't really a window. It was merely a box of simulated sunlight, because an actual window was just a hole that others could get through. An hour later, a chubby man in a wrinkled suit with pasty skin walked in. They didn't greet each other. Chubby placed a flash drive on the desk in front of Roby. Then he pivoted and left. Roby stared down at the silver object. The next assignment was already prepared. They had been coming at an increasing clip these last few years. He pocketed the flash drive and left. This time he drove himself in an Audi that was parked in a space in the adjacent garage. When he slid into the seat, he felt comfortable. The Audi was his, had been for four years. He drove it through the security checkpoint. The guard did not look at him either. The Invisible Man in Edinburgh. Roby knew how it felt. Once he hit the public road, he shifted gears and accelerated. His phone vibrated once more. He checked the screen. Happy birthday. It didn't make him smile. It didn't make him do anything other than drop the phone on the opposite seat and punch the gas. There would be no cake and no candles. As he drove, Roby thought of the underground tunnel in Edinburgh. Four of the dead men were bodyguards. They were hard, desperate men who had allegedly murdered at least fifty people over the last five years, some of them children. The fifth man, with two holes in his head, was Carlos Rivera, a trafficker of heroin and youngsters for prostitution. He was immensely rich and had been visiting Scotland on holiday. Roby knew, though, that Rivera actually had ostensibly been in Edinburgh to attend a high-level meeting with another criminal czar from Russia in an effort to merge their business interests. Even criminals like to globalize. Roby had been ordered to kill Rivera, 
but not because of his human and drug trafficking businesses. Rivera had to die because the United States had learned that he was planning a coup in Mexico, with the aid of several high-ranking generals in the Mexican army. The resulting government would have been no friend of America, so this could not be allowed to happen. The meeting with the Russian crime czar had been the setup, the carrot. There was no czar and no meeting. The offending Mexican generals were also dead, killed by men like Roby. When Roby arrived home, he walked for two hours through the darkened streets. He ventured down by the river and watched the headlights on the Virginia side cut through the night. A police patrol boat slid past on the calm surface of the Potomac. He stared up at the drab, moonless sky. A cake without candles. Happy birthday to me, he thought. Chapter 3 It was 3 a.m. Will Roby had been awake for two hours. The mission set forth on the flash drive he'd been given would cause him to travel well past Edinburgh. The target was yet another well-protected man with more money than morals. Roby had been working on the task for nearly a month. The details were numerous. The margin of error was even less than with Rivera. The preparation was arduous and had taken its toll on Roby. He could not sleep. He was also not eating very much. But he was trying to relax now. He was sitting in the small kitchen of his apartment. It was located in an affluent area with many magnificent places to live. Roby's building was not one of them. It was old, utilitarian in design, with noisy pipes, odd smells, and tacky carpet. Its occupants were diverse and hard-working, with most just starting out in life. They left early every morning to take their place at law firms, accounting practices, and investment concerns spread over the city. Some had chosen the public sector route and took the subway or bus, biked, or even walked to the large government buildings housing the likes of the FBI, the IRS, and the Federal Reserve. Roby did not know any of them, though he saw all of them from time to time. He had been briefed on all of them. They all kept to themselves, immersed in their careers, their ambitions. Roby kept to himself, too. He prepared for the next job. He sweated the details because it was the only way he could survive. He rose and stared out the window, down to the street where only one car passed by. Roby had traveled the world for a dozen years now, and everywhere he went, someone died. He could no longer remember the names of all the people whose lives he had ended. They didn't matter to him when he was killing them, and they didn't matter to him now. The man who had previously held Roby's position had operated during a particularly busy time for Roby's clandestine agency. Shane Connors had terminated nearly 30% more targets than Roby had in the same amount of time. Connors had been a good, sound mentor to the man who would replace him. After his retirement, Connors had been assigned to a desk job. Roby had had little contact with him over the last five years, but there were few men Roby respected more, and thinking about Connors made Roby dwell for a bit on his own retirement. A number of years off, it would eventually happen. If I survive, he thought. Roby's line of work was a young man's game. Even at forty, Roby knew he couldn't do it another dozen years— his skills would erode too much. One of his targets would be better than he was. He would die. And then his thoughts came back to Shane Connors, sitting behind his desk. Roby supposed that was death, too, simply by another name. He walked to the front door, placed his eye against the peephole. Though he didn't personally know any of his neighbors, that did not mean he wasn't curious about them. He was, in fact, very curious. It wasn't hard to explain why. Their lives were normal. Roby's was not. 
Seeing them going about their everyday lives was his only way to stay connected to reality. He'd even thought about starting to socialize with some of them. Not only would it provide good cover for him, attempting to blend in, but also it would help prepare him for the day when he would no longer do what he did now, when he might have a normal life of sorts. Then his thoughts turned, as they inevitably did, back to the upcoming mission. One more trip. One more kill. It would be difficult, but then they all were. He could very easily die. But that was also always the case. It was a strange way to spend one's life, he knew. But it was his way. Chapter 4 The Costa del Sol had lived up to its name today. Roby wore a straw-colored narrow brim hat, a white t-shirt, a blue jacket, faded jeans and sandals. There was three days' worth of stubble on his tanned face. He was on holiday, or at least looked to be. Roby boarded the large, bulky ferry to cross the Strait of Gibraltar. He looked back to the mountains rising along the rugged and imposing Spanish coastline. The juxtaposition of the high rock to the blue med was captivating. He admired it for a few seconds and then turned away, forgetting the image just as quickly. He had other things occupying his mind. The high-speed ferry headed to Morocco. It pitched and swayed like a metronome as it left Tarifa Harbor on its way to Tangier. Once it gathered speed and hit the open waters, the ride smoothed out. The belly of the ferry was filled with cars, buses, and tractor trailers. The rest was crammed with passengers eating, playing video games in an arcade, and purchasing duty-free cigarettes and perfume by the carload. Roby sat in his seat and admired the view, or at least pretended to. The strait was only nine miles wide, and the ride would take only about forty minutes. Not a lot of time to contemplate anything. He spent it alternately gazing out at the waters of the med and studying the other passengers. They were mostly tourists, eager to say they had been to Africa, although Roby knew that Morocco was very different from what most people probably would think of Africa to be like. He walked off the ferry in Tangier. Buses, taxis, and tour guides awaited the masses. Roby bypassed them all and left the port on foot. He entered the main streets of the town and was instantly besieged by peddlers, beggars, and shopkeepers. Children pulled on his jacket, asking for money. He pointed his gaze down and kept walking. He passed through the congested spice market. At one corner, he nearly stepped on an elderly woman who looked to have fallen asleep while holding onto a few loaves of bread for sale. This had probably been her entire life, thought Roby. This corner, and a few loaves of bread for sale. Her clothes were dirty, her skin the same. She was soft and plump, but malnourished, as was often the case. He bent down and put some coins in her hand. Her gnarled fingers closed around them. She thanked him in her language. He said, You're welcome, in his. They both somehow understood the exchange. He walked on, increasing his pace, taking any steps he encountered two and three at a time. He passed by snake charmers, who placed exotically colored and defanged reptiles around the necks of sunburned tourists. They wouldn't take the snakes off unless five euros were placed in their hands. A nice racket if one could get it, thought Roby. His destination was a room over a restaurant promising authentic local food— it was a tourist trap, he knew. The food was generic, the beer warm, and the service indifferent. The bus guides led unsuspecting folks there and then hurried elsewhere to eat a far better meal. He headed up the stairs, unlocked the door to the room with the key he had previously been given, and locked the door behind him. He looked around. Bed, chair, window. All he needed. He put his hat on the bed, looked out the window, and eyed his watch. It was 11 a.m. local time. 
The flash drive had long since been destroyed. The plan was in place and the movements practiced at a mock facility back in the States that was the exact duplicate of his target. Now he simply had to wait, the hardest part of all. He sat on the bed, massaged his neck, working out kinks from the long trip by plane and boat. This time the target was no idiot like Rivera. He was a cautious man with professional assets who wouldn't spray bullets around. This one would be harder, or at least it should be. Roby had brought nothing with him from Spain because he had to pass through customs to get on the ferry. A weapon found in a bag by Spanish police would have been something more than problematic. But everything he needed would be in Tangier. He took off his jacket, lay back on the bed, and let the heat from the outside make him drowsy. He closed his eyes, knowing he would open them again in four hours. The sounds from the street receded as he fell asleep. When he woke, nearly four hours had passed, and it was the hottest part of the day. He wiped sweat from his face and went back to the window, looked out. He watched big tour buses navigate streets never built for anything so large or cumbersome. The sidewalks were full of people, both locals and visitors. He waited another hour, and then left his room. On the street, he turned east and double-timed it. In a few seconds, he was lost in the hustle and bustle of the old city. He would collect what he needed and move on. All these items would be for the mission. He had traveled to 37 countries and had never purchased a single souvenir. Seven hours later, it was quite dark. Roby approached the large, stark facility from the west. Over his back was slung a hardened case and a knapsack with water, a pea jar, and provisions. He did not plan on leaving here for the next three days. He looked around, taking in the smells of a third world country. The air was also heavy with the threat of rain. That would not bother him. This task was an inside job. He checked his watch and heard it approach. He ducked down behind a cluster of barrels. The truck passed by him and stopped. He approached it from the rear. Three strides later, he was under it, holding on to metal jutting out from its underside. The truck drove on and then stopped once more. There was a long, wrenching sound of metal on metal. It started up again with a jolt that nearly caused Roby to lose his grip. Fifty feet later, the truck stopped once more. The doors opened. Feet touched the floor. Doors clunked shut. Footsteps headed off. The wrenching sound came again. Then hardened locks were clicked into place. There was quiet, except for the footfalls of the perimeter patrol that would be there 24-7 for at least the next three days. Roby timed it so he was out from under the truck and racing away just as the wrenching sound stopped. The facility technically had been cleared and put in lockdown. This was the only opportunity Roby had to get in. Mission accomplished, at least this part. He took the steps three at a time, the hard-sided case hitting him in the back. Next came the race against the clock. He reached the top, grabbed the girder, and did a monkey crawl, hand over hand, to the targeted spot. He swung to the left, and then the right, and then made his leap. He landed nearly silently on metal and skittered to a spot 80 feet distant in one of the darkest corners of the space. He did so with five seconds to spare. The lights clicked off, and the alarms came on. The interior space was instantly crisscrossed with beams of energy that were invisible to the naked eye. But if anything with a pulse touched them, sirens would go off. All intruders found would be executed. It was just that sort of place. Roby turned over on his back, his face to the ceiling. Three days, or 72 hours to go. It seemed his entire existence was one uninterrupted countdown. Chapter 5
It was time. The prayer rugs came out. Knees dropped to the ground, and all heads turned east, and then lowered to rest near the knees. Mouths opened, and the familiar chants flowed. Mecca was 2,500 nautical miles away, about five hours by plane. For the folks on the rugs, it was a lot closer. Prayers said, religious duties fulfilled, the rugs were rolled back up and stowed away. Allah was also put away, in the backs of his followers' minds. It was too early to eat, but it was not too early to drink. There were places in Tangier that accommodated this, Muslim teetotalers or not. The two dozen men went to one such place. They did not walk along the streets. They traveled in a four-hummer motorcade. The Hummers were armored to American military standards and would defeat all bullets and most missile strikes. Like the buses, these vehicles seemed far too large for the narrow streets. The main man rode in the third Hummer, where his front and rear were covered. The man's name was Khalid bin Talal. He was a Saudi prince, a cousin to the king. With that sole connection, he was accorded respect in almost all corners of the Muslim and Christian worlds. He did not come to Tangier very often. Tonight he was here to do business. He was scheduled to leave during the early morning hours in his private jet that cost well over one hundred million dollars, a staggering sum to virtually anyone. It was less than one percent of his net worth. The Saudis were close allies of the West in general and the Americans specifically, at least in public. A stable flow of petroleum made for good friendships. The world moved around at speed, and men from a desert country where few things would grow could afford aircraft costing nine figures. However, this Saudi prince was not such a friend. Talal hated the West. He hated the Americans most of all. That was a dangerous position to openly take against the world's remaining superpower. Talal was suspected in the kidnapping, torture, and murder of four U.S. servicemen, abducted from a club in London. Nothing could be proven, though, and the prince had suffered no consequences. He was also suspected of bankrolling three terrorist attacks in two different countries, resulting in the deaths of over 100 people a dozen of them Americans. Again, nothing could be proven, and there were no repercussions. But those actions eventually had put Talal on a list, and the payment for being on that list was about to come due with the full blessing of the Saudi leadership. He simply had become too bothersome and ambitious to let survive. The people he had come here to meet did not much like the West or the Americans either, they and Talal had a lot in common. They envisioned a world that did not have the stars and stripes leading the way. The gathering was to discuss how to make such a world happen. This caucus was a closely guarded secret. Their mistake was letting the closely guarded secret no longer remain a secret. The club was entered through a metal door with a number pad. Talal's lead guard hit the ten-digit code that was changed daily. The six-inch-thick hydraulic-powered door clanged shut behind them. There were blast walls set up at strategic points. The interior perimeter was ringed by armed guards. This was serious security for the few people who could afford it. The prince and his group sat at a large round table in a roped-off area that was hidden behind drapes and set atop an elevated teakwood platform. The prince's eyes continually moved, sizing up the environment around him. He had survived two assassination attempts, one by a cousin of his and another by the French. The cousin was dead, and so was France's best contract killer. Talal trusted no one. He knew the Americans wouldn't be far behind now that their French ally had failed. His guards were vetted and loyal, and a close-knit group that allowed no outsiders in. There were no whites, blacks, or Hispanics anywhere near his inner circle. He was armed. He was a good shot. 
He kept his mirrored sunglasses on even indoors. No one could tell where he was looking. The lenses were also specially designed. Their magnification levels allowed him to see things his naked eye could not. But he did not have eyes in the back of his head. The uniformed waiter approached not with drinks, but merely with napkins. The prince brought his own glasses and liquor. Being poisoned was not on his agenda. He poured his Bombay sapphire and added the tonic. He sipped, his gaze swiveling, his mind partly focused on the upcoming meeting. He was prepared for every contingency, except an enlarged prostate. It was an annoyance that even his wealth could not overcome. He could not have someone else piss for him. His men made sure the bathroom was empty of enemies and free of explosives, and inaccessible except for the one door. An aide wiped down the sink, commode, and stall with an antibacterial spray. Billionaire royalty do not frequent urinals. Talal went to the cleansed stall, closed the door behind him, and latched it, using a handkerchief to do so. He had discarded his robes before coming here. He wore a custom-made suit that cost 10,000 British pounds. He had fifty such suits and couldn't remember where they all were, since they were spread over as many properties around the world. He had never flown commercial even as a young man. He had teams of servants at each of his homes. When he stayed at hotels, they were the finest, and he rented out entire floors so he would not have to endure seeing a common person when he went to his room. He was whisked everywhere, either by motorcade or helicopter. People of his wealth did not sit in traffic. His life of rarefied luxury was unimaginable, and that was fine by him, because in his mind, he was unlike other human beings. I am better, he thought, far better. Yet he still had to unzip his fly to do his personal business, just like every other man, rich or poor. He studied the wall in front of him the graffiti and filthy language written there. He finally looked away in disgust. It was the Western influence that had brought such things. Of that, he was convinced. In that world, women could drive cars, vote, work outside the house, and dress like whores. It was ruining the world. Even his country now said that women could vote and do other things that only men should be able to do. The king was insane, and worse a puppet of the West. He hit the flush lever with the sole of his shoe, zipped his pants, and unlatched the stall door. While he washed his hands, he stared at his image in the mirror. A fifty-year-old man looked back at him, gray in the beard and quite large in the belly. He was worth well north of twelve billion dollars, making him the sixty-first richest person in the world, according to Forbes magazine. He had taken his oil money and leveraged it into many profitable operations, using his business savvy and international connections. He was sandwiched on the list between a Russian oligarch who used gangster tactics after the fall of the Soviet Union to snap up state assets for virtually nothing, and a twenty-something tech king whose company had never made a dime in profit. He left the bathroom and walked back to the table with his guards organized in a hard diamond pattern around him. He had copied this tactic from the American Secret Service. His personal physician traveled with him, just like the U.S. president. Why not emulate the strongest, was his thinking. And in his mind, he was just as important as the American president. In fact, he would have liked to replace him as the de facto leader of the free world although the world would not be nearly as free with him in charge, starting with the women. Drinks finished, they moved on to their evening meal at a restaurant that had been completely rented out so that the prince could dine in peace without the fear of strangers interrupting. After that, he changed back into his robes and returned to his jet, housed in a secure hangar back at a private jet park outside the city. The Hummers pulled past the open doors of the hangar and stopped in front of the massive jet. While most planes were painted white, 
This one was all black. The prince liked the color. He thought it was masculine and powerful, and possessed a tangible element of danger. Just like him. The hangar doors closed before he got out of the Hummer. There would be no targets for long-range rifle shots between open hangar doors. He walked up the steps, puffing slightly as he neared the top. The hangar doors would reopen only when the plane was ready to take off. The meeting would be held on the plane while it was on the ground. The meeting would last for one hour. The prince would control the meeting. He was used to controlling situations. That was about to end. Chapter 6 There were two guards at the bottom of the stairs leading to the jet. The rest of the security was in the plane, surrounding what would be the main target for any attack. The fuselage door was closed, locked. It was like a vault, a very expensive vault. But like all vaults, there were weaknesses. The prince sat at the center of the table in the main part of the cabin. The interior was entirely of his own design. The plane consisted of nearly 8,000 square feet of marble and exotic woods, oriental rugs, and exquisite paintings and sculptures by long-dead museum-quality artists that he could admire at 41,000 feet and 500 miles an hour. Talal was a man who spent his money and thereby enjoyed his wealth. He gazed around the table. There were two men here who were visitors. One was Russian, the other Palestinian. An unlikely partnership, but one that intrigued the prince. They had promised that for the right price they could accomplish something that virtually everyone, the prince included, would have thought impossible. The prince cleared his throat. You're sure you can do this? His tone was full of incredulity. The Russian, a big man with a full beard and a hairless head that gave him an unbalanced, bottom-heavy appearance, nodded slowly but firmly. The prince said, I am curious as to how this is possible, because I have been told that it is absolutely pointless even to try. The strongest chain is defeated by its weakest link. This came from the Palestinian. He was a small man, but with a fuller beard than the Russian. They were like a tugboat and a battleship, but it was clear that the small man was the leader of the partnership. And what is the weakest link? One person, but that person is placed next to the one you want. We own that person. I cannot see how that is possible, said the prince. It is not just possible. It is fact. But even so, access to weapons? The person's job will allow access to the necessary weapon. And how do you own such a person? That detail is not important. It is important to me. This person must be willing to die, then. There is no other way. The Palestinian nodded. That condition is met. Why? Westerners do not do that. I did not say that the person is a Westerner. A plant? Decades in the making. Why? Why do any of us do anything? We believe in certain things, and we must take steps to realize those beliefs. The prince sat back. He looked intrigued. The Palestinian said, The plans are in place. But, as you know, significant funds are required for something like this, much of it in the aftermath. Our person is secure for now, but that could change soon. There are eyes and ears everywhere. The longer we wait, the greater the chances of the mission failing before it has been given a chance to succeed. The prince ran his fingers over the carved wood of the table as he glanced out the window. The windows were extra large because he enjoyed the views from his high perch. The subsonic round hit him squarely in the forehead, exploding his brain. He fell back against his leather seat and then slowly slid to the floor. 
Gray matter, blood, bone, and tissue covered the plane's once beautiful interior. The Russian leapt up, but had no weapon. It had been confiscated at the door. The Palestinian just sat there, paralyzed. The guards reacted. One pointed to the shattered plane window. Out there! They rushed to the door. The two guards outside the plane had drawn their weapons and fired at the source of the fatal shot. Shots pinged around Roby's position. He aimed and fired back. The first sentry fell with a kill shot to the head. The second collapsed a few moments after that, with a bullet wedged in his heart. From his high perch, Roby pointed his rifle's muzzle at the door of the plane. He sent five shots right through the center, destroying the opening mechanism. He swiveled around and took out the cockpit window, and with it, the plane's controls. The big bird would be grounded for a while. It was fortunate for his mission that bulletproof material was too thick and heavy to carry on planes. That made it simply a hundred million dollar vault with a very large Achilles heel. Then he was done with killing. Now came the hardest part, the exit. He tight-walked down the girder until he reached a wall on the far side of the hangar. He pushed open the window, attached his cable to the support ring he had bolted into place the night before, and rappelled down the wall. His feet touched the asphalt, and he ran due east, away from the hangar and the dead prince. He scaled a fence, dropped to the other side. He heard shouts behind him. Some beams of light broke the darkness. Shots headed his way all way off target. He knew that could change. The car raced up. He threw his gear in the back seat, jumped in, and it drove off before his door was even shut. Roby did not look at the driver and the driver did not look at him. The car traveled for only a few miles and entered the outskirts of Tangier before stopping. Roby slipped out, headed down an alley, walked another 500 feet, and entered a small courtyard. A blue Fiat was there. He slid into the driver's seat, snagged the keys from under the visor, and started it up. He gunned the engine and left the courtyard. Five minutes later, he neared the center of Tangier. He drove through the city and parked the car at the port. He popped the rear hatch and pulled out a small bag packed with clothes and other essentials, including travel documents and local currency. He boarded not the high-speed ferry back to Spain, which he had taken to get here, but instead the slow ferry from Tangier to Barcelona. It took 24 hours to go from Barcelona to Tangier and three hours longer to go from Tangier to Barcelona. His employer had sprung for a three-person family berth rather than simply a seat. He went to this space, stowed his bag, locked his door, and lay on the bed. A few minutes later, the ferry slipped away from the dock. Roby could see the logic. No one would expect an assassin to escape via a boat that took over a full day to get to its destination. They would check the airports, the high-speed ferries, the highways, and the train stations, but not the lumbering old bathtub that would take twenty-seven hours to go a few hundred miles up the Med. He would actually arrive two days from now, since it was nearly midnight. Roby had had with him a long-range surveillance cone that had allowed him to hear the conversation on the plane between the prince and the two other men. Access to weapons. Decades in the making. Significant funds for the aftermath. It would have to be followed up, but that was not his job. He had completed his task. He would make his report and others would now take over. He was certain that even the Saudi royal family would be relieved that one of their black sheep had been killed. Their official statement would condemn such an act of violence. They would demand a full investigation. They would posture and fume and whine. Tense diplomatic communications would be exchanged. But in private, they would toast the ones responsible for the killing. In other words, they would toast the Americans. It had been a clean operation. Roby had had the prince in his crosshairs from the moment he'd gotten out of his SUV. He could have taken him out then, but wanted to wait until the prince and his guards were on the plane. 
It would allow him more time to get away if the security detail were trapped inside the aircraft. He had lost sight of the prince for about half a minute right after he had entered the plane, but had reacquired him as he walked down the aisle and sat at the table. Roby had aimed for the head of Talal, even though it was a tougher shot, because of something he'd seen through his scope. When the prince had leaned forward in his chair, Roby had seen the straps underneath the man's robes. He was wearing body armor. One did not wear body armor around the head. Roby had spent three days and nights of his life perched high up, peeing into a jar and eating power bars, while waiting for his target in a facility that was supposedly in lockdown and totally secure. Now the prince was dead. His plans would die with him. Will Roby closed his eyes and slept, as the ferry gently swayed on its slow ride over the calm waters of the Med. Chapter 7 This one was different. It was close to home. So close that it was home. Nearly three months had passed since Tangier and the death of Khalid bin Talal. The weather was cooler, the sky a little grayer. Roby had not killed anyone during that time. It was an unusually long period for him to be inactive, but he did not mind. He took walks, he read books, he ate out. He did some traveling that did not involve the death of someone. In other words, he acted normal. But then that flash drive had appeared, and Roby had had to stop being normal and pick up his gun again. The mission had come to him two days ago. Not much time to prepare, but the mission was a priority, the flash drive told him. And when the flash spoke, Roby acted. He sat in a chair in his living room, a cup of coffee in his hand. It was early in the morning, and he had been up for several hours. As the next mission grew closer, it had been difficult for him to sleep. It had always been that way with him. Not so much nervousness as a desire for heightened preparation. When he was awake, part of his brain was constantly refining the plan, finding errors and fixing them. He could not do that while he was asleep. During his downtime, he had adhered to his earlier plan of socializing more, and even accepted an invitation to an informal party held by one of his neighbors at the man's apartment on the third floor. Only a dozen people had attended, some of whom also lived in the building. The neighbor had introduced Roby to several of his friends. However, Roby's attention had quickly focused on one young woman. She was a recent renter here, who made the trek to the White House as early as 4 a.m. on her bike. Roby knew where she worked because he had received a briefing on her. He knew she left that early for work because he had often watched her through his peephole. She was a lot younger than Roby, lovely, intelligent, at least from what he had observed. They had made eye contact on several occasions. Roby sensed she might be as friendless as he— he also sensed that if he started talking to her, she wouldn't have minded. She had worn a short black skirt and a white blouse. Her hair was swept back into a ponytail. She had a drink in hand, and every so often she would glance in Roby's direction, smile, and then look away as she continued her conversation with another person whom Roby didn't recognize. Several times Roby had thought about approaching her, yet he had left the party without doing so. As he was walking out, he'd glanced back at her. She was laughing at a comment made by someone and never looked his way. It was probably better that way, he'd thought, because really, what would have been the point? Roby rose and stared out the window. It was fall now. The leaves in the park had started to turn. The evenings were chilly. The humidity of summer was sometimes still with them, but its intense edge had measurably eroded. The current climate was not bad for a city that was built on a swamp, and still was a swamp by many people's estimation, at least the part where the professional politicians nested. Roby had done his recon in the abbreviated time allotted. The run-throughs, logistically harder in this situation, had still been performed and he still didn't like it. 
but it was not his call. The location would not involve Roby stepping on a plane or train, but the target was different as well, and not in a good way. Sometimes he went after people intent on global menace, like Rivera or Talal. Or sometimes he simply went after a problem. You could take your pick of labels, but in the end, they all meant the same thing. His employer had decided who among the living and breathing would qualify as a target. And then they turned to men like Roby to end the living and breathing part. It made the world better, was the justification. Like flinging the planet's most potent army against a madman in the Middle East. Military victory was ensured from the start. What could not be wholly predicted was what came after victory. Like a morphing chaos you couldn't escape. Trapped in a trap of your own making. The agency Roby worked for had a clear policy on operatives who were caught during a mission. There would be no acknowledgement that Roby even worked for the United States. There would be no steps taken to save him. It was the opposite of the U.S. Marines mantra. Everyone in Roby's world was left behind. Thus, on every mission, Roby had employed an exit plan known only to him, in case the operation went awry. He had never needed to employ his personal backup plan because he had never failed a mission. Yet. Tomorrow was simply another day for something to go wrong. Shane Connors was the one who had taught Roby this. He had told Roby that he had to use his backup plan once in Libya, when the operation, through no fault of his, had imploded. You're the only one out there who really has your back, Will, Connors had told him. That advice had stayed with Roby all these years. He would never forget it. Roby surveyed his apartment. He'd been here four years, liked it for the most part. There were restaurants within walking distance. The area was interesting, with many unusual shops that were not part of homogenous national chains. Roby ate out a lot. He liked to sit at tables and watch people go by. He was a student of humanity in a way. That was why he was still alive. He could read people, often after observing them for only a few seconds. It was not a natural talent. It was a skill he had built up over time, as most useful skills were. In the basement of his building was a gym where he would go to work out, hone his muscles, ratchet up his motor skills, practice techniques that needed practicing. He was the only one who ever used the facility. For training involving weapons and other necessary tools of his trade, there were other places he went, other people he worked with. At forty years of age, it didn't come any easier. He toggled his neck back and forth and was rewarded with a satisfying pop. He heard a door open and close in the hall. He stepped to his peephole and watched the woman walk her bike down the hall. This was the woman from the party, the one that worked at the White House. She sometimes wore jeans on the way to work and then presumably changed into her official duds when she got there. She was always the first to leave the building in the morning, unless Roby had already departed for some reason. A. Lambert. That was the name on the mailbox downstairs. He knew the A stood for Anne. His background briefing on her had told him that. His own mailbox simply said, Roby. No first initial. He had no idea if people wondered about that or not. Probably not, though. She was in her late twenties, tall, long blonde hair, thin. He once had seen her in shorts when she first moved in. She was somewhat knock-kneed, but her face was elegantly structured, with a mole under her right eyebrow. He had heard her during a discussion in the hall with a fellow tenant who did not support the current administration. Her replies had been sharp and informed. Roby had been impressed. He had started referring to her in his own mind as A. Roby stepped back from the door when she disappeared into the elevator with her bike. He moved back to another window overlooking the street. A minute later, she left the building, shouldered her knapsack, swung onto her bike, and was off. 
He watched her until she turned the corner and the reflector strips on her backpack and helmet disappeared from view. Next stop, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. It was 4.30 in the morning. He turned back from the window and surveyed his living space. There was nothing in his apartment that would tell anyone searching it what he did. He had an official position that would be backed up to the fullest in case anyone questioned anything. But still, his apartment was nondescript and contained almost nothing of personal interest. He preferred that to having others invent a past for him, placing photos of people he didn't even know around his apartment and passing them off as relatives or friends, hobbying a residence with tennis rackets or skis or stamp collection books or a musical instrument was standard procedure. He had turned all such offers down. There was a bed, a few chairs, some books he'd actually read, lamps, tables, a place to eat, a place to shower and use the toilet. He reached up to the pull-up bar he kept over the doorway leading to his bedroom and did a quick twenty. It was good to feel his muscles in motion, pulling his weight up to the bar with relative ease. He could run most twenty-somethings into the ground. His strength and motor skills were still excellent. Yet he was forty now, and clearly not what he once was. He could only hope to counter the inevitable erosion of skills and physicality with increased field experience. He lay down in the bed, but didn't put any covers over him. He kept the apartment cold. He needed to sleep. The coming night would be busy. And different. Chapter 8 Roby was in the basement gymnasium of his building. It was nearly 9 p.m., but the place was open 24-7 for the residents. All you needed was your key card. In one respect, Roby's workout routine never varied. He never did the same workout twice in a row. He focused not on strength or stamina or flexibility or balance or coordination or agility. He focused on them all. Every exercise he did required at least two and sometimes all of those elements. He hung upside down on the pull-up bar. He did stomach crunches and then worked his oblique muscles while holding a medicine ball. The U.S. Army had devised a functional fitness regime that mimicked what soldiers did in the field, the sorts of muscles and skills required on the battlefield. Roby held to the same concept and worked on things he needed to survive out there, lunges, thrusts, explosiveness from his calves up. He worked everything in synergy, upper body and lower body at the same time. He was pushing his core past the breaking point. He was chiseled, but never took his shirt off. No one would ever see him strolling along displaying his six-pack, unless he needed to, as part of a mission. He did a half hour's worth of yoga until he was drenched in sweat. He was holding an iron cross on the pull-up bar when the door opened. A. Lambert stared over at him. She didn't smile or even acknowledge him. She closed the door behind her, went over to a corner, and sat down cross-legged on an exercise mat. Roby held the cross for another thirty seconds, not to impress her because she wasn't even looking at him. He held it because he had to push his body past what it was used to. Otherwise, he was just wasting his time. He let go and dropped lightly to the floor. He snagged his towel and wiped off his face. I think you're the only one who uses this room. He slid the towel down to find her now looking at him. She was wearing jeans and a white t-shirt. The shirt and jeans were tight. No place to conceal a weapon. Roby always checked that first, male or female, young or old. You're here, he said. Not to work out. What then? Tough day at the office. Just chilling. He looked around the small, ill-lighted room. It smelled of old sweat and mold. Must be nicer places to chill than this. I didn't expect to find anyone else here. Except me, maybe. From what you said, you knew I used this room. I just said that because I saw you here tonight. I've never seen you down here before, or anyone else, for that matter. 
He knew the answer, but asked. So, tough day at the office? Where do you work? The White House. That's pretty impressive. Some days it doesn't feel that impressive. What about you? Investments. Do you work at one of the big firms? No, I'm on my own. Always have been. Roby draped the towel around his shoulders. Well, I guess I'll leave you to your chilling. However, he didn't really want to leave just yet. Perhaps she sensed this. She rose and said, I'm Annie, Annie Lambert. Hello, Annie Lambert. They shook hands. Her fingers were long, supple, and surprisingly strong. You have a name? Roby. First or last? Last. It's on the mailbox. And your first? Will. That was harder than it should have been. She smiled. He found himself grinning back. I'm not the most outgoing guy you'll ever meet. But I saw you at the party on the third floor the other night. It was a little out of character for me. First time I've had a mojito in a long time. Me too. Maybe we can go out for a drink sometime. Roby had no idea why that offer had come out of his mouth. Okay. Sounds good. Good night. Have a nice chill. He closed the door behind him and took the elevator back up to his floor. He immediately made a phone call. He didn't really want to do it, but any contact like that had to be reported. Roby didn't think there was anything to be worried about with Annie Lambert, but the rules were clear. Annie Lambert would be investigated to a greater degree. If anything turned up, Roby would be notified and appropriate action would be taken. As he sat in his kitchen, Roby wondered if he should have made the call at all. He could not look at anything normally ever again. Someone being friendly to him was a potential threat. It had to be reported. A woman chilling and saying hello to him had to be called in. I live in a world that isn't remotely normal anymore, he thought, if it ever was. But it won't always be like this, and there was no agency rule against having a drink with someone. So maybe he would, sometime. He left his building and walked across the street. The high-rise there had a perfect view of his, which was the point. On the fourth floor was an empty apartment. Roby had a key for it. He entered the apartment and went directly to the corner of the front room. Set up there was a surveillance scope that was rated as one of the best in the world. He powered it up and turned its muzzle toward his building. He pushed and pulled on dials, making corrective adjustments until a certain part of his building came into sharp focus. His floor, down the hall, three doors. The lights were on. The shades raised three quarters. He waited. Ten minutes, twenty minutes. It was all the same to Roby. Annie Lambert's front door opened and closed. She moved down the hall. He swung the scope and measured movements following her trek. She stopped at the kitchen, opened the fridge, and took out a Diet Coke. With his scope, he could read the label clearly. She closed the fridge with a swipe of her hip. She filled the glass halfway up with the soda and the other half with rum pulled from a cupboard over the stove. She walked down the hall. Before she got to her bedroom, she unzipped her jeans, slipped them off, and tossed them into a laundry basket. She set her drink down on the floor while she pulled her top over her head. Her underwear was pink. She was not the thong type. Her underwear fully covered her bottom. Roby had not seen this. He turned his surveillance device off when she had started to unzip her pants. The scope cost nearly fifty grand. He was not going to use it for pathetic voyeurism. Roby returned to his building and rode the elevator to the top floor. An access door that was locked led to the roof. The lock was not a complicated one for him. Roby took a short flight of steps up to the very top of the building. He ventured to the edge and looked out over the city. Washington, D.C. looked back at him. It was a lovely city at night. The monuments looked particularly magnificent when mood lighted against the darkness. 
In Roby's mind, D.C. was the only city in the United States to truly rival the great cities of Europe when it came to official decoration. But it was also a city of secrets. Roby and people like him were one of those secrets. Roby sat down with his back to the wall of the building and gazed upward. A. Lambert had officially become Annie Lambert. Knowing it from the briefing paper wasn't the same as hearing it in person. And he had reported her for nothing more than probably just being friendly. Tough day at the office, just needed a place to chill. Roby could relate to that. He had some tough days at the office. He could use a place to chill. But that would never happen. He showered and changed into fresh clothes. Then he gunned up. It was time to go to work. Chapter 9 Another foster home she did not want to be in. How many now? Five, six, ten? She supposed it didn't really matter. She listened to the screams coming from the downstairs of the duplex she had called home for the last three weeks. The man and woman downstairs yelling at each other were her foster parents, which was more than a joke, she thought. It was criminal. They were criminal. They had a string of foster kids through their home and made them pickpocket people and deal drugs. She had refused the pickpocketing and the drug dealing. So tonight would be her last night here. She had already packed her backpack with her few belongings. There were two other foster kids living in the one bedroom with her. They were both younger, and she was loath to leave them here. She sat them on the bed and said, I'm going to get you guys help. I'm going to let social services know what's going on here, okay? They're going to come and get you out of this place. Can't you take us with you, Julie? Asked the girl tearfully. I wish I could, but I can't. But I'm going to get you out of here, I promise. The boy said, they won't believe you. Yes, they will. I've got proof. She gave them each a hug, opened the window, climbed out, wriggled down the drain pipe to the flat roof of the attached carport, worked her way down a support pole, reached the ground, and ran off into the darkness. She had one thought in mind. I'm going home. Home was a duplex even smaller than the one she had just left. She took the subway, then a bus, and then she walked. Along the way, she pulled out an envelope, walked up the steps of a large brick government building, and pushed the envelope through the mail slot in the door. It was addressed to the woman who was handling the foster care placement for her and the two other kids back at the duplex. She was a nice lady. She meant well. But she was completely swamped with children no one seemed to want. In the envelope was a photo card with pictures capturing the couple in the middle of abusing their foster kids, engaging in clearly illegal activity and sitting stoned on the couch with crack pipes and piles of pills in full view. If that didn't do the trick, she thought, nothing would. She reached the house an hour later. She didn't go in the front door. She did what she always had done when getting home this late. She used a key she kept in her shoe to go in the back door. She tried to turn on a light, but nothing happened. This did not surprise her. It merely meant that the electricity had been turned off because the utility bill had not been paid. She felt along the walls and used the moonlight coming in through the windows to see well enough to reach her bedroom on the second floor. Her room was unchanged. It was a dump, but it was her dump. A guitar, sheets of music, books, clothes, magazines were piled everywhere. There was a mattress on the floor that served as her bed, but it wasn't easily visible under all the other stuff. She rationalized that her parents had not cleaned up her room because they knew she would be back. They had problems, many of them. They would be regarded by most people as pathetic, drugged-out losers, but they were her parents.
They loved her, and she loved them. She wanted to take care of them. At age 14, she was often the mom and dad, and her parents were often the kids. They were her responsibility, not the other way around. But that was okay. They should be asleep by now, she knew. Hopefully, not stoned. Actually, things were looking up. Her father was working on a loading dock and had been gainfully employed there for a whole two months. Her mother labored as a waitress in a diner where a two-dollar tip was the exception rather than the norm. It was true that her mom and dad were recovering addicts, but they got up every day and went to work. It was just that the drug problems and the stints in jail had led the city to sometimes deem them unfit to have custody of her. Hence the banishment to the foster care system. But not for her, not anymore. Now she was home. She fingered the piece of paper in her jacket pocket. It was a note from her mom. It had been sent to her school and left at the office. Her parents had plans to move away from the area and start over fresh. And they, of course, wanted their only child to go with them. Julie hadn't been this excited in a long time. She went to their bedroom across the hall to check on them, but it was empty. Their bed was like hers, simply a mattress on the floor. But the room wasn't messy. Her mother had tidied up. Clothes were put away, albeit in baskets. They had no dressers or armoires. She sat on the bed and removed a photo of the three of them that was hanging on the wall. She couldn't see it that well in the dark, but she knew exactly who was in it. Her mother was tall and thin, her father shorter and even skinnier. They looked unhealthy, and they were. Years of drug abuse had left permanent scars, chronic problems, lives that would be significantly shortened. Yet they had always been kind to her, never abused her, looked out for her when they could, fed her, kept her warm and safe, again when they could. They never brought problems back to the house. The abuses they committed were done away from here. She appreciated that. And every time she had gone into foster care, they had worked hard to get her back. She put the photo back on the wall and pulled out the note from her mom that had been sent to her school. She read it again. The instructions were clear. She was excited. This might be the start of something great, just the three of them in a new life away from here. The only thing that bothered her was the contingency plan her mom had put in the note, if, for some reason, they didn't hook up with their daughter. There had also been cash along with the note. The money was for the contingency plan. Well, there was no reason that her parents wouldn't be able to meet up with her. She assumed that they would be leaving in the morning. She started to the door to return to her room and pack up her belongings that she hadn't taken to the foster care home. And then she stopped. There were noises, which didn't completely surprise her. Since her parents sometimes kept odd hours, they must just be getting home. The next sound she heard erased all of the thoughts she had. It was a man's voice, not her father's. It was raised, angry. It was asking her father what he knew, how much he had been told. She heard her father whimpering, as though he were hurt. Then Julie heard her mother's frantic voice, asking the person to leave them alone. Julie crept down the stairs, her body shaking. She had no cell phone, or else she would have called the police. There was no landline phone in the house. Her parents couldn't afford it. When she heard the gunshot, she froze and then started running down the stairs. When she reached the lower level, she saw her father slumped back against the wall in the darkness. A man held a gun pointed at him. There was a red patch on her father's chest growing bigger. His face was ashen. He fell to the floor, his arms whipsawing around and knocking over a lamp. The man with the gun turned and saw her. He pointed the pistol at her. No! Her mother shrieked. She doesn't know anything. Though barely a hundred pounds, she hit the man in the back of the legs, and he collapsed to the floor in pain, his gun spinning out of reach. Run, honey, run! Screamed her mother. Mom! She called back. Mom, what is... 
Her mother screamed again. Run! Now! She turned and ran back up the stairs, even as the man spun around and landed a crushing blow on the top of her mother's head. She reached her room, grabbed her backpack, sprinted to the window and grabbed hold of a trellis of metal over which someone long ago had planted ivy. She climbed down so quickly that she lost her grip and fell the last six feet. She got up, slung her backpack across her shoulders and ran off. A few seconds later, a second shot came from the house. When the gunman ran outside, the teenager was already out of sight. But he stopped, listened. The sounds of footfalls reached him. He set out west, moving deliberately. Chapter 10 The woman walked to her car. She was probably thinking a million different things as she slipped her briefcase in the back seat of her Toyota sedan, right next to the kitty seats. Busy professional, mother, housekeeper. The list went on and on, as it did for many women. Her black suit was a discount off the rack model, like most of her clothes. It was a bit grimy after a long day, and her heels were nicked in several places. She was not wealthy. But the work she did was important for her country. That made up for a paycheck that was smaller than she could have earned in the private sector. She was in her middle thirties, five feet nine, more than thirty pounds overweight from her last pregnancy, and no time to do anything about it. She had a pair of kids, ages three and less than a year. She was in the process of getting a divorce. She and her soon-to-be ex-husband currently had joint custody of the kids. One week on and one week off. She wanted full custody, but that was difficult to manage with the work she did. There had been a change of schedule tonight. She had one stop to make before heading home. She drove off, her mind swirling with thoughts of work issues mixed with the demands of two active children. There was no room in there for her. But that just came with motherhood, she supposed. Roby stared up at the five-story apartment building. It looked like his place, old, decrepit. But he lived in a nice part of the nation's capital. This was a part of D.C. that suffered from a lot of violent crime. However, this particular neighborhood was becoming safer. You could raise a family here without worrying too much about your kid dying while walking home from school because he was caught in the crossfire of drug crews battling for street supremacy. There was no doorman here. The outer entrance was locked, and one needed a pass card to get in. He had that. There were no surveillance cameras. They cost money. The folks who lived here couldn't afford that, or a doorman. Roby had gone from cartel bosses to Saudi princes to this. The dossier on tonight's target was particularly light. Black woman, age 35. He had her picture and her address. He had not been told the specific reason why she must die tonight, other than she had ties to a terrorist organization. If Roby had to label her, he would probably put her in the problem box his employer sometimes used to justify death. He couldn't visualize anyone living here as being a global menace. They tended to matriculate to fancier addresses, or else hit out from the law in some country that did not extradite to the United States. But terrorist cell members were trained to blend in. She apparently was one of them. In any event, the reason why she had to die was above his pay grade. He looked at his watch. The building was all condo, but less than half occupied. After the financial meltdown, 50% of the folks here had suffered foreclosure. Another 10% had lost their jobs and been evicted. The woman lived on the fourth floor. She was a renter and could never afford the mortgage on this place, foreclosed or not. There were only two other people living on that floor, an old woman who couldn't see or hear and a security guard who worked the night shift and was currently 15 miles away. The apartments above and below the woman were also empty. He toggled his neck, felt the pop. He pulled up his hoodie. The plan was set. There was no stand-down button to push. The rocket was fueled and the launch was commencing. 
He looked at his watch. His spotter had seen her go into the building alone hours ago, grocery bag in one hand, briefcase in the other. She had looked tired, the spotter had reported to Roby. That would be a good look, compared to what was coming. It was moments like this that made Roby wonder what he would do with the rest of his life. He had no problem killing cartel trash or rich megalomaniac desert sheiks, but tonight Roby had a problem. He reached a gloved hand inside his pocket and felt the gun there. Usually it was reassuring for him to touch his weapon. Tonight it was not. She would be in bed. Her apartment was dark. At this hour, she would be sleeping. At least she would feel nothing. He would make certain his strike caused instant death. Life would go on without her. Rich or poor, important or not, life just did. He would leave by the fire escape. It emptied out to an alley, as many of these buildings did. He would be back at his house by 3 a.m., just in time to go to sleep. To forget tonight ever happened. As if I can do that, he thought. Chapter 11 Roby swiped the card through the reader, and the door clicked open. He pulled his hoodie tighter around his head. The hallways were poorly lighted. Fluorescent tubes popped and flickered. The carpet was soiled and pulled up in certain spots. The paint on the walls was peeling. He opened the door to the stairwell and headed up. The air was filled with the smells of cooked food. Mingled together in the air, they did not make a pleasant aroma. He counted the floors. On the fourth one, he exited the stairwell and closed the door behind him. This hall looked just like the one on the first floor. Number 404 was the one he wanted. The blind and deaf lady lived at the end of the hall on the left. The security guard in absentia resided at 411. The lock on 404 was a deadbolt, probably engaged by his target tonight. Roby had noted that most of the other exterior condo doors had simple locks. The deadbolt meant she was security-minded. Yet it took him all of 30 seconds to defeat the lock using two slender pieces of metal in concert. He closed the door behind him and put on his night vision goggles. His gaze swept the small living room. There was a nightlight inserted into an outlet, providing a bit of illumination. It didn't matter. Roby had been given the plans of the apartment and had memorized all relevant details. His fingers closed around the gun in his pocket. The suppressor can was already spun on the muzzle. No wasted time. In one corner of the room was a round, particle board table. On it were a laptop and stacks of paper. The lady had brought her work home, it seemed. There were books on a small shelf. There was no carpet, only worn area rugs. In one corner was a collapsible playpen. On two walls were pieces of construction paper taped up. There were stick figure kids and a stick figure woman with messy hair. In childish script were the words, I, and the word, Mom, separated by a crude drawing of a heart. There were also toys piled in one corner. All this gave Roby pause. I'm here to kill a young mother, he thought. The flash drive had said nothing about kids. Then in his headset came the voice. You should already be in the bedroom. This was also what was different about tonight. He wore a pinhole camera that conveyed live video feedback and an earwig through which his handler could prompt him to do his job more efficiently. Roby moved through the room, stopping at the closed door to the bedroom. He listened at the cheap wood for a few moments and heard what he expected, low breathing, soft snores. He gripped the knob with his gloved hand, pushed the door open, and stepped through. The bed was set against the window. Directly outside was the fire escape. In many respects, this was far too easy. Like a movie set, properly lighted, and waiting for the actors to execute a pivotal scene. It was dark in here, 
but he could still see her lying in the twin bed. Her heavy body made a substantial hump under the covers. Much of her weight was carried in her hips and buttocks. Roby knew it would take some effort to lift her corpse onto the gurney after she'd been pronounced dead. The cops would look for clues, but there would be none. Ordinarily, Roby would police his brass, but he was chambering dum-dum rounds tonight, so most likely they would stay inside her. And if so, the medical examiner would find them during the post. But what he would never have was a gun to match them to. He lifted the Glock out from his pocket and moved forward. When you wanted to make sure one shot would do the trick, there was any number of places where this could be accomplished. To avoid the blowback of blood and tissue on his person that inevitably came with a contact shot, Roby had opted tonight to make the kill shot from a few feet away. He would fire once into the heart, and then for insurance, he would place a second shot into the aorta, which was the width of a garden hose, and ran vertically up to the heart. There were things in front of the aorta, but if one knew where to shoot and the angle was right, the shot would sever the hose ten times out of ten. The bleed out would be lightning fast. And if the bullets somehow passed through her, the mattress would probably collect them. Quick. Clean. He moved to the front of the bed and raised his pistol. She was lying flat on her back. He lined up her heart in his gun sight. Instead of his target, he momentarily saw in his mind the toys, the playpen, the drawing that said, I heart mom. He shook his head clear, refocused. The drawing stormed back into his mind. He shook his head again, and... Roby jerked slightly when he saw the small hump next to her. The head with the wiry hair sticking out. It had been hidden under the covers. He did not pull the trigger. In his ear, the voice said, Shoot. Chapter 12 Roby did not shoot, but he must have made some sound. The wiry head moved, then the little hump sat up. The boy rubbed his eyes, yawned, opened his eyes and stared directly at Roby standing there. His pistol pointed at the boy's mother. Shoot! Shoot her! Roby did not fire. Mommy! said the boy in a fearful tone, never once taking his gaze off Roby. Shoot! Now! The man sounded hysterical. Roby couldn't put a face with the voice because he had never met his handler in person. Standard agency procedure. No one could ID anyone. Mommy! The little boy started to cry. Shoot the kid too! Now! Roby could fire and be gone. Taps to the chest. One big, one small. One dum-dum fired into the child would destroy his insides. He would have no chance. Shoot now, said the voice. Roby did not shoot. The woman began to stir. Mommy! Her son poked her with his fingers, but kept staring at Roby. Tears slid down his thin cheeks. He started to shake. She slowly woke. Yes, baby? She said in a sleepy voice. You're safe, baby. Just a nightmare. You're safe with Mommy. Nothing to be scared of. Mommy? He tugged on her gown. Okay, baby. Okay, Mommy's awake. <gasps> she saw Roby and froze, but only for an instant. Then she pulled her child behind her. She screamed. Roby put a finger to his lips. She screamed again. Shoot them! The handler said frantically. Roby said to her, be quiet, or I shoot. She didn't stop screaming. He fired a round into the pillow next to her. The stuffing flew out, and the round deflected off the mattress springs and drilled into the floor underneath the bed. She stopped screaming. Kill her! The handler roared in Roby's ear. Stay quiet, said Roby to the woman. She sobbed, hugged her son. Please, mister, please don't hurt us. Just stay quiet, said Roby. 
The handler was still screaming in his ear. If the man had been in the room, Roby would have shot the asshole just to shut him up. Take what you want, but please don't hurt us. Don't hurt my baby. She turned, hugged her son, lifted him up so they were face to face. He stopped crying, touched his mother's face. Roby realized something, and his gut tightened. The handler was no longer screaming. His earwig held nothing except silence. He should have picked up on that before. Roby lunged forward. The woman, thinking he was about to attack them, screamed again. The window glass shattered. Roby watched as the rifle round passed through the boy's head and then drove through his mother's, killing them both. It was an enviable shot made by a marksman of enviable skill, but Roby was not thinking of that. The woman's eyes were on Roby when her life ended. She looked surprised. Mother and son fell sideways together. She was still holding him. If anything, her arms, in death, appeared to have tightened around her lifeless child. Roby stood there, gunned down. He looked out the window. The failsafe was out there somewhere with a fine sight line, obviously. Then his instincts took over, and Roby ducked down and rolled away from the window. On the floor he saw something else he had never expected to see tonight. On the floor next to the bed was a baby carrier. In the carrier, sound asleep, was a second kid. Shit, Roby muttered. He crawled forward on his belly. His earwig came alive. Get out of the apartment. By the fire escape. Go to hell, Roby said. He ripped the pinhole and earwig off, powered them down, and stuffed them in his pocket. He snagged the carrier, slid it toward him. He was waiting for a second shot, but he did not intend to give the shooter a viable target. And the man on the other end of the kill shot wouldn't fire without that, Roby knew. He had sometimes been the one holding the rifle out there in the darkness. He moved clear of the window and stood, holding the baby carrier behind him. It was like lugging a large dumbbell. He had to get out of the building, but Roby obviously couldn't go out the way he'd planned. He glanced toward the door. He had to get something before he left. He carried the child out of the bedroom and scanned the living room with a pen light. He spied the woman's purse. He set the carrier down, rifled through the purse, and took out the woman's driver's license. He snapped a picture of it with his phone. Next, he photographed her ID card, her government ID card. What the... That fact had not been on the flash drive. Finally, he spied the blue item partially hidden under a stack of papers. He grabbed it. A U.S. passport. He snapped photos of all the pages, showing the places to which she'd traveled. He put the license, ID card, and passport back and grabbed the carrier. He opened the front door of the apartment and looked right, and then left. He stepped out and hit the stairwell four strides later. He raced down one flight. The layout of the building was whirring through his mind. He had memorized every apartment, every resident, every possibility but never for such a purpose as he had now. Escape from his own people. Number 307, a mother of three, he recalled. He went for it, his feet flying down the hall, touching only lightly on the crappy carpet. Miraculously, the little one slept on. Roby had not really looked at the child since he had picked it up. He glanced down now. The hair was wiry, like that of his dead brother. Roby knew the child would never remember the brother or the mother. Life sometimes was not just unfair, it was beyond tragic. He set the carrier down in front of 307. Roby knocked three times. He did not look around. If someone in another apartment looked out, they would only see his back. He knocked once more and glanced again at the baby that was starting to stir. He heard someone coming to the door and then Roby was gone. The child would survive the night. Roby was pretty certain that he wouldn't. Chapter 13 Roby went down one more flight to the second floor. 
he had two options. The rear of the building was out. The long-range shooter was there. The fact that his handler had wanted him to leave by the fire escape told Roby all he needed to know. A bullet in the head would be his reward for being stupid enough to try to get out that way. The front of the building was out for a similar reason. Well lighted. One entry. He might as well paint a bullseye on his head when the backup team showed up a minute from now to clean up this mess. That left the two sides of the building. His two options. But Roby had to narrow it down to one. And quickly. He was moving as he was thinking. 201 or 216. The first was on the left of the building, the second on the right. The shooter in the rear of the building could move over to the left or right and thus cover the rear and one side simultaneously. So left or right. Roby moved, thought. The handler would be helping the shooter, feeding him where he thought Roby would go. Left or go right? He strained to remember the composition of the area. There was this high-rise building, the alley behind, a block of small businesses, gas station, strip mall. On the other side of that, another high-rise that looked abandoned to Roby when he had done his earlier recon. The shooter had to be in there. That was the only sight line that worked. And if the building was abandoned, the shooter would have room to roam, to reset his position and turn his scope to Roby. So which will it be? Left or right? His original target, 404, was closer to the left side of the building. The handler might think Roby would go that way because he was closest to that side already. The handler didn't know that Roby had gone to the third floor to drop off the other kid and then proceeded down another flight. But the handler would figure Roby would have to go down. He hadn't brought anything to rappel down the side of the building. Roby thought this through. In his mind's eye, he visualized the shooter sliding his position over to his right, Roby's left, setting up his bipod, adjusting his scope, and waiting for Roby to appear. But Roby hadn't appeared yet when speed was essential. The shooter would take this into account. Roby, he knew, was trying to outguess him. Zig, when they expected Zag. So to the right instead of the left. That would explain the time passed thus far not dropping off the second kid. In Roby's mind, he now slid the shooter to the left or Roby's right on his mental chessboard. The time for thinking was over. He sprinted down the hall toward the building's left side. Number 201 was empty, another foreclosure. Small personal miracles sometimes grew from large economic disasters. Ten seconds later, he was inside. The apartments all had the same layout. He didn't need a light or his goggles to navigate. He reached the back bedroom, opened the window, and climbed out. He gripped the window sill, looked down, gauged the drop, and let go. Ten feet later, he hit and rolled, cushioning the fall. Still, he felt pain in his right ankle. He waited for a shot to hit him. None did. He had guessed correctly. He ran at an angle away from the building, hid behind a dumpster for a few moments, recalibrated his senses to the new surroundings. Then he was up and over a fence and sprinting up the street five seconds later. They probably hadn't seen him leave the building, or else he'd be dead. But they had to know by now that he'd gotten away. A response team would be searching for him, grid by grid. Roby knew the drill. Only now he had to defeat it. For as long as he'd been doing this, Roby had known that what had happened tonight was a possibility. Not a distinct possibility, but one he had to account for. Like for all his other missions, he had a contingency exit plan in place. Now it was time to execute the plan. Shane Connors' advice to him had finally come into play. You're the only one out there who really has your back, Will. He walked ten more blocks. His destination was up ahead. He checked his watch. Twenty minutes to spare if the schedule hadn't changed. The year-old out here bus company had taken over an old trailways terminal near Capitol Hill. 
The company obviously didn't have a lot of startup capital, and the station still appeared like it was shut down. The company's buses parked here did not look as if they could pass even a routine inspection. This trip would definitely be economy class all the way. Roby had used a fake name to reserve a ticket on a bus leaving in 20 minutes. Its destination was New York City. He paid for the ticket in cash. Once he got to New York, he would execute the second step in his contingency plan, which would entail him leaving the country. He planned to put as much space between himself and his own people as he could. He waited outside the terminal. Its location was not all that safe, especially at two in the morning, but it was far safer than the situation Roby had just left. Street criminals he could deal with. Professional killers with long-range rifles were far more formidable. He looked at the other people awaiting the arrival of the bus that would carry them to the Big Apple. He counted thirty-five passengers, including himself. The bus would hold nearly twice that, so he would have some buffer space. It was open seating, so he would try and snag a place away from everyone. Most of the people had bags, pillows, and knapsacks. Roby had nothing except his night vision goggles, his pinhole camera, and his Glock pistol in an inside zippered compartment of his hoodie. He ran his gaze over the line of people again. He deduced that most were poor, working class, or otherwise down on their luck. It was an easy assumption. Their clothes were old, tattered, their coats threadbare, their expressions tired, beaten down. Most people with even limited financial means would probably not choose to ride to New York City in the middle of the night on a dilapidated bus carrying their own pillows. The bus pulled into the parking lot in a wide arc and came to a stop near them with a screech of rusty brakes. They all lined up. That's when Roby noticed her. He had already counted her as one of the thirty-five, but now his gaze came to rest fully on her. She was young, maybe twelve, maybe barely a teenager. She was short, skinny, dressed in faded jeans with holes in the knees, a long-sleeved shirt, and a dark blue ski parker without arms. She had on dirty, scuffed tennis shoes, and her dark, stringy hair was pulled back into a tight ponytail. She carried a backpack in one hand, and her gaze was set resolutely on the ground. She seemed to be breathing hard, and Roby noticed that both her hands and her knees had traces of dirt on them. Roby looked for but did not see the small rectangular shape in her jeans' pockets, front or back. Every teenager had a cell phone, especially the girls. Yet unlike most teens, she might keep it in her jacket pocket. In any event, it was none of his business. He looked around, but saw no one who could be her parents. He edged forward in the line. It was not out of the realm of possibility that they would find him here before the bus departed. He gripped his pistol in his pocket and kept his gaze down. On board the bus, he shuffled toward the back. He was the last on, and most people had taken seats nearer the front. He sat on the last row near the bathroom. There was no one else in this row. He sat next to the window. From here, he could remain invisible while still seeing anyone coming through the gap in the two seats in front of him. The windows were tinted. That would foul any attempted shot from outside. The teenage girl sat three rows up from him on the opposite side of the aisle. Roby looked up as a man hustled onto the bus right before the driver shut the door. He showed his ticket and moved toward the back. As he neared the girl, he looked the other way. This was passenger number 36, and the very last to board. Roby sank lower in his seat and pulled his hoodie closer around his face. He gripped his pistol in his pocket and edged the muscle up and forward so that it was aimed at a spot the man had to cross if he continued to head Roby's way. Roby had to assume that they somehow had found out about his contingency plan and had sent this man to finish the job. But the fellow stopped one row beyond the teenage girl, 
and sat in the seat directly behind her. Roby's hand relaxed slightly around his pistol, but he continued to watch the man through the gap. The girl got up and put her bag in the overhead rack. As she stood on tiptoes to accomplish this, her shirt edged up, and Roby saw that her waist was tattooed. The bus pulled off with a grind of gears, and the driver headed out onto the surface street that he would take to the interstate, and then onto New York. There were few cars at this hour. The buildings were dark. The city would awake in a few hours. D.C. was not like New York in that regard. It did sleep, but it rose early. Roby's gaze settled back on the man. He was Roby's size and age. He had no bag. He was dressed in black slacks, gray jacket. Roby's gaze went to the man's hands. They were gloved. Roby looked down at his own gloved hands and then gazed outside. It was not that cold. He saw the man engage the lever to slide his seat back a bit. He settled in. But Roby's instincts told him it wouldn't be for long. This man was not on the bus simply to travel to New York. Chapter 14 Professional killers were a unique lot. Roby thought this as the bus motored along. The vehicle's suspension was for shit, and thus the ride was too. They would have to endure two hundred miles of this. But Roby was not focused on that. He stared through the gap, watching, waiting. When you were on a mission, you looked for things that other people would never focus on, like entry and exit points. Always have at least two of each. Gunsight angles, positions from which others can strike back at you, sizing up opponents without seeming to do so, trying to ferret out intent by reading body cues alone. Never let anyone notice you noticing him. Roby was undertaking all these tasks right now, and it was totally unconnected with his plight. He had people after him, clearly. But just as clearly, the girl had someone after her. And Roby now knew that he was not the only professional killer on board this bus tonight. He was looking at the second one. He slipped the Glock from his pocket. The girl was reading. Roby couldn't see what, but it was a paperback. She was intent on this, oblivious to all of the things that was not good. Young people made easy targets for predators. Young people were glued to their phone screens, thumbs ramming keys, firing off messages of importance like Facebook status, the color of their underwear that day, girl problems, hair problems, sports stats, where the next party was. They also always had earbuds in. With the music roaring, they could hear nothing until the lion struck. Then it was too late. Easy prey, and they didn't even know it. Roby lined up his shot between the seat gap. The other man leaned forward in his seat. They had been traveling for only a few minutes. They were passing through an even more derelict part of the city. There was no one sitting next to the girl in the window seat. There was no one across the aisle from her. The closest person to her was an old woman who had already fallen asleep. Most in the bus had settled down to sleep, though they'd barely gone a half mile as yet. Roby knew how he would do it, head and neck, pull right, pull left, the same method the U.S. Marines teach. Because the target was a child, no weapon would be required. No loss of blood, either. Most people died silently. There was no melodramatic dying sequence. Folks just stopped breathing, gurgled, twitched, and then went quietly. People close by were clueless. But then, most people were clueless. The man tensed. The girl shifted her book a bit, letting the wash from the overhead light hit the page more fully. Roby eased forward. He checked his gun. The suppressor can was spun on as tight as it would go. But in the close confines of the bus, there was no such thing as a silenced gun. He would worry about explanations later. He had watched two people tonight lose their lives, one a little boy. He did not intend to make it three. 
The man set his weight on the balls of his feet. He lifted his hands, positioned them in a certain way. Pull, pull, thought Roby. Head left, neck right, snap. Pull, pull. Dead girl. But not tonight. Chapter 15 Roby could read a lot from a little, but what happened next was not something he had anticipated at all. The man screamed. Roby would have too, since pepper spray stung like hell when it hit the eyes. The girl was still gripping her paperback, keeping her current page. She had not even turned in her seat. She had just fired the spray backward over her head, nailing her attacker directly in the face. However, the man was still moving forward, even as he screamed and clawed at his eyes with one of his hands. The other hand found purchase on the girl's neck at about the time Roby's pistol collided with the man's skull, sending him crashing down to the floor of the bus. The girl looked around at Roby, as most of the passengers awakened now stared at them. Then their gazes drifted to the fallen man. One old woman wearing a thick yellow robe started screaming. The driver stopped the bus, slammed it in park, turned to look at Roby standing there, and yelled, Hey! The tone and the stare indicated to Roby that the driver thought he was the source of the problem. The driver, a heavy-set black man of about 50, rose and started down the aisle. When he saw Roby's gun, he stopped and put his hands in front of him. The same old woman screamed and clutched at her robe. What the hell do you want? exclaimed the driver to Roby. Roby looked down at the unconscious man. He was attacking the girl. I stopped him. He looked at the girl for support. She said nothing. Would you like to tell them? Roby prompted. She said nothing. He was trying to kill you. You nailed him with pepper spray. Roby reached over, and before she could stop him, he'd ripped the canister from her hand and held it up. Pepper spray he said in a confirming tone. The other passenger's attention now turned to the girl. She looked back at them, unfazed by their scrutiny. What's going on? asked the driver. Roby said, The guy was attacking the girl. She pepper sprayed him and I finished him off when he didn't back down. And why do you have a gun? asked the driver. I've got a permit for it. In the distance, Roby heard sirens. Was it for the two bodies back at the building? The man on the floor groaned and started to stir. Roby put a foot on his back. Stay down, he ordered. He looked back at the driver. You better call the cops. He turned to the girl. You have a problem with that? In response, the girl rose, grabbed her backpack from the overhead bay, slipped it over her shoulders, and walked down the aisle toward the driver. The driver put up his hands again. You can't leave, miss. She drew something from her jacket and held it in front of the man. From where he was standing behind the girl, Roby was blocked from seeing what it was. The driver immediately retreated, looking terrified. The old woman screamed again. Roby knelt down and used the fallen man's belt to efficiently tie his hands and ankles together behind his back, completely immobilizing him. Then he followed the girl down the aisle. As he passed the driver, he said, Call the cops. Who are you? The driver called after Roby. Roby didn't answer, because he could hardly tell the man the truth. The girl had worked the lever to open the bus door and stepped off. Roby caught up to her as she reached the street. What did you show him? He asked. She turned and held up the grenade. Roby didn't blink. It's plastic. Well, he didn't seem to know that. Those were the first words she had spoken. Her voice was lower than Roby would have expected, more grown up. They moved away from the bus. Who are you? asked Roby. She kept walking. The sirens drew closer and then started to fade away. Why did that guy want to kill you? She picked up her pace, moving ahead of him. They reached the other side of the street. She slipped between two parked cars. Roby did the same. She hustled down the street. He picked up his pace and grabbed her arm. Hey, I'm talking to you. He didn't get an answer. The explosion, 
knock them both off their feet. Chapter 16 Roby came to first. He had no idea how long he'd been out, but it couldn't have been very long. There were no cops, no first responders. It was just him and a bus that was no longer there. He gazed over at the skeleton of burning metal that had once been a large piece of transportation equipment and thought that, like a plane crashing nose-first into the earth from a great height, there could be no survivors. This area of D.C. was deserted at this late hour, and there were no residences nearby. The only people wandering out to see what had happened were obviously homeless. Roby watched as one old man, dressed in ragged jeans and a shirt, turned black by living on the street, stumbled out onto the sidewalk from his home of cardboard and plastic trash bags inside a doorway. He looked at the bonfire that had once been a bus with passengers inside and called out between rotted teeth, Damn! Anybody got something good to grill? Roby slowly rose. He was bruised and sore, and would be even more bruised and sore tomorrow. He looked around for the girl and found her ten feet from where he had landed. She lay next to a parked Saturn whose side windows had been blown out by the blast. Roby raced to her and gingerly turned her over. He felt for a pulse, found it, and breathed a sigh of relief. He checked her over. No blood. A few scratches on her face from where her skin had collided with the rough pavement. She would live. A few moments later, she opened her eyes. Roby eyed the grenade that she still clutched in her hand. Did you leave a real one of those on the bus? She sat up slowly, looked toward the demolished bus. Roby expected the sight to evoke some reaction from her, but she said nothing. Somebody really wants you dead, he said. Any idea why? She got to her feet, spotted the knapsack lying a few feet away and retrieved it, dusting off the outside and putting the strap over her shoulder. She looked up at Roby, who towered over her. Where's your gun? This caught him off guard. He didn't know where his gun had gone. He looked around, then squatted down and looked under a few cars parked on the street. There was a storm drain. It might have fallen in there when he'd gotten blasted off his feet. I'd find it if I were you. He looked at her. She was watching him from a few feet away. Why? Because you're probably going to need it. Why? He asked again. Because you've been seen with me. He rose. He could hear more sirens. Someone had finally called it in, because they were getting louder. The responders were heading this way. The homeless guy was now dancing around the bonfire, yelling about wanting some damn s'mores. Roby said, And why is that significant? She glanced at the destroyed bus. What? Are you stupid? He gave up the search for his gun and came over to her. Roby said, You need to go to the police. They can protect you. Yeah, right. You don't think they can? If I were you, I'd get out of here. Roby said, There's no one left alive on that bus to tell the cops what happened. What do you think happened? Over 30 people just lost their lives on that bus, including a guy who was trying to kill you. That's your theory? Where's your proof? The proof is in that bus. Some of it. The rest is in your head, presumably. Again, your theory. She turned and started to walk off. Ruby watched her for a few moments. You can't do this alone, you know. You've already screwed up or got ratted out. She turned back. What do you mean? For the first time, she sounded interested in what he had to say. They already followed you to the bus, or they were waiting for you. If the latter, you were set up. They had advance intel. Knew the bus, the time, everything. So either you screwed up and let them follow you, somehow, or else someone you trusted turned on you. It's either one or it's the other. She looked over his shoulder at the burning mass of metal and flesh. He asked, How did you spot the guy on the bus? Looked to me like he had a clean kill angle. Reflection in my window. 
Tinted glass, overhead light inside, dark outside equals a mirror. Simple science. You were reading a book. I was pretending to read a book. I saw the guy sit down behind me. He passed by three empty rows. Made me think, you know. Plus, I saw him get on. He was doing his best not to let me see him. So you would have recognized him? Maybe. I was behind you, too. Too far behind to do you any good. So you spotted me, too. She shrugged. You just get used to checking stuff out. So he followed you to the bus. Did he chase you? I see the dirt on your hands and knees. Looks like you took a tumble before you got to the bus. She looked down at her knees but didn't answer him. Roby said, but you still can't do this alone. Yeah, you already said that. So what do you suggest? If you won't go to the police, you can come with me. She took a step back. You? Where? Somewhere safer than here. She eyed him coolly. Why don't you stay and talk to the cops? He stared at her and listened to the sirens drawing uncomfortably close. Did it have something to do with that gun and your being on that bus at this hour? She eyed him more closely. You don't look the type, you know. Meaning? You don't look like you have to ride in a crappy bus in the middle of the night to get to New York. And neither did the guy who was sitting behind me. That was his other mistake. You have to dress for the part. You want to go it alone? Go. I'm sure you'll be able to hold them off for a few more hours. But then it'll all be over for you. She looked once more over his shoulder at the burning mass. I didn't want anybody else to die. Anybody else? Who else has died? Roby had the feeling that she wanted to dissolve into tears, but she said, Who are you? Someone who stumbled onto something and doesn't want to leave it. I don't trust you or anyone else. I don't blame you. I wouldn't either. Where do you want to go? Some place safe, like I said. I'm not sure there is such a place. She said in a voice that for the first time sounded like a kid's, scared. Me either, said Roby. Chapter 17 Roby didn't just have an escape plan in case something went wrong on one of his missions. He had a safe house, too. Now, with someone else in tow, he had opted for Plan C. Unfortunately, Plan C was already getting complicated. Roby's gaze swept the end of the alley. He'd slipped his goggles back on. It was only a glimpse, but he clung to it, because he knew it was important. Reflected light off a gun scope. He removed the goggles, slipped back into shadows, looked down at the girl. What's your name? Why? Just something to call you. It doesn't have to be your real one, he added. She hesitated. Uh, Julie? Okay, Julie, you can call me Will. Is that your real name? Is Julie your real name? She fell silent, looked past him out into the darkness. They had covered about ten blocks, so far, in fact, that the signs of the sirens had receded. She had not committed to go with him. They had silently agreed to leave the scene of the explosion by simply turning and walking away together. Roby could visualize the activity surrounding the bus. The first responders would be trying to determine what had caused the explosion, faulty gas tank or terrorist attack. But then he concentrated on that glimpse. There's someone out there, he told Julie in a low voice. Where? Roby pointed over his shoulder even as his gaze was running over her. Any chance you have a tracking device on you? Because I'm good at getting away. And that was pretty fast to catch up to us. Maybe they're better than you. Let's hope not. Tracking device? How about your cell? I didn't notice one in your pocket. But do you have one? And is your GPS chip enabled? I don't have a cell phone. Don't all kids have cell phones? I guess not. And I'm not a kid. How old are you? How old are you? Forty. That's really old. Trust me, I'm feeling it. How old? Can I lie? Like with my name? Sure, but if you say you're over twenty, I probably won't believe you. Fourteen. Okay. He looked the way they had come. Something in his gut very clearly told him 
not to go back that way. What did you see that made you think there's someone there? Reflection. Just like yours in the bus window. It could be anybody. Reflection of light off a rifle scope. It's a pretty unique signature. Oh. Roby studied the walls on either side of them, then he looked up. You afraid of heights? No. She said quickly, perhaps a little too quickly. He hustled to a construction dumpster, parked in the alley, and searched through it. He finally pulled out several lengths of rope and quickly knotted them together. There was a length of plywood in the dumpster, too. He positioned it so that it rested on top of the dumpster's edges, giving them a platform on which to stand. Strap your backpack down tight around you. Why? Just do it. She yanked the straps tight and looked at him expectantly. What are we doing? Climbing. Roby lifted her and placed her on top of the plywood and hoisted himself on top of it. What now? Like I said, we climb. She stared up the brick face of the building. Can you really do this? We'll find out. He motioned to her. Come on. You need to stand on my shoulders. He pointed up. We're aiming for that. It was a fire escape ladder that in its up and locked position ended well above street level. I don't think I can reach it. We can try. Keep your legs rigid. He lifted her up and onto his shoulders, and then, grabbing her ankles, military pressed her higher. Even with her arms stretched out fully, she was still about a foot short of the goal. He set her back down. Roby took the rope he'd gotten from the dumpster and tossed it up and over the bottom rung of the ladder. He took one end, fashioned a knotted loop, and pulled the other end through it. He gripped the rope and quickly climbed up the ladder, then freed the rope and passed one end back down to her. I'm not great at rope climbing. I flunked P.E. You don't have to be. Tie the rope around your backpack straps. Make sure the knot is tight. She did this. Roby added, Now, cross your arms and hold them tight against your body. That'll keep the backpack from slipping. She did so, and he started pulling her up. As soon as she reached him, Roby knew they were in trouble. Running feet were never a good sound. Climb, now, he said, the urgency clear in his voice, as high as you can. She struggled up the fire escape ladder while Roby turned back and focused on what was coming. Chapter 18 The man turned into the alleyway, stopped, cleared the lane by sight and moved forward. Ten yards in, he stopped again, looked left, right, and then ahead. He kept moving, his rifle swinging in precise, controlled arcs. He did this two more times. He was good, but not good enough because he hadn't yet looked up. When he finally did, it was just in time to see the bottom of Roby's feet rushing at him. Roby's size 12s smashed into the man's face and drove the rest of the attached body violently to the asphalt. Roby landed on top of the man, rolled, and came up in an attack posture. He kicked the rifle away and looked down. He didn't know if the man was dead, but he was certainly unconscious. He took a few seconds to search him. No ID, no phone, no surprise, but no official credentials either, no gold badge. He did find an electronic device with a blinking blue light in the man's pocket. He crushed it underfoot and threw it into the dumpster. He felt near the man's ankle and pulled out the thirty-eight caliber Smith & Wesson throwaway. He slipped it into his jacket pocket, turned, and leapt on top of the plywood. He grabbed the rope, made his way up, snagged the rung of the ladder, freed and pocketed the rope, and climbed. Julie was already near the top of the building when he reached her. Is he dead? She asked, looking downward. She had obviously been watching. I didn't check. Let's go. Where? We're at the top. He pointed upward to the roof. It was about ten feet farther up. How? The stairs don't go that far. They stop at the top floor. Wait here. He found a handhold on a windowsill, then another in a crack of the brick. He climbed. A minute later, he stood on the roof. He lay on his stomach, 
uncoiled the rope, and fed it down to her. Tie it to your backpack straps, like before. Lock your arms together again and close your eyes. Don't drop me, she said, her voice panicky. I've already lifted you once. You weigh nothing. A minute later, she was beside him on the roof. Roby led her across the flat, gravel terrain, reached the opposite side, and looked down and then around. There was another fire escape on this side. He used the rope to lower Julie down, then slipped over the side, hung from the building for a few seconds, and let himself drop. He hit the metal of the fire escape, grabbed her hand, and they started down. Won't we have the same problem if someone is out there? We would if we were going all the way down. They reached the third floor of the building, and Roby stopped and peered in. He used the knife he carried in an ankle holder to defeat the simple locking mechanism. He lifted the window. What if someone lives here? Then we'll politely leave. The apartment was empty. They slipped through quietly and ran down the hall to the interior stairwell. A minute later, they hustled down the street in the opposite direction from where they had come. Roby finally pulled up and said, They were tracking you. You must have a bug on you somewhere. How do you know that? Piece of equipment I found on the guy. I busted it up. But we have to cut off the source. Open your bag. She did, and Roby quickly went through it. There were some clean clothes, toiletry bag, a camera, some textbooks, an iPod Touch, a small laptop, notebooks, and pens. He popped the back off the iPod and examined the laptop, but didn't find anything that shouldn't have been there. The pens were clean, too. Roby looked through the toiletries methodically, but found nothing. He closed the bag up and handed it back to her. Nothing. Maybe you've got a bug on you. That's not possible. Are you sure? He started to say yes, but then stopped. He pulled out the pinhole camera he'd thrown into his pocket. He popped the cover, and underneath was the second blinking blue light he'd seen tonight. See? It was you. I was right. He tossed it and the earwig and power pack in a garbage can. Yeah, you were, he conceded. They did not see a single cab. In fact, a cab was not on his wish list right now. He didn't want a third party whom someone could interrogate to find out where his safe house was. Roby broke into and then artfully sparked the ignition of an ancient pickup truck parked in front of a gas station. He got in the driver's seat. Julie did not follow. He looked at her across the width of the front seat. You decide to go it alone? He asked. She didn't answer. She fiddled with the straps on her backpack. He reached in his pocket, pulled out something, and handed it to her. It was the pepper spray. You might need this, then. She took it, but then climbed in the truck, shutting the door firmly. He put the truck in gear and drove off slowly. Squealing tires in the middle of the night could attract attention he did not want or need right now. Why the change in heart? he asked. Bad guys don't give weapons back? She paused. And you saved my life back there? Twice? Fair enough. So people are after me. Who's after you? Unlike you, I know who they are. But I don't have to tell you, and I won't. It would not be good for your future. I'm not sure I have much of that anyway. She settled back in her seat and grew silent, staring ahead. You thinking about somebody? Asked Roby quietly. She blinked back tears. No. And don't ask me again, Will. Okay. Roby now drove fast. As shockingly bad as tonight had been, he had a strong feeling... It was only going to get worse. Chapter 19 Roby made one stop at an all-night convenience store to get some groceries. A half hour after that, the truck lights flickered across the face of the small farmhouse. Roby pulled the truck to a stop and looked across at Julie. Her eyes were closed. She appeared to be sleeping. But after seeing her defend herself against the attacker on the bus, Roby was taking nothing for granted.
He didn't want to get blasted with pepper spray, so he didn't reach out to Jostler. He simply said quietly, We're here. Her eyes instantly opened. She didn't yawn, stretch, or rub her face as most people would have. She was just awake. Roby was impressed, because that was exactly how he woke up, too. What is this place? She asked, looking around. They had driven down a gravel road. Woods starting to turn color bracketed the gravel. The drive ended at the front of the white clappered house. Painted black front door, two front windows, a small porch. In the back, a barn rose high above the apex of the house. Safe, he said, or as safe as possible under the circumstances. She stared at the barn. Was this like a farm or something? Or something, long time ago. Woods have reclaimed the fields. This was Roby's fail-safe. His employer provided other safe houses for Roby and people like him. But this place was his alone. Ownership under a shell company. No way to trace back to him. Where are we? Southwest of D.C., in Virginia. Technical term would be the boonies. Do you own it? Roby put the truck back in drive and headed for the barn. He stopped, got out, unlocked the barn doors, and drove the truck inside. He got out again, grabbed the sack of groceries, and said, Come on. Julie followed him to the house. There was an alarm system. The beeping sound stopped when Roby put in the code. He was careful not to let her see the numbers he punched in. He closed and locked the door. She looked around, still clutching her backpack. Where do I go? He pointed up the straight set of stairs on one side of the small entrance hall. Spare bedroom, second door on the right, bathroom across the hall. You hungry? I'd rather sleep. Okay. He lifted his gaze to the stairs in a prompting manner. Good night, said Roby. Good night. And make sure you don't shoot yourself with the pepper spray. It really stings the skin. She looked down at her hand where the small canister was hidden. How did you know? I saw you had it pointed at me the whole drive over. Don't blame you. Get some sleep. She set off. He watched her trudge up the stairs. He heard the bedroom door open and close, and then the lock engage. Smart girl, he thought. Roby went into the kitchen, put the groceries away, and sat down at the round table across from the sink. He set the thirty-eight throwaway on the table and took out his cell phone. No GPS chip was in there, company policy, because a chip could work both ways. But he had screwed up on the pinhole, and they must have suspected he wouldn't fire on the woman tonight. They had the tracker on him in case he gave them the slip. A setup from the get-go. Nice. Now he needed to figure out why. He clicked some buttons on his phone and looked at the photos he'd taken at the dead woman's apartment. Her driver's license stated that her name was Jane Wind, age 35. Her unsmiling photo looked back at Roby. He knew she would be lying on the D.C. medical examiner's metal exam table shortly, her face not just unsmiling but badly disfigured by the rifle round. Her child would be autopsied, too. Having taken the brunt of the round's kinetic energy, the boy would no longer really have a face. Roby looked at the photos of her passport pages. He enlarged the screen so he could make out the ports of entry. There were several European countries on there, including Germany. Those were usual. But then Roby saw Iraq, Afghanistan, and Kuwait. Those were not so usual. He next looked at her government ID card. Office of the Inspector General, U.S. Department of Defense. Roby stared at the screen. I'm screwed, he thought. I'm totally screwed. He used his phone to access the Internet and scrolled through news sites looking for any information on Wynn's death or the bus exploding. There was nothing on Wynn. They might not have found her yet. But the bus blowing up had already attracted attention. 
However, there were few details. Roby obviously knew more than any of the reporters out there trying to find out what had happened. According to the news accounts thus far, the authorities were not ruling out a mechanical cause for the explosion. And that's where it might remain, thought Roby, unless they could find evidence to the contrary. Blowing up an old bus in the middle of the night and killing a few dozen people didn't seem like it would be high on a jihadist bucket list. His handler had not tried to contact him again. Roby was not surprised by this. They wouldn't have expected him to answer in any event. He was safe here for now. Tomorrow? Who knew? He glanced in the direction of the stairs. He was on the run, and he was not alone. Alone, he might have a chance. But now? Now he had Julie. She was fourteen, maybe. She didn't trust him or anyone else, and she was running from something, too. His mind and body tired, Roby could think of nothing else to do right now. So he did what made sense. He went upstairs to the bedroom across the hall from hers, locked the door behind him, laid the thirty-eight on his chest, and closed his eyes. Sleep was important right now. He wasn't sure when he would get another chance to do it. Chapter 20 The window opened, and the tied-together sheets snaked down the side of the house. Julie looped the other end around the footboard of the bed and tugged on it to make sure it was secure. She slipped through the window, clambered quietly down the improvised rope, touched the ground, and darted off into the darkness. She didn't know exactly where she was, but she had been following the truck's route while pretending to be asleep. She figured she could get to the main road, and then follow that to a store or gas station where she could make a call to a cab company to come and pick her up. She checked her stash of cash and her credit card. She was good to go. The darkness didn't frighten her. Sometimes the city during the day was far scarier. But she crept along silently. Because as good as Will had seemed, she knew someone could still have followed them. She mapped out her plan in her head and decided that it was as good as she was going to come up with under the circumstances. She knew her parents were dead. She wanted to lie down on the ground, curl up, and never stop crying. She would never see her mother again. She would never hear her father's laugh. Then their killer had come after her. And then he'd been blown up in that bus. But she couldn't curl up and cry. She had to keep moving. The last thing her parents would have wanted was for her to die, too. She was going to survive, for them. And she was going to find out why someone had killed them, even if the killer was now dead. She needed to know the truth. The road was not much farther. She picked up her pace. She had no time to react. It just happened. The voice said, You know, I was going to make breakfast for you. She gasped, turned, and gazed at Roby, who was sitting on a tree stump staring at her. He got up. Was it something I said? She glanced back at the house. She was far enough away that all she could make out was a sense of powered light through the tangle of trees and brush. I changed my mind. I'm heading on. Where? That's my business. You sure about this? Completely sure. Okay. You need any money? No. Want another canister of pepper spray? You have some? He pulled one out of his pocket and tossed it to her. Julie caught it. Roby said, That one is actually more potent than the one you have. It has a paralytic built in. It'll lay down an assailant for at least thirty minutes. She put it in her backpack. Thanks. He pointed to his left. There's a shortcut through there to the road. Just stick to the path, get to the road, turn left. There's a gas station half a mile up. They have a payphone, maybe the last one in America. He turned to go back to the house. So that's it? You just let me walk? He turned back. Like you said, it's not my business. It's your decision. 
And frankly, I've got my own problems. Good luck. He started off again. Julie did not move. What were you going to make for breakfast? He stopped but didn't look at her. Eggs, bacon, grits, toast and coffee. But I have tea, too. They say coffee stunts a kid's growth. But then, like you said, you're not a kid. Scrambled eggs? Any way you like. But I do an exceptional over hard. I can leave in the morning? Yes, you can. That's my plan. Okay. Nothing personal. Nothing personal, he replied. They walked back to the house, Julie trailing three feet behind Roby. I was pretty quiet getting out of the house. How did you know? I do this for a living. Do what? Survive. Me too, thought Julie. Chapter 21 Three hours later, Roby lifted his head off the pillow. He showered, dressed, and headed to the stairs. He heard gentle snores coming from the guest bedroom. He thought about knocking, but decided to just let her sleep. He glided down the steps and into the kitchen. He kept the alarm on. He would not turn it off until he left the safe house. In addition to the house alarm, he had perimeter alerts spread around the property. One of those had been triggered by Julie's escape. It had been easy for him to take a shortcut through the woods and intercept her. Part of him was glad she had decided to come back. Part of him wasn't looking forward to the added responsibility. But more of him was glad that she had returned. Was it guilt over letting a little kid die right in front of me? Am I making amends this way, by saving Julie from whatever and whoever is after her? A while later he heard a door open, and feet padding across the hall. Later the toilet flushed and the water in the sink started running. It kept going for a while. She was probably doing a sink bath to clean up. When she came downstairs twenty minutes later, the meal prep was far advanced. Coffee or tea? he asked. Coffee, black. She answered. It's over there, help yourself. Cups in the cabinet by the fridge, top shelf. He checked the grits and then opened the carton of eggs. Over hard, lighter scramble or hard boiled. Who does hard boiled eggs anymore? Me. Scrambled. He swished the eggs in a bowl and glanced up at the small TV sitting on top of the fridge. He said, Check it out. Julie pushed her damp hair back over her ears and glanced up as she sipped her coffee. She had changed clothes. It was still partially dark outside, but in the light of the kitchen, she looked younger and scrawnier than she had last night. At least she wasn't holding the pepper spray anymore. Both hands were cupped around her coffee mug. Her face was scrubbed clean, but Roby could see her red, swollen eyes. She'd been crying. You have any cigarettes? She asked, glancing away from his scrutiny. You're too young. Too young for what? To die? I get the irony, but I don't have any cigarettes. Did you used to smoke? Yes, why? It just seemed the type. What type is that? The do things my way type. The sound on the TV was turned down low, but the scene on the screen that came on was self-explanatory. The still-smoking bus burned to a shell of metal. All flammable objects had pretty much disappeared. Seats, tires, bodies. Both Roby and Julie stared at it. The bus had had a full tank of gas, Roby knew, for the trip up to New York. It had burned like an inferno. No, it was an inferno. There would be thirty-plus blackened corpses in that ride. Or at least parts of them. Their crematorium. The medical examiner would have his hands full with this one. Can you turn up the sound? Roby grabbed the remote and inched up the volume. The TV newscaster, a grim-looking man, stared into the camera and said, The bus had just departed for New York City. The explosion happened at approximately 1.30 last night. There are no survivors. The FBI is not ruling out a terrorist attack, though it doesn't seem clear at this point why the bus would have been targeted. How do you think it happened? 
Roby glanced at her. Let's eat first. The next fifteen minutes were spent chewing, swallowing, and drinking. Good eggs, Julie proclaimed. She pushed her plate back, refilled her coffee cup, and sat back down. She stared at his nearly empty plate and then up at him. Can we talk about it now? Roby crisscrossed his knife and fork over his plate and sat back. Guy who was after you might have set it off. What, like a suicide bomber? Maybe. Wouldn't you have seen a bomb on him? Probably. Most bomb packs are pretty prominent. Dynamite sticks lined together, wiring, batteries, switches, and the detonator. But I tied him up, so it would have been impossible for him to set anything off. So it couldn't have been him? Not necessarily. You wouldn't need a lot of juice to blow up a bus. Could have been concealed on him. Some C4 or Semtex and the full tank of gas will take care of the rest. Some explosive vapor in the tank, plus a steady supply of fuel for the fire. And it could have been set off remotely. In fact, if that's what happened, a remote had to be used, since the guy was tied up. About half the suicide bombers in the Middle East never pull the trigger themselves. They're just sent out with the bombs, and their handlers detonate from a safe distance away. I guess the handlers have the easy job, then. Roby thought back to his own handler, a safe distance away calling the shots. Literally. I wouldn't disagree with that. So if the guy wasn't the source of the explosion... Then something else hit that bus. Like what? Incendiary round into the gas tank is one possibility. Ignites the vapor and boom. Then the gas-fed fire does the rest. Did you hear a shot? I didn't. No, but it could have been so close to the explosion that we might not have. And why would they blow up the bus? How do you think the guy found you on the bus? He came on fast and last. She said, adopting an analytical tone as she gazed at him. Roby appreciated that tone. He used it often. So he either just got the assignment at the last minute and was playing catch-up, or more likely, they lost you but then reacquired you. He paused. Which do you think it is? No idea. I'm sure you have some idea, even a guess. How about the guy in the alley with the rifle? He was after me. Yeah, that I know. You had the tracking device. But why was he after you? Not something I can talk about like I said before. Then that's my answer, too. So what now? Uh, I can drive you to the gas station. You can call for a cab, get another bus to New York, or maybe the train. Train tickets have names on them? Yours would just say Julie. And yours would just say Will. But that's not exactly enough, is it? No. They sat staring at each other. Where are your parents? Who says I have any? Everybody has parents. It's sort of a requirement. I meant parents that were living. So yours are dead? She looked away, fiddled with the handle of her mug. This arrangement is probably not going to work out. Do we go to the police? Will that work for your situation? I meant for you. No, it really wouldn't. If you tell me what's going on, I can maybe help you. You've already helped me, and I appreciate that but I'm not sure what else you can do, realistically. Why were you going to New York? Because it isn't here. Why were you going? It was convenient. Well, it's not convenient for me. So you had to go. Why? Need to know, and you don't. What, are you a junior spy or something? He glanced at the TV when he caught it out of the corner of his eye. Two sheeted bodies on gurneys were being wheeled out of a condo building. One body was big, one body very small. Another reporter was out front, talking to a spokeswoman from the D.C. Metro Police. The spokeswoman said, The victims, a mother and her young son, have been identified, but we're withholding their names until next of kin are notified. We have several leads that we are pursuing. We're asking for anyone who saw anything to contact us with that information. And it's been reported that the FBI is heading up the investigation? Asked the reporter. The deceased woman was a federal employee. The Bureau's involvement is standard operating procedure in those situations. No, it really isn't, thought Roby. He kept staring at the screen, hungry for more information. 
It seemed like a year ago since he had escaped from the building, which was now surrounded by police and federal cops. And there was another child? Asked the reporter as she held the mic up to the spokeswoman's face. Yes, he was unharmed. Was the child found in the same apartment? That's all we can say right now, thank you. Roby turned back to find Julie staring at him. Her eyes were like acid, eating through any defense or facade he could muster. Was that you? He said nothing. Mother and kid, huh? And what, you help me to make up for that? You want anything else to eat? No. What I want is to leave. I can drive you. No, I'd prefer to walk. She went up to her room and was back down a minute later with her backpack. As he turned off the alarm and opened the front door for her, he said, I didn't kill those people. I don't believe you, but thanks for not killing me. I've got enough shit to deal with as it is. He watched her hurry down the gravel drive. Roby went to get his coat. Chapter 22 Roby put on a helmet, slid the leather cover off the Honda street bike, fired it up, and drove it out of the barn. He parked the bike, closed and locked the barn, and then boarded the 600cc silver and blue motorcycle once more. He reached the road in time to see Julie climb into the front seat of a big-as-a-boat ancient Mercury, driven by an old woman whose head was barely level with the top of the steering wheel. Roby let off on the gas and fell in behind the Merc, about fifty yards back. He was not surprised when the big car turned into the gas station he had told Julie about. He raced past, cut down a side road, and doubled back. He stopped the bike and killed the engine. He watched through a gap in a hedge by the road as Julie got out and went over to the payphone. She hit three keys. Probably 411, he deduced. She put in some coins and dialed another number. Cab company. She talked, hung up, went inside the station, got the restroom key, and walked around the corner. She'd have to wait for the cab, and so would Roby. His phone rang. He glanced at the screen and drew a quick breath. The number on the ID was known as a blue call. It came right from the top of his agency. Roby had never gotten one of those before, but he had memorized the number. He would have to answer it, but that didn't mean he had to be particularly cooperative. He clicked the phone key and said, You can't trace this call, you know that. We need to meet, the man said. It wasn't his handler. Roby knew it wouldn't be. Blue calls did not come from handlers in the field. I had a meeting last night. I don't think I can survive another. There will be no repercussions for you. Roby said nothing. He let his silence convey the absurdity of this statement. Your handler was wrong. Good to know. I still didn't complete the assignment. The intel was also wrong. Roby said nothing. He had an idea where this might be going and wasn't sure he wanted to go there. The intel was wrong, said the man again. What happened was unfortunate. Unfortunate? The woman was supposed to die. She was also an American citizen. Now it was the other man's turn to say nothing. IG's office, said Roby. I was told she was part of a terrorist cell. What you were told is irrelevant. Your job is to execute the order. Even if it's wrong? If it's wrong, it's not your job to deal with it. It's mine. And who the hell are you? You know, this is a blue call. It's above your handler. Well above. Let's leave it at that until we can meet. Roby watched as Julie came back around from the restroom and went inside to return the key. Why was she targeted? Listen, Roby, the decision on you can be changed. Is that what you want? I doubt it matters what I want. Actually, it does. We don't want to lose you. We consider you a valuable asset. Thanks. Where's my handler? Reassign. You mean he's dead, too? We don't play those games, Roby. You know that. I apparently don't know a damn thing. Things are what they are. Keep telling yourself that. You might start believing it. 
We're in damage control, Roby. We need to work together on this. I'm not feeling real good about working with you guys ever again. But you need to move beyond that. In fact, it's imperative that you do. Let's move on this. Did you send someone to kill me last night? Guy with a rifle in an alley? Has my shoe prints on his face? Might still be lying unconscious, in fact, in an alley. He's not one of ours, I can promise you that. Give me the exact location and we'll check it out. Roby didn't believe him, but it didn't really matter. He told the guy where it had happened and left it at that. What do you want from me? More missions? I'm not in the mood. Next, you might have me taking out a Boy Scout. There's an investigation going on in connection with the death of Jane Wynn. Yeah, I guess there is. FBI is heading it up. I guess they are. We want you to act as an agency interface with the Bureau. As many scenarios as Roby had thought through, that had not been one of them. You can't be serious. Silence. I'm not going anywhere near this. We need you to be the liaison. And we need you to play it the way we want you to. That is essential. Why would we need a liaison to this case in the first place? Because Jane Wind was working for us. Chapter 23 The meeting place and time was arranged, and Roby slowly put away his phone. He looked through the gap in the hedge as the cab rolled into the gas station parking lot. Julie came out of the station with a pack of cigarettes and a bottle of juice. She has ID showing she's 18, he thought. She climbed into the cab, and it immediately drove off. Roby set off and took up a tracking position roughly fifty yards back in traffic. He was not concerned about losing her. He had slipped a digestible biotransmitter into her scrambled eggs. It would be good for twenty-four hours, and then it would wash out of her system. His tracking monitor was strapped to his wrist. He looked down at it and fell back even more. No sense letting her know she had a tail, if he didn't have to risk it. She had already proven that she possessed better-than-average observation skills. She might be young, but she was not to be underestimated. The cab turned onto Interstate 66 and headed east toward D.C. Traffic was heavy at this hour. The morning commute into D.C. from the west was routinely abysmal. You rode in with the sun in your eyes and you rode out the same way in the evening, along with thousands of other pissed-off commuters. Being on the Honda allowed Roby to be more nimble than in a car, and he was able to keep within sight of the cab. It rode 66 in, crossed the Roosevelt Bridge, and hung a right at the fork, which took it over to Independence Avenue. They quickly moved from the touristy monument area of D.C., to less beautiful parts of the capital. The cab stopped at an intersection where a number of old duplexes were located. She got out, but must have told the cab to wait. She walked down the street, and the cab followed slowly. She stopped at one duplex, took out her small camera, and clicked some pictures of it. She took pictures of the surrounding area, and climbed back in the cab, and it sped off. Roby made a note of the address of the duplex and took up his tail once more. About ten minutes later, Roby realized where she was headed, and part of him couldn't believe it. The other part of him could understand it, though. She was heading back to the location of the bus explosion. The cab had to let her out a couple of blocks from her destination because roads were closed off by police barricades. Roby looked around and saw cops and feds everywhere. This blast had taken everyone by surprise. Roby could imagine lots of tums were being dropped into federal mouths all over town. He parked his bike, slipped off his helmet, and took up his pursuit on foot. She was a full block ahead of him. She never once looked back. That made him suspicious, but he kept on. She turned and he turned. She turned again, and so did he. They were now on the same street where the bus had ceased to be. One block over the street was closed to pedestrians as well. 
The police didn't want people traipsing through their evidence beds. Roby could see what was left of the bus, even though the police were in the process of erecting large metal frames with curtains on them to shield this site from the public. Roby looked at the spot where he had landed after the blast occurred. He still had no idea where his gun was. That was troubling. He looked up higher at the corners of buildings. Were there surveillance cameras posted here? Perhaps on some of the traffic lights. He looked for ATM machines, which had cameras built in. There was a bank across the street. It would not have recorded him and Julie getting off the bus because it was positioned on the wrong side of the street for that. Right now, no one knew that they were the sole survivors of the explosion. He spied a woman in her late thirties wearing an FBI windbreaker and FBI ball cap, dark hair, pretty face. She was about five, six and slender with the narrow hips and the fanned shoulders of an athlete. She had one inch bureau work shoes on black pants and latex gloves. Her badge and gun rode on her belt. Roby saw both special agents and uniformed cops talking to her. He noted their air of deference when addressing her. She might be the special agent in charge of this thing. He pulled back into the shadow of a doorway and continued watching, first the FBI agent and then Julie. Finally, Julie turned and walked down the street away from the bus's remains. Roby waited a few moments and then followed. Chapter 24 Julie walked to a cut-rate hotel that was wedged between two vacant buildings. She went inside. Roby pulled up on his bike and watched through a hotel window. She was checking in using a credit card. He wondered whose name was on it. If hers, it could send a marker through the system that would inform whoever was after her right where she was. A minute later, she stepped onto the elevator. Roby broke off surveillance at that point, but he was not done with her yet. He went in the hotel and up to the front desk. The man behind it was old and looked like he would rather be pouring road asphalt in August than holding down this job. Roby said, my daughter just checked in. I dropped her off for an internship on the hill. I wanted her to use her American Express card because the card I gave her was corrupted, but I think she forgot. I tried calling her, but I guess she turned her phone off. The old gent looked put out. She just arrived. Why don't you go ask her yourself? What room is she in? The old fellow smiled. I can't give out that information. It's private. Roby looked suitably irritated, like any father would. Look, can you just tell me out here, the last thing I need is for some cyber creep to screw up my credit by my kid using the wrong card. The man looked at the records in front of him. It's a lot of effort for me to do that. Roby sighed heavily and pulled out his wallet. He slipped out a twenty. Will this help to ease your effort? No, but two of them sure would. Roby pulled out a second twenty, and the man snatched them. Okay, credit card was a visa. Name on the account was Gerald Dixon. I know that. I am Gerald Dixon. Now I've got two visa cards. Can I see the numbers? You can for another twenty. After exhibiting deep exasperation, Roby complied. He looked at the card and memorized the numbers. Gerald Dixon was now his. Great, said Roby. That's the corrupted card. Already ran it through, sport. Nothing I can do, the man added gleefully. Roby said, thanks for nothing. He turned and left. He would find out who Gerald Dixon was, but he had to assume that Julie was safe for the moment. Now he had to get going. He rode back to his apartment he checked out the front and back of his building before going inside. He took the stairwell instead of the elevator. He passed no one. At this hour of the day, everyone was at work. He opened the door to his apartment and poked his head inside. It was all as he had left it. It took him five minutes to make sure the place was empty. He employed little traps, a piece of paper wedged into a door track, 
a thread that would be broken when a drawer was open, to alert him if someone had broken into and searched his place. None of them were tripped. He changed into slacks, sport coat, and white collared shirt, and opened a wall safe that was behind a shelving unit holding his TV. His cred pack was in there. He hadn't used it in a long time. He slipped it inside his suit jacket and set off. The meeting was in a public place at Roby's insistence. The Hay Adams Hotel was located across the street from Lafayette Park, which in turn was across Pennsylvania Avenue from the White House. The most protected ground on earth. Roby figured even his agency would have a hard time killing him here and getting away with it. The Jefferson Room, an expansive eating area a short stack of steps up from the hotel lobby, was the actual site of the meeting. Roby got there early to see who might have arrived ahead of him. Then he waited. One minute before the allotted time, a man in his sixties walked in. Modestly priced suit, red tie, polished off-the-rack shoes, the bearing and gravitas of a lifelong public servant who had accumulated far more power than wealth. Two tall young men were with him. Muscle. Chest bumps reveal the weapons. Earwigs and wires reveal the communications. They followed him into the Jefferson room but did not sit with him. They took up positions on the perimeter, their gazes sweeping for threats. They did not let the man sit in the line of any window. One of the men took out a slender device and set it on the piano that was parked in one corner of the restaurant. He turned it on. It emitted a humming sound. White noise with a scrambler. Roby knew because he had employed one in his work. If there are electronic surveillance devices in here, the recording will come out undecipherable. It was only then that Roby stepped out. He allowed himself to be seen, but did not approach until the older man saw him and nodded, which confirmed to his guards that Roby was the one he was meeting with. The room was empty, even though it was lunchtime. Roby knew this was not a coincidence. The waitstaff was not in evidence. The restaurant had, in effect, been shut down. Roby would have to eat lunch afterwards if he was hungry. He doubted food was part of the agenda. Roby sat catty-corner to the man, his back also to a wall. Glad you could make it, said the man. You have a name? Blue man will do. Creds blue, just for confirmation. The man reached into his pocket and let Roby see the badge, the picture, and the position stated on the ID card, but not the name. This fellow was high up in the agency, far higher than Roby thought he would be. Okay, let's talk. Jane Wind? You said she was one of ours. I checked her ID. She's DCIS, Defense Criminal Investigative Service. Did you also see her passport? Middle East trips, Germany. But DCIS has offices in all those places. That's why it made perfect cover. So she was a lawyer? Yes, but she was more than that. What exactly did she do for you? You know, you're not read in. Then why ask me here? I said you weren't read in. I'm officially reading you in now. Okay. But first, I need to know exactly what happened last night. Roby told him. He figured at this point keeping anything back was a stupid idea. However, he said nothing about Julie or the bus disintegrating. In his mind, that was a separate matter entirely. Blue Man sat back and took all this information in. He didn't break the silence, and neither did Roby. He figured Blue Man had more to tell him than Roby had left to convey. Agent Wynn worked in the field for years. She was a good agent, as I said. After she had her children, she was reassigned to the IG's office at DOD but she still worked closely with DCIS and all of its investigation sectors. And, of course, she continued to work for us. How did that get her assigned to a hit list she wasn't supposed to be on? asked Roby. And how can something like this happen anyway? I know we're clandestine, but we're also part of an organization with checks and balances. Rogue traders lose billions of dollars of institutional money all the time. 
and those organizations are bigger and better funded than we are. And still it happens. If one person, or more likely a small group of people, are determined enough, they can accomplish the impossible. I saw her go into the building last night. She had no kids with her. Apparently they were with a sitter she's used before that lives in the building. This sitter took them to the apartment when Agent Wynn returned home. Okay. What did Wynn stumble on that got her killed? Blue Man looked curious. How do you know she stumbled onto anything? She lived in a crappy apartment with two little kids. There were legal docs on her table in the living room. You can't bring home classified stuff and leave it around. So her work wasn't classified. According to her passport, her last trip out of the States was two years ago. She wasn't a field agent, at least not any longer, according to you. Her youngest child wasn't even a year old. She probably was pulled from the field because of that. But she was back working on something, probably considered routine. She found something. That's why she was targeted. I doubt it was directly related to her work. Blue Man took this in, his head nodding approvingly. You analyze well, Roby, I'm impressed. And I'm full of questions. Do you know what she had stumbled onto? No, we don't. But like you, we don't think it was tied to her official duties. Why do you want me to act as the liaison with the Bureau? That's a big risk, particularly if they find out what I've been doing the last dozen years. Which they won't. Like you said, one person or a group, if determined enough, can accomplish the impossible. Give me your theory. Someone found out what she had discovered and they ratted her. We have a mole on our side, as evidenced by the actions of my handler and others, and the hit was carried out. They weren't sure I would pull the trigger so they had a backup. He had no compunction about blowing the kid and his mother away. And you said my handler had been reassigned. That was a lie. I don't need lies from you. How do you figure it was a lie? He ordered me to kill Wind. You said that wasn't authorized. So the guy's a traitor. You don't reassign traitors. If you had him in custody, you wouldn't need me telling you what happened and theorize why. That means the handler has disappeared, along with whoever else he was working with. How many are we talking? Blue Man sighed. We think at least three other people in the chain. But there might be more. Roby just stared at him. Blue Man looked down, fiddled with a silver-plated spoon on the immaculate white linen tablecloth. It's not good, certainly. Understatement of the year. What exactly do you want me to do? We have to keep tabs on the investigation without seeming to. So officially you will be a special agent with DCIS, but you will actually be reporting to me. We'll provide you with all the cover and creds you need. They're being placed at your apartment as we speak. Ruby's face darkened. You say you've got at least four traitors. What if you actually have more? And what if one of them is at my apartment right now? These agents were pulled from an entirely separate division. They've had no contact with your handler. Their loyalty is above question. Right. Forgive me if I think that's bullshit. At some point you have to trust, Roby. No, I don't. And everyone is okay with me joining the hunt? DCIS is on board. Would you like to talk to the National Security Advisor? Or the Deputy Director of CIA? Right now, it wouldn't matter to me what they said. But why me? Because you didn't pull the trigger, ironically enough. We trust you to do the right thing, Roby. There aren't many I can say that about right now. Roby had thought of another possible reason why they wanted him involved. I was there, which means I'll make the perfect fall guy if this all goes to hell. But he said, All right. His reasoning was straightforward. He would prefer to work the case himself and bring some sort of resolution and sense of justice to it, rather than wait for someone else to do it, and maybe screw it and him be on repair. If I go down, he thought, I go down by my own hand. Blue Man rose and put out his hand. Thank you. And good luck. Roby didn't shake his hand. It's almost never about luck. We both know that. 
He turned and walked out of the Hay Adams, back into a world that seemed a little more unfamiliar and daunting than when he had walked in. Chapter 25 Everything was waiting for Roby when he got back to his apartment. That was not entirely comforting. None of my traps were tripped, he thought. He looked over the file, the creds, and his background information. He had come up to speed on this case as fast as possible. But fast-tracking something like this meant that mistakes could be made. And probably will be. Then it became a case of how fast his support from Blue Man would fade away. Faster than the party and financial support of a candidate with plummeting poll numbers, he thought. It was just how the town worked. The name Will Roby stared back at him from the creds. Ironically, his real name was the safest one to use for this sort of assignment. Roby picked up the badge and ID card pack and put it in his jacket. Also waiting for him was a fresh Glock G20 and a shoulder holster. He was glad to rid himself of the thirty-eight throwaway. He strapped it on and buttoned his jacket. As he headed out, Roby looked down the hall and watched as she unlocked her door. Annie Lambert turned to him. She was in a black business suit and sneakers with white ankle socks. Hello, Will. Don't usually see you here in the middle of the day. I forgot something. Lunchtime was the first chance I've had to come and get it. What are you all dressed up for? Just a meeting. How did your chill session go? What? Oh, it went fine. The inquiries into Lambert, triggered by her contact with Roby, had turned up nothing. Not surprising. To work at the White House, one had to be squeaky clean. He said, Sorry I left so abruptly. I was just tired. No problem. I was too, actually. She hesitated and said in a subdued voice, but maybe we can have that drink sometime. Yeah, maybe we can, said Roby, who was thinking of all that lay ahead of him. Okay, she said uncertainly. He started to walk off and then stopped, realizing that he'd once more been abrupt with her. He turned to her. I appreciate the offer, Annie. I really do. And I want to have a drink with you. She brightened. That'd be great. And let's do it soon. Real soon. Why, are you going somewhere? No, but I've wanted to start getting out more, and I'd like to do that with you. Her smile widened. Okay, Will, you know where I live. He walked off and wondered why he was suddenly so taken with the young woman. She was lovely and obviously smart, and maybe she was smitten with him. But in the past, that had not mattered to Roby. He turned and looked back at her apartment. She had gone inside but he had the image of her standing there in the tennis shoes and the business suit. He smiled. Roby drove his Audi to the crime scene. With his creds, he was able to park within the security perimeter. On the way, he had looked at his tracking device as he passed the hotel where Julie was staying. She was still there. He walked to the apartment building's entrance, feeling enormously uncomfortable. He was going to help investigate a murder at which he was an eyewitness. There was a pack of cops and suits huddled in the lobby of the building. Roby made his way to them, thinking he would check in and introduce himself to the people running the case. The huddle started breaking up as he approached. Out from its middle stepped the same female FBI special agent he had seen at the bus bombing. She came forward, looking at him inquisitively. He pulled his cred pack, flashed first the badge and then ID card. She reciprocated with her cred pack. It said she was FBI Special Agent Nicole Vance. Agent Roby, welcome to the show. I've got some questions for you. I look forward to working on this case with you, Agent Vance. I got a call from my supervisor about you. We're to associate you with the case, but purely for background information on the deceased and any other information that will help us solve the case, but the FBI has the lead, meaning I have the lead. I didn't mean to imply otherwise. Vance seemed to study him more closely. Okay, just so long as we understand the ground rules. What would you like my help on? Any background you can give us on the victim? Roby pulled a flash drive from his jacket pocket. 
Her official background file is contained on here. She took the drive and handed it to one of her associates. Get it read and summarized ASAP. She turned back to Roby. We were just about to go over the crime scene again. Care to join us? I'd appreciate that. My superiors want to know I'm earning my pay. This comment earned him a smile. I guess Fed agencies all operate similarly. I guess they do. As they headed to the elevator, Vance said, Did you hear about the bus explosion? I saw it on the news, said Roby. I understand FBI is investigating that, too. More specifically, I am. A lot on your plate. Might be a good reason to merge the investigations. Why is that? We found a gun at the scene of the bus explosion. Roby kept his gaze straight ahead, even as his heartbeat quickened. Gun? Yeah, and we've already run ballistics. The Glock we found matches a slug we took from the floor of the apartment the deceased lived in. So in my mind, the two cases are definitely connected. Now we just have to find out how. The killer might have just thrown the gun away during his escape. Might just be a coincidence it was found near the bus explosion. I don't believe in coincidences. At least not ones like that. As they stepped off the elevator and headed to the condo where two people had been murdered right in front of him, Roby, despite the cool air, wicked a drop of sweat off his forehead. He would take a hundred megalomaniacal Saudi princes and bloodthirsty cartel chieftains over this. Chapter 26 the apartment had changed since Roby had last been there. The cops were doing a thorough forensic search, and fingerprint powder residue, evidence markers, and 35 mil cameras flashing off were evident throughout the small space. Roby eyed a sealed evidence box on the particle board table. Is that Agent Wynn's work papers? Laptop? Vance nodded. It is. We've sealed it pending your agency's review. I'm cleared all the way on things like that, but I didn't want to step on your toes. Appreciate that. But we will need to be read in. If there's something in those docs and files that got her killed, the Bureau needs to know it. Understood. I can have the review done today, and you can be read in directly after. Vance's smile was guarded. I never met a more cooperative agency liaison. You're going to spoil me. I'll do my best, Roby said. Until I stop being cooperative, he thought. There were pick marks on the front door lock. They were subtle, so the person knew what he was doing. Follow me. They walked into the bedroom. Roby looked around. The bodies had been removed, but in his mind, he still saw them on the bed, their heads pulverized. Wind and her son Jacob were found on the bed. She was holding him. One shot killed them both. She pointed to the shattered window. We've run a trajectory. Shot came from that high-rise building, well over 300 meters away. We're pinpointing the exact room. The building is abandoned, so it's doubtful anyone saw anything. But we're still following up. If we're lucky, the shooter left something behind. You won't be that lucky, thought Roby. But you said you found a Glock round in the floor. How does that tie into a shot at that distance? It wasn't a pistol round that killed them. Had to be a rifle round. I know. That's what's so puzzling. If I have to speculate, there were two people involved. The person in this room last night fired a shot into the bed. It went through and lodged in the floor. That slug matched the gun we found underneath a car next to the bus explosion. But the kill shot came through the window, hit Jacob, passed through his head, and impacted his mother. Death was instantaneous for both. Or so the M.E. said. Roby remembered the look on Jane Wynn's face and wondered how truly instantaneous her death had been. So two shooters doesn't make a lot of sense. It makes no sense. But that's because we don't have enough facts. We collect enough of those, it will make sense. I appreciate your optimism. Roby stood in front of the bed, in nearly the exact spot from which he'd fired his weapon the night before. So the shooter who presumably broke into the apartment fired into the bed. Where was the slug found? Vance motioned for one of her texts to move aside the bed. Roby saw the evidence marker next to a hole in the wooden floor. Roby held up an imaginary pistol. He aimed and clicked his finger while Vance watched. He would have been standing about here, said Roby. 
who of course knew this for a fact. The mattress and box springs seem really thin. I doubt they would have diverted the flight path of the round much, not at this close range. That's what I figured, too. No other wounds on the bodies? The round fired into the mattress didn't hit them? Negative. No human residue on it and no other wounds on the victims. So he fired a shot into the mattress. Why? To get their attention? Maybe. Were they awake when they were shot? Look to be. The position where they fell on the bed leads me to believe they were awake when they were killed. So he fires, but doesn't hit them. He did it to get their attention, or maybe to get them to be quiet. Anyone report hearing any screams? Vance sighed. If you can believe it, the only person who lives on this floor and was here last night is an old woman who's both deaf and blind. She, of course, heard nothing. The only other floor resident was working in Maryland at the time. The apartments above and below this one are vacant. No, I believe it, thought Roby. But the round from outside killed them, he said. He went over to the broken window and examined it. He looked outside, beyond to the building he could not see last night. The alleyway was down below. The one he was supposed to use to make his escape. There were other buildings separating the two high-rise structures, but they were all one story. The shooter would have had a clean shot. Okay, gunman inside, shooter outside. Gunman fires into the bed, shooter outside kills Agent Wind and her son. He turned back to Vance. Wind had two sons. That's the other really puzzling piece. Her other son is less than a year old. His name is Tyler, by the way. He was found by a woman on the third floor. Found? How? It's crazy, Roby. Someone knocked on her door shortly after the winds were killed, at least according to the preliminary time of death the M.E. gave us. The woman opened the door, and there was Tyler in his car carrier, sound asleep. She recognized him as Wynn's son and tried phoning her, then went to her apartment. No one answered, so she called the cops. That's when the bodies were discovered. You have a theory for that? She shook her head. I know this sounds unbelievable, but it might be that whoever broke into Wynn's apartment took the kid down there. Why? Why kill an infant? He can't testify against you. They had no problem killing the other son. Been thinking about that. Look at the hole in the window, and then look at the bed. If Wind had grabbed up her other son, maybe to protect him against the intruder, he might have been on the left side, in other words, facing the window. Roby finished this thought for her. Shooter fires, really only aiming to hit Wind, but the shot hits the kid first and then her. Maybe he intended to kill them both, or at least wanted to kill Wind, and if the kid was in the way, too bad. That's how I see it. So that sets up an interesting possibility. Such as? How's this for a theory? Intruder comes in, just a standard burglary. He doesn't mean to, but somehow awakens Wind and her son. He fires a shot into the bed to keep them quiet. At the same time, unbeknownst to him or Wind, of course, a shooter is targeting her from that other building at the exact same time. He fires, killing her and her son. The intruder is stunned. He could have ducked down, thinking he might be shot next. He sees the other kid in the carrier, grabs it up, and during his escape drops him off at another apartment. Then he gets away. I thought you didn't believe in coincidences, said Roby. She smiled weakly. I know. It's like the mother of all coincidences, isn't it? It's also exactly what happened thought Roby. Chapter 27 They were in the other building, from where the kill shot had come. It was abandoned, filthy, full of junk, easy to get into and out of. In other words, it was perfect. Roby and Vance had looked through several rooms that could have served as the shooter's sanctuary. When they entered the fifth one, Roby said, This is it. Vance froze, and hands on hips looked at him. Why? Roby walked over to one of the windows. Window is open a notch. None of the others were. The sight line is dead on. He pointed at the window sill. And the dust has been disturbed. Check the pattern. Muzzle mark. He pointed at a dark stain the size of a dime farther along on the sill. Residue from the discharge. He looked down at the concrete floor. Knee imprints in the dirt. He used the sill as his center of support. 
lined up his shot, and took it. He knelt down, slipped out his gun, took aim through the window, lining up his iron sights with the window with the hole in it across the way. There's a rack of lights on that taller building on the opposite side of the street where Wynne lived. At night, those lights would be on. A shooter would be looking right at them, and that would screw his shot into the fourth floor over there. Except not from this spot. The angle is perfect. He rose, put his gun away. This is it. Vance looked impressed. You have special forces in your background? If I did, I couldn't tell you. Come on, I know lots of former Delts and Seals. I'm sure you do. She looked out the window. I also know some people at DCIS. I texted them about you. None of them have heard of you. I just came back into the country, said Roby, transitioning into his cover story. If you really want to check me out, call DCIS. I can give you my direct superior's contact info. Okay, and I will. So my burglar theory and separate shooter theory look sound. I can't see how the guy in the apartment last night could have known about the shooter over here. You're right, I didn't, thought Roby. But now the question becomes, why kill Wind? What was she working on for your people? I'll need to know that. I'll check with my folks, but it could be something she stumbled onto. Stumbled onto? How does that make sense? Not saying it does, only saying it has to be considered. Just because she worked for DCIS doesn't mean that was the reason she was killed. Okay, but forgive me if I take as my working hypothesis that her death was related to her work. That's your prerogative. Has her ex been notified? In the process. Her son is with social services for now. What's her former husband do? You don't know? Now without looking at the file, no. I was just assigned to this case, Agent Vance. Cut me a little slack. Okay, sorry. Rick Wind. He's retired military, but he has another job. We're in the process of tracking him down now. In the process of tracking him down? He'd have to have seen the news. He should have called you by now. Believe me, Roby. I thought of that. You have his home address? Maryland. My agents have already been there. It's empty. You said he has a job. Where does he work? He owns a pawn shop in Northeast D.C., Bladensburg Road, a place called the Premium Pawn Shop. Not the greatest part of town, but then you don't usually find pawn shops next to the Ritz, do you? Premium Pawn Shop? Catchy.
Anybody tried to reach him there? No one's there either, all locked up. So where is the guy? If I knew that, I would have told you. If he's not at home and he's not at work and he hasn't called the police, then there are only a few possibilities. He either doesn't watch TV, listen to the radio, or have any friends. Or he killed his soon-to-be ex-wife and kid and is on the run. Or else he's dead, too. That's right. But you really think the guy killed his ex and kid using a sniper rifle? Domestic issues like that are usually face-to-face. -face. Well, he was former military, and they were getting divorced. So it was not amicable? I don't know. I'm making inquiries. Maybe you can help on that score. She's with your agency, after all. He ignored this. Jane Wind have any family in the area that you know of? She looked at him quizzically. Are you sure you two are from the same agency? It's a big agency. Not that big. FBI dwarfs it. FBI dwarfs pretty much everybody. So, family in the area? None. Neither apparently does a hubby. At least, that we can find. But I've been working this case for less than eight hours. Have you searched his home and the pawn shop? Home, yes. Nothing that helped us. Pawn shop, next. You care to tag along? Absolutely. Chapter 28 The view cars pulled up in front of the premium pawn shop, and Roby and Vance stepped from one, while two other FBI agents climbed out of their vehicle. There were bars across the front door and windows of the pawn shop. The door had three serious locks. The businesses next to it were gutted, with blackened plywood nailed against their fronts. Trash littered the streets, and Roby spotted a couple of druggies stumbling along. Vance sent the other two agents to check the rear of the building while she and Roby approached the front. She shaded her eyes and peered inside. Can't see anything. Can you knock down the door, or do you need a warrant? Rick Wynn's house was less problematic. We suspected he might be hurt. This place is obviously closed. He could be inside, hurt or dead, said Roby, joining her at the front of the pawn shop and peering between the bars into the darkened interior. That should be enough. And if we find evidence he committed the crime, and his defense lawyer gets it thrown out because our search was determined to be unlawful under the Fourth Amendment? I guess that's why you FBI agents get the big bucks. And the big career derailment. How about I kick open the door and search the place? Still have the same evidentiary problem? Yeah, but it'll be my career that's derailed, not yours. I'm here with you. I'll tell them I did it all on my own, against your express instructions. He examined the door and the framing around it. Steel on steel, tough stuff. But there's always a way. What kind of fed are you? She asked, her eyebrows hiked. Not the career-kissing type, obviously. Stay here. Roby, you can't just... He drew his pistol, fired three times, and the trio of locks fell out onto the sidewalk. Holy shit! exclaimed Vance as she jumped back. They heard running feet, as the other two agents were no doubt coming to find out what had happened. An alarm will probably go off, said Roby calmly. You might want to call the cops and tell them not to bother. Before she could say anything, he opened the door and stepped inside. No alarm went off. Roby did not take that as a positive sign. He kept his gun out, felt for the light switch, hit it, and the pawn shop was quickly draped in weak light. Roby had been in pawn shops before, and this looked pretty typical. Watches, lamps, rings, and an assortment of other items were stacked neatly in bins or inside glass cabinets. All had tags with numbers written on them. The man's military background, thought Roby. You never lost that precision. Or at least most didn't. But the floorboard smelled of urine and the ceiling was blackened with decades of grime. Roby didn't know what the place had been before it was a pawn shop, but it had not worn well. There was a cash register cage. Roby noted the bulletproof glass. There were scratches on the glass, and what looked to be too dense from gunshots. Upset customers or people looking to rip the guy off. Ex-military Rick Wind probably dealt with that with his own hardware. Roby figured there were at least two guns in that cage somewhere. 
He looked toward the ceiling corners and saw the camera, mounted in one. It had a direct shot of the cage. That might come in handy. Roby moved forward, doing visual sweeps. He heard nothing except the sounds of life outside. A breeze pushed through the open door, rustling lampshades and lifting tags on the merchandise. When he heard footsteps behind him, he turned to see Vance there, gun out, her expression seriously pissed off. You're an idiot. I told you to stay outside, he whispered back. You don't tell me to do anything. Not unless you want your ass. Roby put a finger to his lips. He'd heard it before her. A squeak, and then another. He pointed to the back of the shop. She nodded, her angry expression gone. Roby led the way, turning down one aisle, and rode it back to a pair of swinging doors with a gap between. The doors were moving slightly, but that was not the source of the squeak. He looked at Vance, pointed to himself and then the door, and then motioned to the right. She nodded in understanding and took up position on his right flank. Roby lifted one foot, kicked one of the swinging doors open and bulled inside, his gun making arcs and ready to fire as he stepped to the left. Vance followed on the right and cleared that part of the room. Nothing. She looked down and grimaced as the gray critter skittered into a darkened corner. Rats. Roby looked down and saw the animal's tail before it whisked out of sight. I don't think rats squeak like that. Then what? That. He pointed to one darkened corner of the room on the left side. Vance looked that way and caught a breath. The man was hanging upside down from the exposed rafter. They approached. His body was swinging slightly, and the rope was squeaking against the wooden beam. Roby looked at the slit between the pair of swing doors. Acted like a funnel with the front door open, with the wind outside. Got the body to move a bit. Vance looked at the dead man. He was black, and green, and purple. Is that Rick Wynn? Who the hell can tell? He's been dead a while. Didn't kill himself. Hands are bound, not strangulation. He touched the man's arm. And he didn't kill his wife and kid. Condition of the body means he was dead before they were. Rigor's long since passed. Roby bent over and looked at the man's open mouth. And there's something else. What? It seems they cut out his tongue. Chapter 29 Roby had left Agent Vance to deal with the new body in the pawn shop. They had confirmed that it was Rick Wind. The cause of death was not obvious and would probably require a medical examiner to figure out. They had checked the surveillance camera in the pawn shop. Someone had taken the DVD. Roby was now sitting in his apartment typing on his computer. He was not working the murders of Jane Wind and her ex-husband. He had his mind on something else, at least for now. He typed in the name Gerald Dixon. He got too many hits because it was too common a name. He switched tactics, going from Google to a more exclusive database to which he had access. The hits that came back were more manageable. He refined his search, utilizing other databases. It finally narrowed to one name. Roby looked at the street address. It did not match the one that Julie had gone to in the cab. But one line on the man's record caught his attention. Foster care provider. The guy and his wife took in foster kids. He wrote down the address and then checked his tracking device. Its range was long enough for it to reach here. Julie had not moved from the crummy hotel. That seemed unusual unless she was afraid of being spotted. In any event, she apparently was no longer interested in leaving town. He wondered what had changed her mind. Was it the house where she had stopped? Roby was going to find out, but he had somewhere else to go first. Gerald Dixon lived in a two-story duplex in a lousy neighborhood. When Roby knocked on the door, it took a long time to get a response, and he heard noises inside that bespoke of frenzied activity. When the guy finally opened the door, Roby noted the crimson patches on his cheeks, the bloodshot eyes, and the smell of breath freshener that shot like a cannonball from his mouth. 
The idiot's been slapping himself to get sober and sucking on Listerine to hide the booze smell. The foster care standards must be plummeting in this country. Yeah, the man said in an unfriendly tone. Gerald Dixon? Oh, Anstano. Roby flashed his badge. I'm with D.C. Internal Affairs. Dixon took a step back. He was an inch shorter than Roby, but unhealthily thin. Most of his hair was gone, though he couldn't have been much over forty. He had the pale, translucent skin and jerky manner of someone whose body and mind had been substance abused to the point of no return. Internal affairs? Ain't that for cops? It's for a lot of things, said Roby, including your situation. May I come in? Why? To talk about Julie. It was Roby's gut instinct that the girl had used her real first name. Dixon's face screwed up. If you find her, you tell her she better get her butt back here. If she ain't here, I don't get paid. So she's gone missing. That's right. Can I come in? Dixon looked put out but nodded, stepped back, and let Roby pass through. The inside of the house looked no better than the outside. They sat on tattered chairs. Baskets of dirty laundry were piled everywhere. But Roby had a notion that before he knocked on the door, all the clothes had been strewn on the floor. He also noted papers and the edge of a beer can sticking out from under a chair. He wondered what else was under there. His seat was very hard. He didn't think it was the cushion. A small, curvy woman wearing tight jeans and an even tighter blouse came out of the back, wiping her hands on her pants leg. She looked to be at most thirty. She had mousy brown hair, a heavily made-up face, and the air of someone who was totally disconnected from reality. She lit up a cigarette and eyed Roby. Who's he? Some dude from Internal Affairs, growled Dixon. Roby flipped open his badge. I'm here to talk about Julie. And smoking around our children is prohibited, he added. The woman quickly stubbed the cigarette out on a tabletop. Sorry she said without sounding sorry in the least. The woman snapped. She's gone, run off, little shit never appreciated what we gave her. And you are? asked Roby. Patty, Jerry and me are married. How many foster kids do you have currently? Two, not counting that shit Julie. I would prefer if you didn't refer to one of the children under our responsibility as a shit, Roby said firmly. Patty glanced at her husband. Is he with the foster care people? He told me internal affairs, said Gerald, looking betrayed. I'm with the government, said Roby. That's all you two need to know. So where are the other kids? Patty adopted a loving, matronly tone. In school, she said, smiling. We send those little angels to school every day, just like we're supposed to. Roby heard a sound from upstairs. You have kids of your own? he asked, glancing upward. Gerald and Patty exchanged a nervous glance. He said, We got two of our own, little ones. Don't go to school yet. That's them up there, probably reading. They're real advanced for their ages. Right. Now about Julie. He opened a notebook he drew from his jacket. Gerald Dixon's eyes widened as he saw the revealed weapon. You're carrying a gun. That's right, said Roby. I thought this was about foster care. This is about what I say it's about, and if you two want to stay out of serious trouble, I suggest you cooperate fully. Roby had decided he was done playing nice with these idiots. He didn't have the time or the desire. Gerald sat up straighter, and Patty sat down next to him. Roby said, tell me about Julie. Is she in trouble? asked Gerald. Tell me about her, repeated Roby firmly. Full name, background, how she came to be here, everything. Don't you already know that? Roby looked at her with a face of granite. I'm here to confirm the information we already have, Mrs. Dixon, and please keep in mind the request I made for cooperation and then focus on the possible consequences of not cooperating. Gerald sharply elbowed his wife and snapped, Just shut up. Let me handle this. He turned back to Roby. Her name is Julie Getty. She came here, oh, about three weeks ago. Age? Fourteen. 
Why was she placed in foster care? Her parents couldn't take care of her. Yeah, that I get. Why couldn't they take care of her? Were they dead? No, I don't think so. See, the agency people don't really tell you that much about that stuff. They just give you kids and you take care of them. Patty added quickly, Just like they were our own. Right. Like you said. Not counting that shit, Julie. Patty colored and looked down. Well, I didn't mean it exactly like that. Gerald added, Truth is, Julie could be a real piece of work. Speaks her mind too much for my taste. And so she's not here anymore? Run off in the middle of the night. We've been so worried. And you, of course, reported this, right? Gerald and Patty looked at each other. He said, well, we were hoping she'd come back. So we were waiting for a bit. Has she run off before? Not this time. Well, except for last night. Roby looked up from his notes. This time? Was she placed with you before? Three times. What happened those times? Don't know exactly, said Gerald. I think her parents got her back. Remember the caseworker telling me Julie's mom and dad would do that. But then there she'd be, back in foster care. When was the last time you saw her? Last night, right after I served her a delicious dinner, said Patty in a syrupy tone that made Roby want to pull his gun and fire a shot just over her head. And when did you discover her missing? This morning, when she didn't come down. So you don't check on your beloved wards at night? She was very private, said Gerald hastily. We didn't like to butt in. Roby pulled the empty beer can out from under the chair. I can see that. He waved his hand in the air. And you might want to open some windows. Get the reefer smell out. We don't do drugs, said Gerald, feigning astonishment. And I don't know whose that is, added Patty, pointing at the beer can. Right, Roby said dismissively. Have you heard from Julie since she left? They both shook their heads. Any reason to believe someone would want to hurt her? The Dixons looked genuinely surprised by this question. Gerald said, Why, has something happened to her? Just answer the question. Anybody come around here you didn't know? Suspicious cars. Gerald said, No, nothing like that. What the hell has she got herself involved in, gangs? Patty put a hand up to her ample bosom. Do you think we might be in danger? Roby closed his notebook. I certainly wouldn't rule out the possibility. Some folks don't care who they hurt. He had to fight back a smile. He rose, lifted up the seat cushion, and pulled out a baggie of coke, some vials containing a brown liquid, two capped syringes, and elastic strips used to pop the blood vessel to the surface for ease of injection. And next time, try locating your pharmacy somewhere more private. They both stared down at the drugs and related paraphernalia, but said nothing. As Roby was walking down the street, he saw a woman holding an envelope striding along with two police officers in tow. You heading to the Dixons? He asked as the woman neared. Yes, who are you? Just someone who wants you to make sure they never get foster kids again. The woman waved the envelope. Well, your wish has just been granted. She steamed on with the officers right behind. Roby walked on. Something on his wrist beeped. He looked down at the tracker. Julie Getty was finally on the move. And Roby was pretty sure where. Chapter 30 Julie clambered up the vine and slipped inside her bedroom window. She squatted on the floor, listening. All she could hear were her own heartbeats. Her legs shaky, she moved down the stairs, holding onto the wall for support. She rounded the bend, closed her eyes, and then opened them. It was all she could do not to scream. Roby stared back at her. You get around, he said. 
She looked quickly around the room. There was nothing there except furniture. Expecting to find something else? He said, moving to water. She backed up a step. How did you get here? Followed you. That's impossible. Nothing's impossible, really. This is your home, right? She said nothing. Just stared up at him, more in curiosity than fear. He looked at a picture on a side table. Your mom and dad were nice looking. And there you are, right in the center. Happy times, it seems. You don't know anything. Correction. I know some things. Like you're in danger. People are looking for you. People who have a lot of money, muscle, and connections. How do you know that? Because they covered up two murders right here. Julie's eyes widened. How did you know that? Roby motioned to the wall next to where she stood. Fresh paint, but only in that spot. It was put there to cover something up. He pointed to the floor. Used to be square of carpet here. You can see where the wood is lighter. It's gone. Again, covering something up. How do you know it's about a murder? It could be anything. No, not anything. You paint walls and remove rugs to take away forensics, blood, tissue, other bodily fluids. And they missed a spot of blood on the baseboard over there. Did you expect to find their bodies here? They would have been a smell by now, you know, an unmistakable one. You spend a lot of time around dead bodies? Ever since I hooked up with you. We're not hooked up in any way at all. I know about your foster parents, though calling them parents stretches all credulity. I don't like that you've been snooping around my life. The city busted them. The other kids there have been taken away by now. I think you had something to do with that. Julie's angry look faded. They didn't deserve to be treated like that. No little kid does. Now tell me what happened here. Why? Like I said, I want to help you. Why? Call me a good Samaritan. There aren't any of those left. Not even your parents? You leave my parents out of this. Did you see how they died? Is that why you are on the run? Julie backed up until she was against the wall. For a moment, Roby thought she was going to run for it, and he wasn't sure what he would do if she did. Were they mixed up in something over their heads? Drugs? My mom and dad wouldn't hurt anyone, and no, this had nothing to do with drugs. So they were killed. Just a simple nod will do. She moved her head forward a notch. You saw that happen? Another nod. Then you need to go to the police. If I go to the police, they'll put me right back in foster care, and then those people will find me. The guy on the bus, he was the one? I think so. Julie, tell me exactly what happened. It's the only way I can help you. If last night showed you nothing else, it's that I'm someone who can get things done. What about those people on the TV? Did you kill them? A mom and her kid? You said you didn't do it, but I need to know the truth. Well, if I did kill them, there's no way in the world I would admit it. But if I did do it, why would I be here trying to help you? Give me a reason. She let out a long breath, played with the straps on her backpack. Do you swear you didn't kill them? I swear I didn't kill them. I'm working with the FBI right now to try and figure out who did. He pulled out his badge and showed it to her. Okay. I guess it's cool. I got away from the Dixons and came here last night. I hadn't been home very long when I heard someone come in. I thought it was my parents, but... Someone else was with them. He was yelling at them, asking them stuff. Roby drew a few steps closer. Asking them what? Try to be as precise as you can. Julie screwed up her face, thinking. He said, how much do you know? What have you been told? Stuff like that. And then, and then. He hurt one of them. Tears trickled down her face. I heard a gunshot. I ran down the stairs, and the guy looked at me. My dad was against the wall over there. He was all bloody. The guy pointed the gun at me, but my mom hit him, and he fell down. I didn't want to leave. I wanted to stay and help her, but she told me to run. Julie shut her eyes, but the tears eased out from under her eyelids. I went back to my bedroom and climbed out the window. 
Then I heard another shot, and I ran hard. I was a coward. I knew that shot meant my mom was dead. But I just ran. I was a shit. I just left her to die. She opened her eyes and stiffened when she saw Roby standing next to her. And if you hadn't run, you'd be dead. And that would have done no one any good. Your mom saved your life. She sacrificed her life for yours. So you did the right thing, because you did what your mom wanted you to do. Stay alive. Roby handed her a tissue from a box on the table, and she dried her tears and then blew her nose. So what now? Do you think anyone around here heard the shots? I doubt it. The place next door is empty. So is the duplex across the street. This used to be an okay neighborhood, but then everybody lost their jobs. Including your parents? They worked at whatever they could find. My mom went to college. She added proudly. My dad was a good guy. She looked down. He just sometimes got down on himself, felt like the whole world was against him. What were their names? Curtis and Sarah Getty. No relation to the Getty oil folks, I guess. If so, nobody ever told us. Okay, here's my plan. We find out who killed your parents and why. But if it was the guy on the bus, he's clearly dead. Did you leave from this house last night and go directly to the bus stop? Yes. Then the guy wasn't alone. He couldn't have policed this place, gotten rid of two bodies, and made it to the bus. There have to be others. But why my parents? I loved them, but it's not like they were important or anything. You sure they weren't involved in drug dealing or gangs or anything? Look, if they were drug kingpins, do you think they'd be living in this place? So no enemies? No. At least not that I know of. Where did they work? Dad at a warehouse in Southeast. Mom at a diner a few blocks from here. So your dad would go over there for meals, maybe? Yeah. I spent a lot of time at the diner, too. Why? Just digging for info. I want to leave here. Like, right now. This isn't my home anymore. Okay, where do you want to go? I got a place I'm staying. Yeah, I tracked you down there. And it was stupid to steal and use Dixon's credit card. They'll bust you for that. And more importantly, people can track you. How did you... She stopped and looked annoyed. I have cash. Save it for now. So where do I go? Not back to your safe house. It's too far out of town. No, I've got another place. Why don't you pack some things and come on? Chapter 31 Roby waited until well after dark. They spent the time in between getting something to eat at a mom-and-pop restaurant on 8th Street. Roby asked more questions of the young woman, gently probing. She pushed back. She would make a good cop, Roby thought. Her tendency to give away as little as possible was remarkable, particularly for a generation that routinely posted the most intimate details about themselves on Facebook. Roby drove Julie to his neighborhood in Rock Creek Park. Only he didn't take her to his building. He took her to the observation post across the street. Like the farmhouse, no one other than Roby knew about it. They walked in. He turned off the alarm system, and she looked around. This is your place? Sort of. Are you rich? No. You seem rich to me. Why? You have a car and two homes. That's pretty rich, especially these days. I guess it is. He actually had another home right across the street, but she didn't need to know that. He showed her how to use the alarm system and then let her look around. She picked out her bedroom from the two there. She dropped her backpack and a second bag she'd packed before leaving her house on the bed and continued to wander around the apartment. What's the telescope for? Stargazing. That's not an astronomical telescope, and there's not really an angle here to point it skyward. You know about telescopes? I do go to school, you know. I like to watch things, he said, especially to see if people are watching me. So, are we going to be, like, staying here together? She looked nervous by this prospect. No, I'm staying somewhere else, but it's close by. So you have three places? What do you do for a living? I think I want to do it, too. You should have everything you need. He took a cell phone out of his pocket. 
This is for you. It's got my number loaded on speed dial. It's untraceable, so feel free to use it any time. How far away will you be? I thought you were nervous that we were going to be staying here together. Look, I know you're not some creep who gets off on underage girls, okay? How do you know that? Because I've had to deal with those sorts of jerks before. I know what to look for. You don't have the signs. Did you learn that in foster care? She didn't answer him. And Roby thought about Gerald Dixon and wondered if he should have just shot the prick when he had the chance. You should have everything you need. I stocked up the kitchen last week. Anything else? Give me a call. What about school? This caught Roby off guard. Shows what a great parent I'd make. Where do you go to school? He asked. At a G&T program in Northeast D.C. G&T, that's a cocktail. Not gin and tonic, gifted and talented. You're 14, so you're in the ninth grade? Tenth. How so? I skipped a grade. Pretty smart, then. In some things, in other things I can be pretty stupid. Like what? I don't like highlighting my weaknesses. Considering what happened to your parents, I'm not sure I want you going back to school. Whoever killed them will know where you go, or it'll be easy enough to find out. I can use the cell phone to text my program coordinator and feed her some bullshit. You think you're smarter than all adults? No, but I'm smart enough to know how to lie and make it sound like the truth. She looked at him closely. I think you're probably really good at that, too. The foster care people will be looking for you. I know. Won't be the first time. They'll go to my parents' house. They'll think they skipped town and took me with them. Then they'll go to the school, find out I texted my coordinator, assume I'm okay, and that'll be a dead end. They've got too many kids in the pipeline, a lot worse off to spend any more time on me. Thinking several moves ahead, that's good. You play chess? I play life. I get that. So how close will you be? Pretty close. I'm not just going to sit in this place and do nothing. I'm going to help you find the people who got my parents killed. You can leave that to me. Screw that. If you don't let me help, I won't be here when you come back. Roby sat down in a chair and stared at her. Let's get something really straight. You're a smart kid, you know the streets. But the people who are after you are at a whole different level. They will kill anyone who gets in their way. Sounds like you know the type real well. When Roby said nothing, she said, The guy on the bus? The way you got us away from the dude in the alley? The way you analyzed the crime scene at my parents' house? The way you tracked me down? And you said you were working with the FBI. You're not just some guy in a cubicle working nine to five. You've got safe houses and guns and untraceable phones and telescopes pointed at who knows what. She paused and then added, You kill people too, I bet. Roby still said nothing. Julie looked out the window. My parents were all I had. I ran away when I could have stayed and helped them. Now they're dead. I know I'm young, but I can help you if you just give me a chance. Roby looked out the window, too. Okay, we'll do this together. But it'll be tricky. So what do I do first? You have a paper and pen in your bag? Yes, and I have the laptop my school gave me. How long ago did you see your parents? About a week. Okay, you write down everything you can remember about the last couple of weeks. I want you to try and recall anything you saw, heard, or suspected, anything your parents said, no matter if it seemed insignificant, and anyone else around who they knew or were talking to. Is this busy work or is it really important? Neither one of us has time to waste on busy work. This is stuff we need. Okay, I'll do it. I'll start tonight. He rose to go. Will? Yeah? I'll make a good partner. You'll see. I have no doubt, Julie. But his gut was ice. He much preferred to work alone. He didn't like having another life riding on him. Chapter 32 Roby, got time for a cup of coffee? It was Nicole Vance on the phone. Roby had answered the call on his way down the elevator after leaving Julie. He'd given the teenager a key to the apartment, but asked her not to leave it without checking with him first. And he had told her to set the alarm. Anything break on the case? 
he asked the FBI agent. There's a place open late near 1st and D Southeast called Donnelly's. I can be there in 10 minutes. Give me 10 more than that. Hope I'm not interrupting anything. I'll see you there. Roby grabbed his car from the street. The traffic across town was light at this hour. He parked on 1st and gazed up at the Capitol Dome in the background. 535 members of Congress plied their trade near here in various buildings named after long-dead politicians. They, in turn, were surrounded by an army of lobbyists flush with cash who worked relentlessly to convince the elected officials of the unassailable righteousness of their causes. Such was democracy. Donnelly's was busy for the lateness of the hour. Most of the patrons were drinking something stronger than coffee. When Roby hit the doorway, Vance caught his eye from the back of the main room. He sat across from her. Her clothes were off-duty ones because she'd been home. Slacks, flats, light blue sweater, corduroy jacket. Good choices for the chill in the air. Her hair was down around her shoulders. It had been tied back earlier. Long hair and crime scenes were sometimes problematic. She smelled of a fresh shower with a light dusting of perfume. She must have scrubbed hard, thought Roby. The stink of death could get right into your pores. Her cup of coffee was parked in front of her. With a wave of his hand, Roby got the waitress's attention and pointed at Vance's cup and then at himself. He waited until the woman came with a fresh cup and departed before he focused on Vance. So here I am. You're a hard man to find. You only call me once. No, I mean at DCIS. I called the number you gave me. They confirmed you worked there, but your file is classified. Nothing earth-shattering about that. Told you I was out of the country for a while. That stuff was classified. Now I'm back. He took a sip of coffee and set his cup back down. Please tell me that's not the only reason you asked for this meeting. It's not. I don't like to waste time, so here we go. She pulled a manila folder from the bag sitting next to her. She opened the file and took out some photos and pages. Background on Rick Wind. Roby Lee threw the photos and written materials. One picture was of Wind in death, hanging above the urine-smelling floor of his pawn shop. The other photos were of Wind in life, several of him in military uniform. Army, huh? Career enlisted. Went in at 18, did his full time, and then he was out. He was 43. Their kids were little. Did they start late? Jane and Rick Wind were married ten years. Lots of failed attempts at getting pregnant. Then they hit the jackpot twice in three years. Then they decide to end the marriage. Go figure. Maybe Rick Wind decided he didn't want to be a father. Not sure. They had joint custody of the kids. Where was he living? In Prince George's County, Maryland. You find a cause of death? Emmy's still working on that. No obvious wounds other than his tongue being cut out. She paused. Isn't that what the mob would do to snitches? Did Wind have ties to the mob? Not that we know of. And he wasn't working with any federal or local police investigations as an informant. But he runs a pawn shop in a bad part of town. Maybe he was laundering dirty money and got his fingers caught in the cookie jar. And they kill his wife and kid, too? Maybe as a warning against other future skimmers. Seems a bit much particularly since they must have known Jane Wind was a Fed and her murder would trigger FBI involvement. I mean, why bring yourself the extra grief? Thank you for your faith in the crime-busting prowess of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Time of death. About three days, the Emmy said. No one noticed him missing? His ex? Like I said, they had joint custody. It was her week. They apparently didn't communicate much. He worked the pawn shop alone. Maybe he didn't have many friends. Okay, but this all could have waited until tomorrow. The gun we found near the bombed-out bus was the same gun that fired that round into Jane Wynn's floorboard. I know, you already told me that. Roby picked up his cup and took another sip. Never should have fired the round, he thought. Never should have lost my weapon. And the kill round for Wind and her son? Different weapon entirely. Rifle round came through the window like we speculated. Again, all of this could have come over the phone. The rifle round was pretty special. How so? Looks to be military-grade ammo. Roby took another sip of coffee. 
Though his heart was beating a little faster, his hand did not shake even slightly. What was the specific round? Could they tell, or was it too deformed? It was jacketed. Came out in fine shape. She looked at her notes. It was a 175-grain Sierra Match King hollow point boat tail. That specific enough for you? Lots of that kind of ammo around. Yeah, but our gun expert said this was different. Special ball, long range, and slight residue of a modified extruded propellant. I'm not sure what all that means, quite frankly, but he speculated it was U.S. military. Sound right to you? Our guys use that ammo, but so do the Hungarians, the Israelis, the Japanese, and the Lebanese. You're just full of gun facts. I'm impressed. I'll give you some more. The U.S. military uses the M24 weapon system. Our target was over 300 meters from the shooter with a single pane of glass in between. And the weather conditions last night were fine with very little wind. The round you're talking about is also called the 7.62 MK316 MODO. The components of the 175 grain round of the Sierra projectile, Federal Cartridge Company match cartridge case, gold metal match primer, and the modified extruded propellant. That round leaves the barrel at over 2,600 foot-pounds per second. At 300 meters, the Sierra would have plenty of juice to clear a child's skull with enough kill power to end another life in close proximity. Roby had really been thinking out loud. But when he saw the look on Vance's face, he wished he had kept these technical observations to himself. You know a lot about sniper stuff? I'm with the DOD, but the Sierra Ordinance is also available to the public. Too bad we don't have the casing. Oh, but we do. The shooter didn't police his brass, or at least, if he did, he wasn't successful. Where was it? I didn't see it in the room the sniper was set up in, and I was looking for it. Crack in the baseboard. The casing was ejected, hit the concrete, probably bounced and rolled right into the crack. Completely invisible. The sniper was operating in the dark, no electricity in that building. Even if he tried to look for it before making his getaway, he wouldn't have spotted it. My guys only found it later when they were on their hands and knees with laser lights. Ruby licked his lips. Okay, let me ask you something. Maybe you know the answer, maybe you don't. Okay. Was the casing shiny or dull? I don't know. They found it after I had already left, but one phone call can answer that. Make the call. It's important? I wouldn't be asking otherwise. She made the call, asked the question, and received the answer. Dull, not shiny. In fact, my guy said a little discolored. Do you think it was old ammo? Roby finished his coffee. She tapped her fingernail impatiently against the tabletop. Don't keep me in suspense, Roby. I made the call, got the answer. Now tell me why it's significant. The military doesn't use seconds or rejects or old ammo. But manufacturers charge extra to buff up the casing to make it look shiny and pretty. The Army could give a crap about that. It has nothing to do with operational performance. A dull bullet flies as straight and true as a shiny one. And the Army buys millions of rounds. So it saves them a ton of money to go without the extra buffing. Now, the civilian rounds are typically shiny because those folks don't mind paying extra. So then we're definitely looking at military-grade ammo? And that makes things more complicated. Is that all you can say? What do you want me to say? If this is a U.S. military hit on a government employee, then this is not just complicated. This is a shitstorm. That's what I want you to say. Okay. This is a potential shitstorm. Satisfied? By the way, my boss was royally pissed that you shot your way into that pawn shop. He said he was going to be talking to DCIS. Good. Maybe they'll pull me from the case. Where the hell are you coming from, Roby? Do you even want to be an investigator? Are we done here? He started to get up. She looked up at him. I don't know. Are we? He left. She followed him outside. Vance put a hand on his shoulder. Actually, I'm not done with you. Ruby grabbed her arm, pulled hard, and they both fell behind some trash cans. An instant later, a barrage of bullets shattered the front window of Donnelly's. Chapter 33 
Roby rolled, lifted his gun from its holster, and aimed through a crevice between the toppled trash cans. His target was a black SUV with the rear side window down a crack. The muzzle of an MP5 submachine gun was visible there, and was currently spewing out a hail of bullets. Right before the shots had started, Roby had pushed Vance down and behind him. When she tried to rise up, he slammed her back down. Keep down or you lose your damn head! The bullets from the MP shredded the trees, outdoor tables and chairs and big umbrellas and pinged off the building's brick facade. People inside Donnelly's and out on the street screamed, ducked and ran for cover. Through all the chaos, Roby kept his calm and fired. His shots were dead on. He hit tire rubber to disable the vehicle, the front and rear passenger windows to knock out the shooter and the driver and the front side metal of the SUV to kill the engine. And nothing happened. The MP5 muzzle disappeared, the window slid up, and the SUV roared off. Roby was up in an instant, slapping in a fresh mag and chasing the SUV down the street, firing at its backside and hitting it squarely in the ass. He nailed the rear tires. Again, there was nothing. But then Roby saw the windows of a Honda parked at the curb explode and the branch of a tree fall down and he stopped firing. The SUV turned the corner and was gone. Roby looked at the Honda's shattered glass, the car's alarm going off. And then he gazed over at the tree branch that had been shot off, probably by his ricochet. He pulled out his car keys and was about to run to his Audi, which was parked two cars down from the Honda. But when he saw the shot-out tires on his car, he put the keys away. He heard running feet, turned toward them, knelt, and aimed. It's me! Screamed Vance, her gun out, but held in a surrender position. Roby stood, holstered his weapon, and walked to water. What the hell was that? Call it in. We need to get that SUV. I already did, but do you know how many black SUVs are around here? Did you get a plate number? They had it blacked out. Sirenson started up. They heard more running feet. Down the block, Capitol Hill police officers were rushing their way, guns drawn. Roby looked back at the restaurant. People were slowly getting to their feet, but not all of them. He saw dark liquid pooling on the street. Inside the restaurant, he heard screams and people sobbing. There were casualties. Many. Bad ones. How many? asked Roby. She looked where he was. I'm not sure. Two outside, a dead, three wounded, maybe more inside. There were a lot of people behind that window. I called for ambulances. Vance looked at the screeching Honda. Did you do that? Ricochet from my weapon. Ricochet? Off the SUV? Your rounds should have easily penetrated. I hit it a total of 17 times. Tires, windows, body. Ricochets, all of them. The Honda, the tree branch. I've probably got slugs all over the place here. But that means... Began a pale-faced Vance. Roby finished for her. That the SUV was armored and had run-flat tires. She looked at him. Those sorts of vehicles in D.C. aren't that plentiful outside certain circles. Mostly our own governments. So were they aiming to kill you, me, or both of us? Shooter had an MP5 set on full auto. That tends to be an indiscriminate weapon, designed to kill everything in the zone. She looked at his arm and flinched. Roby, you're shot. He looked down at the blood on his upper arm. It didn't go in, just a graze. You're still bleeding a lot. I'll call you an ambulance, too. His voice was hard and fast. Forget the ambulance, Vance. We need that SUV. I told you, I already called it in. I've got my guys and MPD looking for it. It must have some dings on it from your rounds. Maybe that'll help. Roby and Vance jogged back to the restaurant. Ignoring the obvious dead, he went from one wounded to the next, quickly triaging and stopping the bleeding with whatever was handy while Vance assisted. The Capitol Hill police joined his effort. When ambulances showed up and paramedics poured out, Roby left the wounded to them and walked across the street to check out his Audi. He saw the holes in the body. MP5 rounds. Not ricochets from his pistol. They'd had another shooter on this side. That was not good. That meant they knew his vehicle. 
Had they followed him here? If so, he turned and ran back to Vance, who was talking to two MPD officers. Roby interrupted. Vance, can I borrow your wheels? What? She said, looking at him. Your car. I need to go somewhere right now. It's important. She looked flustered while the cops eyed Roby with suspicion. Vance must have noticed this because she said, He's with me. She pulled out her keys. Parked around the corner. Silver BMW convertible. Obviously, my personal ride. Thanks. So be careful with it. I'm always careful. She dubiously eyed his shot-up Audi. Right. But how am I going to get home? I'll come back and get you. I shouldn't be long. I'll call you when I'm on my way. He started to run off. She called after him. And please get your arm looked at. She watched him for a few moments before one of the cops said, Um, Agent Vance? She glanced back, embarrassed, and continued filling them in. Chapter 34 Roby slid into the Beamer, started it, and peeled off. As he drove, he called the phone he had left Julie. She didn't answer. Shit. He punched it. Driving this fast in town, even at this late hour, was problematic. Traffic and lots of lights. And lots of cops. But then he had a thought. Vance seemed the highly efficient type. That meant... He looked over the dashboard. Then he saw the box under the steering column. It had been an add-on, obviously. I love you, Agent Vance, he thought. He hit the switch and blue grill lights were activated and a siren started blaring. He ran four red lights and shot across town so fast it would have made a kick-ass commercial for the German car company. Within minutes, he found himself tearing down the street where his apartment was located. A couple of times, he saw cops in cars glance suspiciously at the Beamer with police lights, but they let him go. He parked on a side street, jumped out, and zigzagged his way on foot to the building where he'd left Julie. He took the stairs two at a time. He raced down the hall. He'd texted her twice on the way over and had gotten no response. He eyed the door. No forced entry. He pulled his gun, slid the key in the door, and eased it open. The front room was dark. He did not hear the beep of the alarm. That was not good. He closed the door behind him. He moved into the room, his gun swiveling in a defensive arc. He didn't call out, because he didn't know who else might be in here. He heard a noise and moved quietly into the shadows. The footfalls were heading his way. He pointed his gun, ready to fire. The light came on. He stepped out. Julie screamed. Ah! What the hell? She gasped, holding her chest. Are you trying to give me a freaking heart attack? She was dressed in pajamas and her hair was wet. You were in the shower? Yeah. Am I the only person in the world who likes to be clean? I called and texted. Water and electronics don't mix, so I've heard. She picked up her phone off the coffee table. Do you want me to text you back now? I was worried. Okay, I'm sorry, but I couldn't exactly take the phone in the shower. Next time, at least take it to the bathroom. Why wasn't the alarm on? I went down to the lobby to get a newspaper. I was going to set it before I went to sleep. A newspaper? I didn't think your generation read old-fashioned newspapers. I like information. All right, but I want you to keep the alarm on all the time. Fine. But why were you so freaked about me? She stopped and glanced at his arm. You're bleeding. He rubbed the spot. I cut myself. Through your jacket? Forget about it. Did you notice anything suspicious tonight after I left? She noted the strain on his face and said, Tell me what happened, Will. I think I was followed, but I don't know from what point. If from here, it's not good for obvious reasons. I saw or heard nothing suspicious. If someone wanted to get me, they had their chance. Roby looked down and saw that he still had his gun out. He holstered it and looked around. Everything okay? You need anything? I'm great. I did my homework, ate a healthy dinner, brushed my teeth, and said my prayers. I'm good to go. She added sarcastically. She pulled a piece of paper from a pocket on her pajama top and handed it to him. What's this? The assignment you gave me, 
Anything weird in the last couple weeks? I also put down the addresses of the places where my mom and dad worked. Things I know about their past, friends they had, things they used to do. I thought it might be useful. Roby gazed down at the precise handwriting on the page and nodded. It will be useful. Who shot you? He instinctively glanced at his arm and then at her. I've seen people shot before. It's just sort of the world I grew up in. I don't know who did it, answered Roby. But I intend on finding out. Does this have to do with that woman and her kid getting killed? Probably, yeah. But then you strike me as the kind of guy who might have lots of enemies for lots of different reasons. Maybe I do. But you're still going to help me find out who killed my mom and dad, right? I said I would. Okay. Can I go to bed now? Yeah. You can stay if you want. It won't freak me out. I've got some things to do tonight. I understand. I'll set the alarm on my way out. Thanks. She took her phone, turned, and walked down the hallway. He heard the bedroom door lock behind her. He set the alarm, locked the door behind him, and left. Roby was pissed. He was getting played, that he knew. He just didn't know who was doing it. Chapter 35 Roby pulled to the curb and watched Vance finish up with the local cops and some of her people. Ambulances were everywhere, and people were being loaded into the back of the rescue vehicles that would take them to local hospitals to treat their injuries. They were the lucky ones. They were still alive. The dead stayed right where they had dropped as people investigated their murders. The only act of privacy and respect was to drape a white sheet over the body. Other than that, people who an hour before were alive and enjoying a beer were now nothing more than pieces in a criminal investigation puzzle. As Vance finished with the last cop, Roby honked the horn and she looked at him. She walked to the beamer and checked it over as he rolled down the passenger window. If there's even one ding on this car, your ass is mine, she declared. But her expression showed she wasn't being serious. You want me to drive, or you want to take the wheel? She answered by getting into the passenger seat. I'm having your ride towed to the FBI garage. It's officially evidence. Great. Then I don't have a car. DCIS has a motor pool. Get one from there. They probably have some Ford Pintos sitting around. I preferred my Audi. Ain't life a bitch. What was the final count? He asked quietly. She exhaled a long breath. Four dead. Seven wounded. Three of them critically, so the death count could go higher. The black SUV? Disappeared without the proverbial trace. She sat back against the seat and closed her eyes. Where did you go that was so important? I needed to check on something. What or who? Just something. Need to know and I don't? She opened her eyes and stared at him. He didn't answer. She looked down at the box under the steering column. I take it you found my grill light add-on? It came in handy. Who are you, really? Will Roby, DCIS. Just like the badge and ID card says. You handled yourself well back there. I was still fumbling for my gun while you emptied your mag at the shooters. Cool and collected with bullets flying past. He said nothing, just kept driving. The sky was clear. You could see some stars. Roby wasn't looking at them. He stared ahead. That was basically a war zone back there, and it didn't seem to have any effect on you. I've been in the FBI for 15 years, right out of college. I've been in exactly one shootout during that time. I've seen my share of dead bodies after the fact, caught my share of bad guys, filled out my share of paperwork, worn out witness chairs in courthouses. He made a left. He had no idea where he was going. He just kept driving. And where exactly is this trip down memory lane going, Agent Vance? After you left, I threw up. Couldn't help it. Just upchucked into a trash can. Nothing unusual about that. It was pretty bad. You saw what I saw, and you didn't throw up. He looked at her again. You said it didn't affect me. You don't know that. You can't see inside my head. I wish I could. I'm pretty sure I'd find it fascinating. Doubtful. 
You triaged those people really effectively. Where did you learn to do that? I just picked up some tricks over the years. She glanced down at his arm. Damn, Roby, you didn't even clean your own wound. You're going to get gangrene. Where are we going? First stop, WFO. She said, referring to the Washington field office. After that? Hospital for you. No. Roby? No. Okay, we can drive to your place, but I insist on getting your wound cleaned up there. I can grab some stuff from WFO. Then I can head home and try to get a couple hours sleep. Where do you live? He said nothing, but he hung a right and then another right and headed to the WFO. So you know the way to the field office? No, I'm just making an educated guess. Where do you live, or is that classified too? We can part company at the WFO. I'll cab it from there. Do you have a place to live? I'll find one. For God's sakes, what is going on with you? I'm just trying to do my job. The emphasis on the last word made her visibly react. Okay. Okay, look. After WFO, we can go to my place. I live in Virginia, condo in Alexandria. You can get cleaned up there. And if you want, you're welcome to the couch. I appreciate the offer, but... Careful. I'm not usually this nice to people, Roby. Don't blow it. He glanced at her. She was smiling weakly at him. He was about to decline again, but he didn't. For three reasons. His arm was aching like hell. And he was tired. Really tired. And he really had no place to go. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Chapter 36 The stop at WFO took longer than Roby had thought it would. He sat in a chair while Vance bustled around, filling out papers, briefing superiors, thumbing her phone and clicking computer keys, and looking more and more tired with every passing minute. Roby gave his official statement of events and then watched the ensuing activity. Part of him wondered if everyone was just running around in circles and accomplishing little. I'll drive, said Roby, as they headed to the garage after they were finally done. Don't you ever get tired? I am tired. Really tired, in fact. You don't look it. I find things work better that way. What way? Not showing what you're actually feeling. She gave him directions, and he took the GW Parkway south to Alexandria. When they pulled into her condo building, Roby said, You have water views of the Potomac? Yes, and I can see the monuments from my place, too. Nice. They took the elevator up, and she unlocked the door to her place. It was small, but Roby immediately liked it. Clean lines, no clutter, and everything seemed to have a purpose. Nothing was strictly for show. He assumed that matched the owner's personality. Nothing for show. What I see matters. Reminds me of a ship's cabin. Well, my father was Korea Navy. Apple didn't fall far from the tree. Other than I spend most of my time on dry land. Make yourself comfortable. He sat on a long couch in the living room while she unpacked some medical supplies she'd taken from WFO. She kicked off her flats and sat next to him. Off with the jacket and the shirt. He looked at her awkwardly, but did what she asked, setting his holstered gun on the coffee table. When she saw the tats, her eyebrows hiked. Red lightning and what's the other one? Shark's tooth, great white. And why those? Why not? She looked more closely, and her eyes widened as she saw the old wounds the tats were obscuring. Are those? Yeah, they are he said tersely, cutting her off. She busied herself with the medical supplies after this mild rebuke, while Roby stared at his hands. What are you, thirty-five? Forty. Just. You've got to be former special forces, right? Ranger, Delt, Seal. They all have builds like you, although you're taller than most of those guys. He didn't answer her. She cleaned the wound, applied some antibiotics, and then wound gauze around it taping it securely down. I brought some painkillers, pill or syringe. No. Come on, Roby, you don't have to play all macho with me. It's got nothing to do with that. What then? Knowing your pain tolerance is important. 
Pills and needles mask it, not good. I could be slipping and I'd never know it. Guess I never thought of that. She put her things away and looked at him. You can put your shirt back on. Thanks for patching me up, I appreciate it. He slipped his shirt back on, wincing a bit as he did so. That's nice to know, she said, watching him. What? That you're human. I thought you could tell that from my ability to bleed. You need anything else? Hungry? Thirsty? No, I'm good. He looked down. Miss the couch? Yes. Sorry, I've only got the one bedroom, but even though you're tall, the couch is extra long. I've slept in a lot worse conditions, trust me. Can I? He folded his jacket over the arm of the couch. Can you what? Trust you. You invited me here. That's not what I'm talking about, and you know it. He walked to a window overlooking the water. To the north, he could see the lights of D.C. The triumvirate of the Lincoln, Jefferson, and Washington monuments were plainly visible. And rising above them all, the colossal dome of the Capitol. She joined him. I like getting up in the morning and seeing that. I figure it's what I work for, fight for, defending what those buildings represent. It's good to have a reason. What's your reason? Some days I know, some days I don't. How about today? Good night, and thanks for letting me stay here. I know we only just met today, but it feels like I've known you for years. Why is that? He looked at her. From her expression, it wasn't an idle question. She wanted an answer. Looking for a killer bonds people pretty quick. Almost dying together bonds you even more. I guess that's probably right. She said, though her tone spoke of disappointment with his answer. She got him sheets and a blanket and pillow and fixed up the couch for him over his protest that he could do it himself. Roby walked over to the window and looked at the monuments again. Tourist sites, really, nothing more. But there could be more if one thought about it, if one did something about it. He turned to find Vance next to him. You can, you know. I can what? Trust me. Roby couldn't look at her as the lie rolled off his tongue. Chapter 37 They rose the next morning, took turns showering, and had cups of coffee, orange juice, and buttered toast. While Vance was finishing dressing in her bedroom, Roby sent Julie a one-word text. Good? He counted the seconds until she texted him back. There were only ten of them. Her text was equally terse. Good. He stretched out his wounded arm and checked the bandage. Vance had done a good job rewrapping it after he'd finished showering. A few minutes later, he and Vance settled into her BMW. Neither spoke as they drove toward D.C. The traffic sucked, the horns blared, and Roby could tell that once or maybe twice, Vance had been sorely tempted to trot out her fancy blue grill lights, and maybe even her gun. Roby, I would appreciate if you didn't mention you stayed at my place last night. I wouldn't want people to get the wrong idea. And some of the guys I work with could really make something out of nothing with it. I don't talk to people about the weather, much less where I spent the night. Thanks. You're welcome. She shot him a glance. I hope you didn't think I invited you to stay for some reason other than a place to sleep. Never crossed my mind, Agent Vance. You don't strike me as the type. You don't strike me as the type either. I need to pick up a fresh set of wheels. You want me to drop you by DCIS? There's a car rental place on M Street near 17th. Drop me there. What, DCIS can't spring for fresh wheels for one of its own? What they have is crap. Probably hand-me-downs from the Bureau. I'll get my own. FBI doesn't do things that way. FBI has a budget that allows for that. DCIS doesn't. You're the 800-pound gorilla. We're the underfed chimpanzee. She drove to the rental place on M. Roby got out. Do you want to meet me at Donnelly's? I'll get there. I'm just not sure when. Other things to do? Some things to think about. Some things to dig into. Care to share? A mom and kid dead, a bus blown up, 
A shooter trying to take you or me or both of us down. I'll call you when I'm on my way to Donnelly's, he added. He walked to the rental place and requested an Audi. They didn't have one, so he took a Volvo instead. The rental agent told him that Volvos were very safe cars. Not around me, they're not, thought Roby, as he pulled out his license and credit card. How long will you be needing the car? asked the agent. Let's just leave it open, said Roby. The man blanched. We actually need to have a turn-in date from you and the place where it will be returned. Los Angeles, California, two weeks from today, said Roby promptly. You're going to drive to California, said the agent. You know, a plane is a lot faster. Yeah, but not merely as much fun. Ten minutes later, he sped out of the rental garage in his very safe silver Volvo two-door. What had scared him the most about last night was not nearly being killed or seeing others die. It was Julie. The feeling in his gut when he thought something had happened to her. He didn't like that. He didn't like someone else having that much power over him. He'd spent most of his life getting rid of those ties and avoiding any new ones. He drove faster, pushing his nice, safe Volvo probably beyond its comfort zone. That appealed to Roby. He didn't much like comfort zones. His or anyone else's. His phone buzzed. He glanced at the screen. Blue Man needed to meet with him again. Right now. I bet you do, thought Roby. Chapter 38 No public place this time. No Hay Adams with lots of witnesses. Roby didn't have much of a choice. There were rules one had to play by or one was out of the game. The building was sandwiched between two others in a part of D.C. that tourists would never tread. Even though the area was a high-crime one, none of the street punks ever bothered this place. It was not worth a bullet in their head or twenty years of their life in a federal cage. Roby had to part with his cell phone before entering the secure room, but he would not give up his gun. When the guard asked for it the second time, Roby told him to talk to Blue Man. The resolution was simple. Either he kept the gun, or Blue Man could meet with him at the McDonald's across the street. Roby went in with the gun. Blue Man sat across from him in the small room. Nice suit, solid color tie, neatly combed hair. He could be somebody's grandfather. Roby assumed he probably was somebody's grandfather. First, Roby, we have not found your handler. Second, there was no man with a rifle found in the alley you identified. Okay. Next, said Blue Man, the attempt on your life last night? The shooter was in a vehicle that looked a lot like a U.S. government ride. I don't think that is likely. Roby pointedly tapped the tabletop. You can't find my handler or a shooter I knocked out in an alley. But you think somebody gunning for me in a set of federal wheels is unlikely? Who's the girl? asked Blue Man. Roby didn't blink, because he'd been trained not to. You blink, you lose. A blink was like a weak throw into triple coverage because you lacked the stones to wait for another receiver to break open, as a three-hundred-pound lineman was about to plant you in the grass. Roby had known Julie's presence in all of this might come out. His observation post was obviously not entirely secret, or else he'd been followed. Roby said, She's the linchpin. Anything happens to her, we are screwed. So if you're telling me that my handler found her out, you better be prepared to do something about her safety. The older man sat up straighter, adjusted his tie and then his cuffs. You'll need to explain that to me, Roby. The linchpin for what? It won't take long because I don't understand it all. He took only a few minutes to describe the murderers of Julie's parents, her escape attempt on the bus, the man attempting to kill her there, and the bus exploding. And you lost your gun at the scene, the one you had at Wynn's apartment. I didn't lose it. The bus exploding knocked me fifteen feet. I tried to find it before the cops showed up, but I was unsuccessful. But the FBI did find it. 
and now they believe there's a connection between the two cases. Is there a connection? asked Roby. Actually, we don't know for sure. We'd like to talk to the girl. No. You go through me. No direct contact. That's not how we do things, and I'm not sure you're entirely clear on who's running the show, Roby. Grandpa was showing some balls now. Roby was impressed. But just a little. You have a mole on the inside. Even if my handler is gone, he might not have been acting alone. If I were him, I would have left somebody behind. You go pulling the girl in here, the mole gets wind of it. We lose her. I think we can protect her. You thought you could protect Jane Wynn, too, didn't you? Pointed out Roby. Blue Man adjusted his cuffs again. Okay. For now, status quo, he said stiffly. But I want a fuller debrief from you soon, and follow-up reports. You'll get them, said Roby, and I'd like the same. Do you go out of your way to rub people the wrong way? I go out of my way to keep myself and those entrusted to me safe, just as I go out of my way and above the call of duty to take out the people I am assigned to eliminate. You didn't kill Jane Wynn, and you really want to call that an error on my part? Talk to me about Vance. Good agent. You spent the night at her place. I didn't have many options, did I? Your place is safe. Is it? I can confirm that your handler was not given that information. You can confirm that? Roby said. My ass you can, he thought. Roby, we have assets deployed on this mission. Good assets. We're not leaving you out there by yourself. We have every incentive to see this through to the end. We have to find out what's going on. The motive behind this has to be worth the risks being taken. It's nearly impossible to turn one of our people like that. The payoff must be immense. And when the payoff is immense, the target has to be of similar importance. That's the most sensible thing you've said so far, Roby replied. Blue Man said, I'm under no misapprehension that our relationship, such as it is, isn't strained. You have good reason to be skeptical, upset, and mistrustful. If I were in your shoes, I'd be reacting the same way. The second most sensible thing you've said so far. Blue Man leaned forward. Let me see if I can make it three for three. He collected his thoughts. There are two possible reasons why Agent Wind and her husband were murdered. It either had to do with her, or it had to do with him. You know Jane Wynn's work. Could it be related to her? It's possible. I can't say definitively that it's not. Let's just say that I'm more interested in what you find out on Rick Wynn's background. Former military, retired, owned a pawn shop in a bad section of D.C., was hung upside down and his tongue was cut out. The last part has me concerned. I'm sure it had him concerned. You know what I'm talking about. Roby leaned back. Vance wondered if it was mob-related. Guy was a snitch and they symbolically cut his tongue out. Is that what you think? No. I'm thinking what you're probably thinking. You cut off the hands of a thief. And the tongue of a traitor. If it involves the world of Islamic terrorists. If, said Roby but the guy was retired. What could he be involved in? Terrorist cells are rarely obvious, Roby, at least the effective ones. Did he spend time in the Middle East? Could he have been turned and sent here as a ticking time bomb? A time bomb that had a change of heart, maybe? And yes, he did spend time in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Roby thought about some of the missions he'd performed in the Middle East. The most recent one had not technically been there. Khalid bin Talal had been in Morocco when Roby had killed him. But there were many others from the desert that wished the absolute destruction of America. Too many, in fact, to narrow down easily. Then why don't I hit that angle while you work the other side? But if anything occurs to you or you find out something while working with Vance that has to do with Agent Wind, you'll get it. Then we understand each other. The two men rose. Roby looked at him and said, Is my place really safe? 
because I could use a change of clothes. Blue Man managed a rare smile. Go and change your clothes, Roby. The ones you have on are looking pretty ragged. Well, I'm feeling pretty ragged, admitted Roby. Chapter 39 Roby drove toward his apartment, parked a block away, and made his approach from the rear. He rode a service elevator up, got off, did a protracted observation of the hall, and then moved forward. He bumped into Annie Lambert as she was coming out of her apartment with her bike. She had on a black skirt, pink parka, hose, and tennis shoes. A knapsack was over one shoulder. Late to work? asked Roby as he approached. She turned around, initially startled, but then she smiled. Doctor's appointment. Even White House staffers have to take them. Nothing serious? No, just routine stuff. He smiled. So, are you running the country into the ground? The opposition would answer that with a big yes. But I think we're doing okay. Times are hard. Lots of challenges. How about you? Doing okay? I'm fine. If she noticed the bandage bulge under his jacket or the rumpled state of his clothes, she didn't mention it. Still up for that drink sometime? he asked. Roby seemed surprised by his own question. I'm learning a lot about myself this week, he thought. Sure. How about tonight? You said you wanted to do it soon. If the president will let you off. She grinned. I think he will. How about eight? W Hotel Rooftop Bar? The views are great. See you then. She left with her bike, and Roby walked to his apartment. He had no idea why he had just done that. But he had committed, and he would be there at eight. Ordinarily, he disliked distractions while he was working. But somehow, he was welcoming this one. In his apartment, he still checked his intruder traps, even though it seemed his agency could easily circumvent them. Everything looked the same. They could have wired the place, but he had no intention of making any calls from here. In a way, he was trapped right here at home. He changed into fresh clothes and made up a small bag with other items he might need if he didn't come back here for a while. He had the urge to check on Julie and pecked her a quick message, asking if that was okay with her. The text came back seconds later. Come on. He backtracked his way to her apartment and rode the elevator up. He looked for elements of Blue Man's security force but didn't see any. Maybe that was good, he thought. Maybe. Julie unlocked the door only after peeping him through the hole. He also was gratified to hear her turning off the security system as well. He closed and locked the door behind him. So you were talking to the bike chick? What? She pointed to the telescope. That thing is powerful. Works great, night or day. Yeah, well, it's supposed to. But I don't want you using it to snoop on people. I'm just observing my perimeter like you ordered me to last night. Okay, I guess I deserve that. So your other place is across the street? Yeah. Normally people like to spread out their residences. You know, Paris, London, Hong Kong. I'm not normal. Yeah, that one I figured out on my own. So what have you found out? I've been watching the TV. Sounds like it was a real war zone down there last night. You're lucky you weren't killed. At least I'm assuming that's where you got shot. You never got around to telling me about your arm. Luck always plays a part. They have any leads? None they're sharing with me. How's working with the FBI? It's working. She's pretty. Who? Agent Vance. She was on the TV talking to reporters. She didn't mention you. That was a good thing. Where did you sleep last night? I know it wasn't across the street. She indicated the scope. I slept, he said. That's all you need to know. Uh-huh. You slept with her, didn't you? This time, Roby almost blinked. Almost. The kid was really getting to him. What makes you say that? She studied him closely. Oh, I don't know. A certain glow. A woman can always tell. Well, you're wrong. Now I've got to get going. When are we going to get going, Roby? He stared at her. Partners, remember our deal? We find out who killed my parents. I remember, and I'm working on it. I know you are, but I want to work on it, too. I gave you that list. What have you done with it so far? 
Going to run it down. Good, she said, pulling on her hoodie. I'm ready to go. I don't think that's a good idea. And I don't think it's a good idea, me just sitting here on my ass, doing nothing except looking through a telescope. So either I go with you or I go on my own. Either way, I'm going. Roby sighed and opened the door for her. But you let me handle the questions, he said. I wouldn't have it any other way. Liar, thought Roby. Chapter 40 They sat in Roby's rental and watched her parents' duplex. Julie squirmed a little and said, Exactly how is this getting us anywhere? We're seeing if anyone interesting shows up. I'll give it another half hour and we'll move on. This is busy work, right? You're trying to make me so bored I'll quit and go back and sit at the apartment, right? Are you always so skeptical of everyone? Pretty much, yeah. And are you telling me you're not skeptical? Within reason. What the hell does that mean? Forget it. He looked out his window and watched as the stray cat skittered down the sidewalk. A few drops of rain started to fall, and the animal picked up its pace, disappearing down an alley. How long had your parents lived here? About two years. Longest we lived anywhere. He glanced over at her. So, give me the short version of your life. Not much to tell. It might help the investigation. I just remembered something. Something my mom said when the guy with the gun was there. What? When the guy started to come after me, my mom said, she doesn't know anything. Roby sat up straighter, and his grip tightened on the wheel. How did you forget to tell me that? I don't know. Just being back here and seeing the house made me think of it. She told the guy that you didn't know anything, said Roby, which implies that your mom did know something. And before you said, the guy asked your dad what he knew. I see where you're going with this. So now somebody thinks I know it too, despite what my mom said. But if the guy who was after me died in the explosion... Doesn't matter. He would have communicated with whomever he was working for. Maybe he was a loner? Don't think so. Why? He wasn't the type. I can tell. And besides, someone removed your parents' bodies and blew up that bus. And it wasn't him. He wouldn't have had time or the opportunity. Why would they blow up the bus? If they were trying to kill me, I wasn't on it. But they might not have known that. Let's say someone fired an incendiary round into the tank on the side opposite from the door. The windows on the bus were tinted. They might not have known we had gotten off the bus. They were making sure of things just in case their guy on the scene failed, which he did. Do you think they still believe I'm dead? Doubtful. These people apparently have a lot of resources. We have to assume they know you're alive. Julie looked out the window. What could my parents have gotten into? Let's track their days a little bit and see if anything comes up. Where to first? The diner where your mom worked. Give me directions. Using Julie as the navigator, Roby drove over to the diner, which was only a short distance away. He pulled the Volvo to a stop at the curb about a block down and on the other side of the street from the diner. He cut the engine. They know you there, right? Yeah, sure. So I'm not sure it's smart for you to be seen there. So I just sit in the car by myself? That was not part of the deal. The plan is ever-evolving depending on conditions on the ground. He reached into the back seat and pulled out the bag he'd taken from his apartment. He slid out a pair of binoculars. Here's the plan. I go in and ask some questions. You keep a lookout. Anybody seems to be paying me too much attention. Take his picture with your camera. How will you explain why you're asking questions in the diner? He reached into the bag again and pulled out two power packs, an earwig, and a headset. He handed the latter to her. Your command's central. You speak into that. I'll be able to hear you in there, but no one else will, okay? And you'll be able to hear everything from in there clearly. You feed me information as you see fit, okay? Julie smiled. Okay, cool. He put on his earwig, powered up his pack, and clipped it onto his belt, where it was covered by his jacket. He got out, and then leaned back in. Anything looks weird. You feel bad vibes, just say, come, and I'll be here in five seconds, okay? 
Okay. He shut the door, looked left and right, and headed to the diner. Through the binoculars, Julie watched him every step of the way. Chapter 41 Roby dropped onto a freeze stool and picked up a dingy menu from a rack on the countertop. A waitress in a frayed blue uniform with a not overly clean apron over it faced him. A pencil was stuck behind her right ear. She was about fifty, wide in the hips, with gray roots running through her otherwise blonde hair. What can I get you? Cup of black coffee to start? Coming up. I just put on a fresh pot. In Roby's ear, Julie said, Her name is Cheryl Cosman. She's my mom's friend. She's a good person. Roby nodded slightly to show he'd gotten the info. Cheryl brought his cup of coffee and set it down. You look like you could use some meat on your bones. Our meatloaf is really good. Sticks to your ribs. Lord knows I've had enough of it. Haven't seen my ribs for about 20 years. She laughed. You're Cheryl Cosman? The laugh caught in her throat. <laughs> Who wants to know? Roby pulled out his cred pack, flashed first the badge, and then the ID card. Cheryl stiffened. Am I in trouble? Should you be? Not unless working your ass off for pennies is a crime. No, you're not in trouble, Miss Cosman. Just make it Cheryl. I know this is a four-star fancy place, but we try to keep things informal. How long you worked here? Too long. Came here out of high school to work one summer, and here I am all these years later. If I think about it too much, I start to cry. I know where my life went, right in the crapper. Roby pulled out a picture of Julie and her parents, which he'd taken from the duplex. What can you tell me about these folks? Cosman glanced at the photo. You're interested in the Gettys. Why? Are they in trouble? Again, any reason you know of why they should be? No, they're just good people who got into some bad stuff and never could find their way back out. That little girl of theirs is something, a real piece of work. Now, I mean that in a good way. If she had half a chance in life, she'd make something of herself. Smart as a whip, she is. Gets real good grades in school. She works hard at it. Many of the times she's been here with books piled high. Tried to help her once on a math problem? That was a joke. I can barely add up numbers on a customer's bill. But Julie is special. I love that girl. But she's in foster care. Well, she is and she isn't. Sarah, that's her mom, does all she can to get her back, each time. And her dad? Curtis loves her, too, but the man is a mess. Too many coke snorts, if you ask me. After a while, how much brain do you have left, right? Even Einstein would be a dumbass with that much white stuff up there. When was the last time you saw any of them? Cosman folded her arms across her chest. Funny you should ask that. Sarah was supposed to work today, but she never came in, never called. Not like her, either. Well, unless something had happened. Like a binge, maybe? Or Curtis couldn't get out of bed and she had to take care of him. I expect she'll be in tomorrow. No, she won't, thought Roby. In his ear, he heard Julie sniffle. Does the owner put up with that? The owner is a three-time loser who's done his share of drugs. He understands the mindset. He lets her slide. But when she's here, nobody works harder. So the last time she was here? Day before yesterday. She had yesterday off. Her shift was over at six. She'd pulled twelve hours at that point. On your feet all day is a real bitch. Curtis came to walk her home. From his job? Right. A warehouse about five minutes from here. He walked her home a lot, didn't think the streets around here were safe, and sometimes they're not. I thought it was sweet. He really loved her, and she really loved him. They had absolutely nothing. Lived in a dump. No car, no savings, no retirement. Well, they did have Julie. That's something for sure. They wanted the best for her. Didn't want her to end up like them. Paid every last penny they had, and then some to get her into a gifted and talented program at a really good school. Sarah worked extra hours here all the time to help pay for the tuition. We had lots of chats about that when we were working the same shift. 
And Curtis pulled extra hours at the warehouse. He was a druggie, but he could work hard when he wanted to. And for his little girl, he wanted to. In his ear, Roby heard Julie breathing fast and hard. His hand reached down to the power pack on his belt, and he turned it off. You see Julie a lot? Oh, yeah. Like I said, she'd sit at a booth or here at the counter and do her homework while her mom finished her shift. Then the three of them would walk home together. When she wasn't in foster care? Right, I know. It seems like she was more in foster care than not. You see anybody hanging around here the last few weeks you didn't recognize? Cosman frowned. Look, has something happened to Sarah? Or Curtis or Julie? I'm just here collecting information. Your badge said DCIS. Roby was surprised at this. Most people never focused on the actual insignia. You know the agency? We got some veterans who are regulars here. One was with DCIS, so I know the symbol. But what's the connection to the Gettys? Neither Curtis nor Sarah was in the service, at least that I know of. Again, I'm just collecting information. Did either of them seem edgy or concerned when you saw them lately? Something has happened to them, hasn't it? Cosman looked like she might start crying. Several patrons at other tables glanced at them. Cheryl, I'm just here doing my job, and if you don't want to answer my questions, that's fine. Or we can do it another time. No, no, it's okay. She wiped her eyes with a napkin and collected herself. But I think I'm going to have some coffee, too, to steady my nerves. He waited while she poured herself a cup and returned to stand in front of him. Edgy or concerned, prompted Roby. Now that you mention it, yeah. At least Sarah. I don't know about Curtis. He's always edgy and looks ready to jump out of his skin all the time. But that's just the drugs talking. Did you ever ask Sarah what was bothering her? No, I never did. I figured it was either Curtis or maybe losing Julie to foster care again. There was nothing I could do about any of it. She mentioned any names? Take any phone calls here that seemed out of the ordinary? No. Her last day here, did anything unusual happen? No, but the night before they had some friends in here for dinner. What friends? Just buddies of theirs. They took that booth over there. Sarah was off duty, and she had her meal free and discounts on everybody else's. When you don't have much money, every little bit helps. Did you know them? Another couple, Leo and Ida Broom. Roby took a sip of his coffee and then wrote this down. Tell me about them. Some more customers came in, and Roby waited while Cheryl seated them at a booth and took their drink orders. After she delivered them and took their food requests, she came back over to Roby. He'd eyed the new folks and saw nothing threatening. While Cheryl was doing her duties, he'd turned the power pack back on and immediately heard Julie's voice. Don't turn it off again. I'm not going to start crying, okay? He nodded slightly. Cheryl said, Sorry about that. No problem. We were talking about the brooms? Not much to tell, really. They're in their late 40s, nice couple. I think Ida works in a hair salon, and Leo does something with the city, not sure exactly what. I don't know how they met. Maybe they were all in rehab together, who knows? I only know them from when they come here to have a meal with Sarah and Curtis from time to time. You have an address or phone number for them? No. In his ear, Julie said, I do. Roby said, Cheryl, did you notice anything unusual while they were together that night? Well, I served them. I was working the late shift that night. I just caught snatches of conversation. Nothing really important, but they all looked... Roby waited patiently until she found the words she was looking for. Well... They all looked like they'd seen a ghost. And you didn't ask them what was bothering them? No. I just figured it was either drugs or Julie was back in foster care or it was something to do with the brooms. Look, I'm a waitress at a crummy diner, okay? If people want to talk, I'll listen. But I'm not into poking around things that don't concern me. I have enough of my own problems. If that makes me a bad person, then I'm a bad person. You're not a bad person, Cheryl, said Roby. But he was also thinking something else. You got any time off coming up? 
She was clearly surprised by this question. Got a week of vacation left? You have a family out of town? In Tallahassee. I'd go see your family in Tallahassee. Cosman stared at him as Roby's meaning sank in. Do you, do you think that I'm- Just take the vacation, Cheryl. Take it now. Roby laid a 20 down for the coffee, rose, and left. Chapter 42 Roby climbed back in the car and slid out his earwig and power pack, stashing them in the console between the front seats. He looked over at Julie, who gazed straight ahead. You okay? I'm okay. She stared over at the diner. That place was almost more of a home for me than my real home. Certainly more than any of the foster places. I can see that, replied Roby. I like to do my homework there. My mom would get me pie and let me drink coffee. I felt really grown up. And I guess it was nice being with her. I like to watch her work. She was good at it. Juggled all these orders. And she never wrote anything down. She had a great memory. Maybe your brain's a genetic. Maybe they are. The night your parents were killed, they left the diner at around six. But they didn't show up at their house until hours later and with the gunman. I wonder where they were in the meantime. I don't know. Okay, how about the brooms? They live in an apartment in Northeast. Roby put the car in drive. What can you tell me about them? Before she could answer, Roby's phone buzzed. He put it up to his ear. Roby. Where the hell are you? It was Vance. Doing some digging like I told you. You need to get over here. What's happening? First, I've got the press all over my ass. Second, I've got MPD, a joint terrorist team, and Homeland Security trying to tell me how to run my investigation. Third, I'm just pissed. Okay, give me an hour and I'll be there. Is that really the best you can do? It really is. He clicked off and hung a left, working his way over to Union Station. He abruptly pulled off, parked, and undid his seatbelt. What are you doing? Asked Julie. Give me a minute. Roby stepped outside and shut the door behind him. He made the call. The office of Blue Man answered. He was patched directly through. Roby told him what Vance had told him. You might want to pull some strings at DHS, the Joint Terrorist Squad, and MPD to get them off her back, he said. Otherwise, this might get even more complicated real fast. Consider it done, said Blue Man. Roby slid back in the car and started it up. Top secret stuff, said Julie, looking at him with an unfriendly gaze. No, I was just checking on my dry cleaning. So have you slept with her? Roby kept his eyes straight ahead. I already told you, no. Not that it's any of your business who I sleep with. Well, she wants to have sex with you. He shot her a glance. How the hell do you figure that? She's pissed off at you now. I heard her voice over the phone. She wouldn't get that upset unless she had a thing for you. She's FBI. She's probably reamed lots of guys who give her trouble. Maybe, but this is different. I can just tell. It's a woman thing. Guys wouldn't understand. You're 14. You shouldn't know about woman things. Will, what century are you living in? Five girls in my old school are pregnant, and none of them are older than me. I guess I'm just old-fashioned. Sometimes I wish I could be old-fashioned, too. But that's not the world I live in. So, the brooms? My parents have known them for years. Like Cheryl said, Ida works in a hair salon. I've gone there with my mom. Ida would cut my hair for free, and my mom would bake stuff for her. My mom is a good cook. She paused. Was a good cook. And her husband? Roby said quickly, hoping to move her off this thought. Cheryl said he had some job with the city. Not sure about that. Anything unusual about them? They seem pretty normal to me, but I didn't know them all that well. Then I guess we'll just have to ask them. If they're still alive, he thought. How did they meet your parents? I think Mr. Broom was a friend of Dad's. I'm not sure what the exact connection was. You think they could have anything to do with what happened to your parents? I wouldn't think so. I mean... 
She works in a hair salon, and they eat in crummy diners. It's not like they're international spies or anything. Not that you know. Are you kidding? Spies don't usually look like spies. That's sort of the point. You look like a spy. That's good, because I'm not. So you say. They drove in silence for a few seconds. So are you sleeping with her? Why the hell do you care? I'm just naturally curious. Yeah, that I get. But even if I were sleeping with her, I wouldn't tell you. Why? Something called being a gentleman. Now you really sound old. Compared to you, I'm ancient. Chapter 43 The apartment building had been built in the 60s but had been rehabbed. Roby could tell this from the new awning out front, the cleansed brick, and the fresh paint on the trim. As he watched from the car with Julie, a man opened the door by touching a plastic key card against an electronic receiver housed next to the entrance. The door clicked open, and he walked inside. The door clicked shut behind him. Julie glanced at Roby. What now? You know the apartment number? No, I just passed the place one time with my mom. She told me the brooms lived there. I've never been to their apartment. Okay, give me a sec. He slipped out of the car and hustled across the street to beat some oncoming traffic. He gazed at a call box set in the wall next to the door and pushed the button. A voice came on. Yes? I'm here to see Leo and Ida Broom. Hold on. The voice came back on about 20 seconds later. Call their apartment. No answer. You sure you call the right apartment? Number 305? No, it's 410. Oh, okay, thanks. Roby looked around to see if there was a surveillance camera, but saw none. A couple was approaching him, elderly. The woman had a scarf and a cane. In her free hand was a plastic grocery bag. The man was skimming along with the use of a walker that had tennis balls stuck on the ends of the front poles. Roby watched as the woman pulled out a key card. You need any help, ma'am? asked Roby. She looked at him suspiciously. No, we're just fine by ourselves. Okay. Roby stepped back, waiting for her to open the door with the card. She stopped and stared at him. Can I help you, young man? Roby started to say something when he heard her voice. Dad, I told you to wait for me. Roby turned and watched Julie run up to him. She had her knapsack slung over her shoulder. She looked at the elderly couple and smiled. Hi, I'm Julie. Do you live in this building? My dad and I are thinking about moving here. We came to see one of the apartments. My mom's supposed to meet us here. She turned to Roby. But she called and said she's running late, and she has the key card the rental agent gave her. We'll just have to wait outside. She turned back to the couple. This will be the first time I'll have a bathroom to myself. You promised, right, Dad? Roby nodded. Anything for my little girl? The old man smiled. Nice to have some young blood in the place. I'm feeling old. You are old, said the woman. Really old. She looked at Julie kindly. Where are you moving here from, honey? Jersey, said Julie promptly. I hear it's warmer down here. What part of Jersey? Asked the woman. That's where we're from. Wayne, said Julie. It's nice there, but my dad got transferred. Wayne is very nice, said the woman. Julie looked at Roby. Mom said about 45 minutes she's stuck in traffic. Everybody's stuck in traffic in this area, said the old man. Hell, you can be a pedestrian in this town and get stuck in traffic. Come on, we'll let you in. No sense you standing around out here. Roby took the woman's bag of groceries, and they rode the elevator up to the sixth floor, where they left the old couple. The woman gave Julie a cookie from the bag and pinched her cheek. You look just like my great-granddaughter. Hope we see a lot of you if you move in here. Roby and Julie rode the elevator back down to the fourth floor and got off. Nice work back there, said Roby. They might have tripped you up, though, being from Jersey, too. I've been to Wayne. First rule, don't say you're from someplace you've never been. 
Good rule. They found apartment 410. It was at the end of a hall with no other door facing it. Roby scanned the hall for a surveillance camera but found none. He knocked on 410 three times without an answer. Turn around and face out into the hall. Are you going to pick the lock? Just turn around. It took Roby all of five seconds. The lock was not a deadbolt. One slender piece of metal did the trick as opposed to two. They stepped inside and he closed the door behind them. I guess this makes us felons. It might. The place smelled of fried foods. It was furnished sparingly. The rooms were few. And there was no one there. They stood in the middle of the living room. Roby surveyed the area. It's a little too clean, don't you think? Maybe they're neat nicks. He shook his head. This place has been scrubbed. Julie looked up at him. You mean... I don't know if anything happened to the brooms, Julie. Maybe they're okay. But someone has wiped this place down, and whoever did it knew what he was doing. Julie gazed around the space. Should we check for prints or something? Waste of time. We need to find out what Leo Broom did. We can go to the hair salon and ask around. I have a better idea. You can go to the hair salon and ask around. I don't want to tip anyone off to what we're doing. Folks are less likely to suspect a kid. I'm not a kid. I am practically old enough to drive. But they'll open up to you. They know you, right? Yeah, I've been there lots of times. They left the building and drove off in the Volvo. You think the brooms are dead, don't you? Based on what happened to your parents and the condition of the brooms' apartment, yeah, I think they're probably dead. But then again, if Ida Broom is at the hair salon, I'll be proved wrong. I hope you're wrong, Will. Me too. Chapter 44 While Roby waited outside in the car, Julie entered the hair salon. It was full of customers, and her gaze darted around, noting the stylists working there today. Ida Broom was not among them. The smells of hair care products and perming solutions filled her lungs as she walked over to the reception desk. A constant chatter also permeated the place, as stylists and patrons discussed the latest gossip. Julie, right? said the young woman behind the counter. She looked college age and wore black slacks and a low-cut top that revealed a flower tat near the top of her left breast. Her haircut, understandably, was very hip. Yep, is Ida in today? I was hoping to get my bangs trimmed. Julie was praying that Ida was in the back, or maybe taking a smoke break in the alley behind the salon. But the woman shook her head. She was supposed to be in at ten, but she never showed. I called her place, but no one answered. Really put us behind. She had seven cuts, two perms, and a coloring scheduled today. Her clients were not happy when I called them to cancel. I wonder what happened. Maybe some emergency came up. Maybe it did. I might be able to get Maria to do your bangs. She has an open slot after the lady she's working on now. That would be great. Maria was a Latina in her mid-twenties with short, dark hair that was cut in precise lines around her angular face. She greeted Julie with a toothy smile. Look at you, girl. You need your bangs cut, right? How'd you know? I'm a professional, okay? The stylist next to her chuckled as she clipped away at the thinning hair of a young man. No school today? Teacher conference. How's your mom? Julie didn't blink. She'd been expecting this question. She's fine. Julie settled in the chair, and Maria swept a black smock over her and tightened it down around her neck. You know, you look really cute with like a Zoe de Chanel cut. It's so chic with glasses. My eyesight is perfect. That's not the point, it's the look. Have you seen Ida lately? The girl at the front told me she didn't come in today. I know, surprised me. She never misses work, and she had a full slate today. The boss is pissed. The economy still sucks, and every dollar counts. Business looks pretty good today. Yeah, but it's not like this every day. Apreciar todo lo bueno que viene su manera. Maria laughed, 
and bopped Julie lightly on the head with her scissors. You know I don't speak Spanish. I wonder where Ida is. Don't know. She was acting kind of funny day before yesterday. Funny haha or funny weird? Definitely funny weird. She messed up a lady's perm and then took two inches off a client instead of the one inch she wanted. Talk about a lady being pissed. You know how we women are about our hair? It's like a religion. That and shoes. Did you ask her what was up? Yeah, but she wouldn't say much. Just that it has something to do with Leo. Her husband? Did he lose his job or something? I doubt it. He works for the government. They don't lose their jobs. I don't know about that. Lots of governments are cutting back now. Well, anyway, I don't think Leo got canned. What does he do? Something with the government, like I said. Yeah, but what? And what government? D.C.? Feds? Well, aren't you just the nosy one today? Just naturally curious. All teenagers are. Right. My youngest sister is 17, and she could give a crap about anything or anybody other than herself. I'm an only child. We tend to be more observant. Well, I'm not sure where Leo works, but Ida told me one time that his job was pretty important down on Capitol Hill somewhere. Then maybe he works for the federal government. Maybe he does. So Ida wasn't in yesterday either? Nope, but that's okay. It was her day off. But today is a whole different story. Maria had been working this whole time and said, Okay, we are done and looking sharp. But think about those glasses, okay? Julie admired her hair in the mirror. Thanks, Maria. Maria took the smock off and Julie pulled out some cash. Maria waved it off. No, this one is on me. But you should get paid. I tell you what, you can start teaching me some Spanish when you come in. My mother is really ragging me to learn it. Julie smiled. Deal. Chapter 45 Roby had not stayed in the Volvo the entire time he was waiting for Julie. He was roaming and watching. He knew there were eyes out there somewhere. He just wanted to find them before they found him. And he had things to think about. He had two cases going simultaneously. Jane Wynne was dead along with her young son. She was with the Defense Department. She'd traveled to Iraq and Afghanistan and probably other hot spots. Roby's handler had been turned and had ordered Roby to kill her. Now the handler was missing, and Roby was investigating murders that had occurred when he'd been present. Nicole Vance was sharp, and Roby had to be extra careful he didn't slip up around her. Rick Wind had been found with his tongue cut out and hanging upside down in his pawn shop. No leads there, either. And then he had Julie Getty. Parents murdered and the crime scene policed. Kill her on the bus to finish the job. Bus blows up. Roby's gun was found at the scene, which made the feds believe the cases were connected and the guy who'd attacked them in the alley had disappeared. The broom's apartment had been scrubbed, too, and Roby didn't know where they were, or if they were still alive. He glanced at the salon and saw through the window that Julie was getting ready to leave. If he were a betting man, he would wager that Ida Broom had not been in there. He met her at the car, and they both climbed in. Talk to me. Julie spent a few minutes filling him in. So we still don't know what Leo does. Can't you find that out on some government database? Probably. I'll check it out. The brooms are most likely dead. Or they could be in hiding. That would be the best case. If Mr. Broom has some important job in the government, do you think he's the reason for all this? It's certainly a possibility. But why would that involve my parents? They were friends. They met for meals. He might have let something slip. Great. My parents might have been killed because they had a meatloaf dinner with the guy. Stranger things have happened. What now? I drop you back off. I have to get going. Right. To see Special Super Agent Vance. Just Special Agent Vance. But she was super, wasn't she? You won't let it rest, will you? Does this mean I go back to the apartment and die of boredom? Don't you have homework to do? 
Going from investigating murder to doing calculus? Wow. You're only 14, and you're already doing calculus? G and T, Roby, like I said, I actually don't like math very much, but I'm good at it. Education is the key to success. You sound like somebody's grandfather. You disagree? I'm just taking it one day at a time. Not a bad philosophy. My classmates' parents have their whole lives planned out for them. Top colleges, top graduate programs, Wall Street, medical school, law firms, the next Steve Jobs, the next Warren Buffett makes me want to gag. Nothing wrong with getting ahead. You mean there's nothing wrong with making as much money as possible at the expense of everyone else? The planet has over 7 billion people, and too many of them live in poverty. Me coming up with an algorithm to make a fortune on Wall Street and tank the economy in the process, which in turn creates a lot more poor people, doesn't exactly rock my career boat. Then do something else, something that helps people. She gave him a sideways look. You mean like you? He glanced away. No. Not like me, he thought. Chapter 46 After dropping Julie off, Roby navigated traffic until he arrived at Donnelly's about 25 minutes later. The bodies were gone, but the street was filled with police cars, forensics vans, and bureau sedans. Smack in the middle of the sidewalk was a mobile FBI command post that had probably been dropped off last night. On the other side of the wooden police barriers was an army of reporters. Media trucks with communication masts raised to the sky lined the street behind the jostling journalists. Roby flashed his creds and was passed through the barriers as the reporters with deadlines and a never-ending news cycle to service screamed questions at him. Vance met him out front. She seemed hassled and harried. As he looked around at the chaos of the First Amendment slamming head-on into the right of the government to solve the murders of several of its citizens, Roby could hardly blame her. Got everything under control? Don't make me shoot you. He followed her into Donnelly's, where federal techs and FBI agents in dark blue windbreakers were working the crime scene hard. Evidence markers were placed throughout denoting the position of victims. Colored pieces of plastic with numbers on them. They seemed grossly inadequate to symbolize the death or wounding of a human being. What's the latest? Two more of the victims died last night at the hospital. That makes the total count six, and chances are we might lose more. You said DHS and MPD were hassling you? That's quieted down now, actually. They pulled up their tents and went home. Good to know. She glanced sharply at him. Did you have anything to do with that? He held up his hands. I don't have that kind of pull. If the FBI can't move the mountain, don't expect little DCIS to do it. Right. She said, looking unconvinced. Any clues? Black SUV was found abandoned about a mile from here. It had bullet pox on it. You were right. It was heavily armored. Who was the owner? The U.S. government. So I was right thought Roby. And Blue Man was wrong. This did not make him feel any better. In fact, it made him feel worse. Which part? Secret Service. Roby stared blankly at her. It went missing from one of their motor pools. How? Those places are monitored 24-7. We're running that down now. That is not good if they have someone on the inside. They protect the president. Thanks, Roby. I wasn't aware of that. What does the Secret Service say? He asked, ignoring her tone. They're concerned, and they've tightened up security even more. Anything else? MP5 casings all over the street. Hope we can find a gun we can match them to. No one saw anything? No faces? We've been canvassing the area all night and day. Nothing so far. Are we sure we were the targets? Not someone else in the restaurant around the street? We're not sure about that. We're profiling all victims and all persons who were in the restaurant last night. Maybe we get lucky and one of them provides a motive for this level of carnage. But if we were the target, said Roby. He thought, if I was the target. Vance shook her head. Why would they waste time taking us out? 
Just because we were investigating the bus blowing up or Jane Wynn's murder, they kill us. Other investigators take our place and the case goes on. And like you said before, killing feds brings a lot of extra grief. I just don't see it. Latest on Rick Wind? They're doing the posts today. I asked for a rush on the results. The bus? Just going through the bodies, or body parts, rather, will take a long time. We're transporting the remains to an FBI evidence facility. We'll comb it to see if we can find what caused the blast. We've called an ATF to assist. Those guys are the best. They can usually find the detonation source, but it'll take time. Roby cleared his throat and asked the question that had been hammering in his gut for too long now. Any surveillance cameras in the area? They might show what happened. Give your guys a shortcut. There were some. We're collecting those now. Don't know what they'll show, but they might give us something to go on. Where are you collecting them? The mobile command post outside. We should have them all there later today or tonight. We wanted to make sure we were thorough in gathering them all. One, I know, is from an ATM, and another was posted on the corner of a building, but its sight line might be obstructed. And I've been told there are others. Roby nodded thinking how he was going to phrase it. I know that technically I'm not deployed on the bus case, but since it seems the two cases might be connected, you mind if I go over it too? She thought about this for a few moments. Never turn down a fresh pair of eyes. Vance signed off on some documents handed to her by a tech, while Roby glanced through the window at the portable command center. If I show up on one of those videos, or Julie does, Penny, for your thoughts? He turned to see Vance watching him. So, what can I do to help? He said, ignoring her question. You can noodle all this, and we can follow a few leads down. What are they? Wynn's employment at DCIS, for one. You're, of course, uniquely positioned to follow up on that. And then there's her husband. Was there something in her background that led to his death? From the condition of the body, he was killed before her which leads me to believe the reason might lie with Rick Wind. Anything else you know about him? He was deployed to both Iraq and Afghanistan while in the military, said Roby. So was everybody in uniform the last ten years. He apparently left the military with a clean record. His wife, in her capacity with DCIS, also visited Iraq and Afghanistan on several occasions. At the same time as her husband? No, afterwards. You said Wind left the army clean, but could there be something else? How long was he in the Middle East? Was he wounded or captured? Or did he have a change of heart? You want to know if he was turned somehow? Became an enemy of his own country? Yeah, I would. I can't answer that. Can't or won't? I don't know the answer. They cut out his tongue. I was there, Agent Vance. I did some research on the computer last night. That can be dangerous. And I also emailed some of our Middle Eastern experts. Islamic fundamentalists sometimes cut out the tongues of people who they believe have betrayed them. Yeah, they do. That could be the case here. We need to know a lot more before we confirm something like that. Tongues cut out, a bus blown up. This is starting to look like international terrorism, Roby. Why the bus? Mass casualties throws the country into a tizzy. Maybe. Rick Wind was somehow involved. He got cold feet, they took care of him, and then killed his wife because they were afraid he might have told her something. His ex-wife, and she works for DCIS. If he had told her something, she would have told us, and I can tell you that she didn't. Maybe she never got the chance. Maybe she didn't. It's a workable theory. Roby scratched his cheek. I guess. You don't sound convinced. That's because I'm not. Chapter 47 Roby walked outside an hour later after going over the details of the mass shooting. The air was warmer today and felt warmer still as the sun rose higher. It was one of those cloudless days in D.C. that you knew would not last, not at this time of the year. The capital city was like a bullseye on a weather map. Systems from north, south, and west regularly crossed the line of the Appalachians and hit the area, and their confluence could cause severe weather. 
Yet today was good weather-wise. But that was the only good thing about it. Roby looked over at the numbered markers for the dead on the sidewalk. Yeah, the weather is the only good thing. He mulled over what Vance had told him. A Secret Service SUV had been the shooter's platform. It had gone missing. Things did not go missing from the Secret Service. Roby had worked with that agency years ago to clean up a mess in a country he had never wanted to go back to. The agency was small in comparison to the behemoths of the FBI and DHS, but its people were excellent, loyal, really the only federal agents who systematically trained to take a bullet for their protectee. He glanced to his left and saw the FBI mobile command post. He approached, rapped on the door. He flashed his creds to the agent who answered his knock. He mentioned Vance's name and was allowed in. It was filled with high-tech gadgetry and investigation equipment. There were four other people present. In his mind, Roby split them up between special agents and tech support. The two techs were hammering on computer keyboards, and data obediently flowed across the multiple computer screens stacked on the long table. Roby said, Vance told me about collecting surveillance camera footage from the scene of the bus explosion. You got any of it uploaded yet? The agent who had let him in the command post nodded. Hang on a sec. He texted something on his phone. Roby knew exactly what. He's getting the okay from Vance to show me the pictures. Roby would have expected nothing less. The FBI did not employ stupid people. Roby heard the sound of a text shooting back to the agent. The man glanced at the screen and said, Over here, Agent Roby. He led him to one corner and indicated a blank screen. Here's what we have so far. The agent punched some keys, and the file uploaded to the screen. Roby sat on a swivel chair, folded his arms across his chest, and waited. Have you looked at it yet? Roby asked. First time for me, too. Roby felt his pulse quicken. This might truly be enlightening for everybody, he thought. The door opened and he saw Vance. She closed it behind her and walked over to them. Am I in time for the show? Yes, ma'am, said the other agent respectfully. She sat down next to Roby, their knees nearly touching. She focused on the screen that was now coming to life. The bus came into view. It traveled a few hundred yards. Roby was relieved to see that the camera shot was not on the side of the bus with the door. A few seconds later, the bus exploded. Roby tensed again. With the bus destroyed, there would be nothing to block the camera's view across the street, where Roby and Julie's pixeled figures were now rolling and eventually coming to rest. In a few seconds, they would both rise and then... The screen went black. Roby looked at the agent controlling this process. What happened? Blast must have knocked out the camera. That can happen. It's not like bank cameras are built for that stuff. He tapped more buttons on his keyboard and finally called a tech over. The tech executed more keystrokes, and five minutes later, they still had nothing. Roby sat through two more video feeds that were very much like the first two. Opposite side of the bus, and the cameras went down after the explosion. Any cameras around the bus depot showing the passengers getting on? asked Roby. He had searched his memory but could not recall any such surveillance. Not that we can find right now, but it's early days yet, and we're trying to locate more footage, particularly from the other side of the street. And everybody has cell phones, and most cell phones have camera and video features. So we're trying to find anyone who was there last night who might have seen or even photographed or filmed something in the aftermath. Though if they did, it probably would be on all the news shows or YouTube by now. I'm going to have my guys go check for more surveillance cameras along the bus route this afternoon, after we get this crime scene under better control. Which means I have to find it first, Roby thought. Chapter 48 Roby stood near what was for him Ground Zero. 
The remains of the bus were being sifted through by a dozen forensic techs, with an FBI evidence truck waiting nearby to take these items away to the lab. Just like at Donnelly's, roadblocks were everywhere, holding back the reporters who wanted to see and know everything right now. He looked left and right, up and down. Vance was correct. Nothing obvious that he could see. The bank video across the street was already in the database, but thankfully also had been knocked out by the blast. He gazed upward. Surveillance camera about ten feet off the ground at the corner of one intersection. It was pointing downward and had gotten a shot of the bus as well. If it had been pointed a bit differently than it was, it might have captured on film both him and Julie as they escaped. Like football, a game of inches. Some things were just beyond your control. Then you counted on luck. But how much more luck can I count on? he thought. His attention turned to the troublesome part of the street, the side he and Julie had been on. He started a walk. With the angle of coverage a camera might have on the street, he gauged what his box of concern should be, and added ten percent on each end just to be safe. He covered this ground methodically. He quickly registered on a camera posted on the wall about twenty feet to the left of where the bus had gone down. It seemed to be pointing directly at the spot of the explosion. He looked at the business located there. Bail bondsman, of course. In this neighborhood, the owner probably had a ready group of customers. He looked through the plate glass window with rusted iron bars and a crisscross pattern fronting it. The sign to the right of the door said, Ring Bell. Roby rang the bell. A voice came out of a small white box set to the door. Yeah? Federal agent. Need to talk to you. So talk. Face to face. Roby heard footsteps approaching. A short, wide man in his fifties, with more white hair and a mustache over his lip than he had on his head, looked out at him through the window. Let me see your badge. Roby pressed it against the glass. DCIS? Part of DOD, military. What do you want with me? Open the door. The man pulled the heavy door open. He was dressed in black slacks and a white shirt, with the sleeves rolled to his elbows. Above his loafers, Roby saw pink skin. Roby stepped through and closed the door behind him. So, what do you want? The man asked again. The bus that blew up across the street? What about it? You have a surveillance camera. Right, so? FBI been by to see you about it yet? No. I'm going to have to confiscate the film or DVD or whatever you use to house the images captured by the camera. That will be nothing. What? That camera hasn't worked for a year. Why do you think I had to come to the window to see who it was at the door, smart guy? So why leave it up? As a deterrent, why else? This is not exactly a safe area. I'll still need to see for myself. Why? Smart guys like to cover all the bases. However, it turned out the man was telling the truth. The system had evidently been broken a long time, and when he examined the camera, Roby saw that the cable running to it inside the building wasn't even connected. Roby left and continued his walk. He had nearly gotten to the end of the sector he'd outlined when he saw the homeless guy from the night the bus had exploded, the one who'd been dancing around yelling about wanting some s'mores to grill on the bonfire of metal and flesh. It looked like he and his fellow homeless had been evicted from the crime scene and were huddled on the other side of the police barriers. There were three of them, each with their trash bags filled, no doubt, with everything they possessed. The homeless guy looked like he'd been on the streets for a long time. His clothes and body were filthy. His fingernails were long and blackened, and his teeth rotted. Roby could see that the reporters were giving the three a wide berth. He wondered if it had occurred to any of the journalists that the people of the streets might have seen something that night. Even so, 
Roby wondered how successful the reporters might have been in getting any reliable information out of them. And then he wondered if the FBI had attempted to interview them. Vance's folks might not have even known they were there that night, might not know that they could possess valuable information, and also some information that could be quite damaging to Roby. Roby cleared the police barrier and was immediately engulfed by reporters. He looked at none of them, made no attempt to answer their shouted questions. He pushed mics and notepads out of his face and kept going until he reached the three street people. You hungry? he asked. The s'mores fellow, wild-eyed and looking as though reason had left him long ago, nodded and laughed. Always hungry. At least he can understand me, thought Roby. He eyed the other two. One was a woman, small, bloated, blackened by the street. Her garbage bag bulged with blankets and what looked to be recycled trash. She might have been twenty. She might have been fifty. Roby couldn't tell under the layers of grime. You hungry? She just looked at him. Unlike s'mores, she apparently didn't understand English. He led them farther away from the sea of reporters and then glanced at the third person. She looked more promising. About forty, she did not have years on the street grafted onto her. And there was both intelligence and terror behind her eyes. Roby wondered if the recent economic crisis had left her as one of the new millions who were once working or middle class, but now were neither. Can I get you something to eat? She took a step back, clutched the canvas bag. It was monogrammed. That was another clue as to her background. Longtime homeless did not have such bags. Over the years, they rotted away or were stolen. She shook her head. Roby understood her trepidation. The next thing he did would confirm his suspicions of her. He took out his badge and held it up. I'm a federal agent. The woman stepped closer to him, looked relieved. S'more's grin faded. The other woman just stood there, looking out at a reality that had clearly left her behind. Roby had his answer. Recent homeless, still respected authority. They, in fact, craved the law and order. They had recently left the anarchy that awaited them on the concrete. People long on the streets, after years of being told to move, get off their ass, clean up their crap, get the hell out of here because they were not wanted, did not. They feared and loathed the badge. To s'mores, Roby said, there's a cafe down this way. I'm going to get you some food and bring it back. For her, too, he added indicating the woman who stared off at nothing. Will you wait until I get back? S'mores slowly nodded, looking suspicious. Roby took a ten-dollar bill out of his pocket and handed it to the man for reassurance. You want coffee? Sandwich? Yeah, said S'mores. And her? Roby said, pointing to the other woman. Yeah, said S'mores. Roby turned to the third homeless person. Will you come with me to the cafe and wait there while I get their food? Am I in trouble? She asked. Now she did sound like a long-time streeter. No, not at all. Were you here the night that bus blew up? S'mores tapped his chest and said, Me. Roby almost said, I know, but caught himself. S'mores was actually starting to concern him. He sounded reasonably sane. If he remembers seeing me, he thought. Have any other agents talked to you? asked Roby, looking at the three. S'mores glanced away when the sounds of a siren started up. His lips pulled back. He looked like he was snarling. Then he started to howl along with the sirens. We all were there, the second woman said. But we left after it happened. I don't think the police are aware that we saw anything. Roby focused on her. What's your name? Diana. Your last name? The fear sprang up again in her features. Roby said quietly, Diana, you're not in any trouble, I promise you. We're just trying to find out who blew up the bus, and I'd like to ask you some questions, that's all. My last name is Jordison. 
S'mores grabbed his arm. Hot eats? Coming up. Roby escorted Jordis into the cafe. When they walked in, the man behind the counter started to shoo Jordison away, but Roby flashed his badge. She stays, he said. The man backed off, and Roby seated Jordison at a table in the rear. Order anything you want, he said, handing her a menu from a stack on the next table. He walked up to the counter and said, I need some food to go. He placed the order. While it was being prepared, he sat down across from Jordison. A young waitress came over to take their orders. Roby said, just coffee. He glanced at Jordison. She flushed and looked unsure of herself. Roby wondered how long it had been since she had ordered anything in a restaurant. A simple process for most people, it was astonishing how quickly simple processes became complex when you slept in alleys, parks, or over steam grates and gathered your daily bread from trash cans. Roby pointed to an item on the menu. The American is just about everything. Eggs, toast, bacon, grits, coffee, juice. How about that one? Egg scrambled? Orange juice? She looked like she could use a boost of vitamin C and protein. Jordison nodded meekly and handed the menu back to the waitress, who seemed disinclined to accept it. Roby looked at her. My friend will have the American, he said. And could you please bring the coffee and juice out now? Thanks. The waitress walked off to fill the order. She brought back the coffees and juice. Roby drank his black, but Jordison doused hers with cream and several sugars. He noted that she slipped most of the sugar packets into her pocket. He looked over and saw the owner giving him the high sign and pointing to two bags he was holding and a carrier with two coffees riding in it. Roby said, I'm going to take the food to the other two, and then I'll be right back, okay? Jordison nodded, but wouldn't meet his eye. Roby paid the check, grabbed the bags, and headed out. Chapter 49 when Roby got back to S'mores and the other woman, a male reporter he'd seen earlier was circling the pair like a shark after shipwreck survivors. The reporter looked at Roby. Playing the Good Samaritan? he asked, eyeing the bags and beverages. Your tax dollars at work, replied Roby. He handed one bag and coffee each to S'mores and the woman. The latter snagged her food and coffee, grabbed her plastic bags, and disappeared down the street. Roby let her go because he didn't think she would be able to tell him anything. S'mores stood there sipping his coffee. The reporter said, Can you answer a few questions for me, uh, agent? Roby hooked S'mores by the arm and walked off. The reporter called after him. I'll take that as a no comment. When they had reached the next intersection, Roby said, Tell me what you saw the night the bus blew up. S'mores had opened the bag and dug greedily into the bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich. He crammed a handful of hash browns into his mouth and chomped down. Take it slow, friend, said Roby. Don't want to choke. The man swallowed, took a slurp of coffee, and shrugged. What do you want? Everything you saw or heard. S'mores took another smaller bite of his sandwich. Boom, he said. Fire, holy shit. He took another sip of coffee. Anything more detailed than that, Roby added slowly. Did you see anyone around the bus? Maybe get off or on. S'mores crammed another handful of hash browns in his mouth and chomped. Boom, he said again. Fire, holy shit. Then he laughed, grilling out. Roby decided that his first impression of S'mores' sanity was the correct one. He wasn't sane. You didn't see anyone? He asked half-heartedly. Grilling out. Then he laughed and finished his sandwich in one bite. Good luck to you, said Roby. S'mores gulped down the hot coffee. Roby left him there and fast walked back to the cafe. Jordison had gotten her food and was eating it slowly. There was none of S'more's energetic desperation. 
Roby hoped that boded well for her being able to tell him something useful, or at the very least intelligible. Roby sat down across from her. Thanks for this. No problem. He watched her eat a few seconds and then said, How long you been out there? Too long, she said, wiping her mouth with a paper napkin. I'm not here to grill you about that. It's none of my business. I had a house and a job and a husband. I'm sorry. Me too. Surprised me how fast it all went to hell. No job, no house, no husband. Nothing but bills I can't pay. I mean, you hear about it happening, but you never think it'll happen to you. Roby said nothing. Jordison continued. He's probably homeless, too, for all I know. My ex, I mean. Well, I call him my ex. He never even bothered to file for divorce. He just up and left. And it wasn't like I could afford a lawyer to get it done. She paused and added, I went to college, got my degree. It's been really bad times the last few years. Worked hard, did all the right things. The American dream. Right. Roby was afraid she might start crying. She took a quick sip of coffee. What do you want to know? The night the bus blew up. What can you tell me? She nodded. I've been sleeping behind a dumpster the last couple of weeks. Nights haven't gotten too cold yet. Last winter was a bitch. Didn't think I was going to make it. January was my first month on the street. That's rough. I thought something or someone would come through. Half my friends are like me. The other half will have nothing to do with me. Family? None that are in a position to help anymore. It's just me now. Where did you work before? Admin support for a construction company. Like the worst possible job to have in this economy. I was just an expense item, generated no revenue. I was one of the first to go, even though I'd been there 12 years. No severance, no health care, nothing. Salary stopped, but the bills sure didn't. Then my unemployment benefits ran out. I fought to keep my home for a year. Then my husband got sick. That sucked what little savings we had and left a whole ton of bills. Then he gets better and off he goes. For better pastures, he told me. Can you believe that shit? What happened to the marriage vows, for better or worse? She glanced up at him, looking ashamed. I know you don't need to hear this. I can understand how you might need to get it off your chest. I've already vented plenty, thanks. She finished her breakfast and pushed the plate away. She took a few moments to collect her thoughts. I saw the bus come down the street. It was really noisy, so it woke me up. I don't sleep well on the street. Concrete isn't too comfortable, and it's just not, well, safe. I get scared. I can see that. And then the bus stopped, right there in the middle of the street. I remember sitting up and leaning around the dumpster and wondering why it had stopped. I've been over to that bus terminal going through the trash cans. It wasn't a city bus. It goes up to New York, leaves same time every night. Seen it before.